Your Honor, I have a quick record of an objection I made yesterday. Um, oh, sorry. Okay, well, I just wanted to see if you wanted me to do that now or later. Um, I I made an objection, but it was at the bench, so it's not on the record. Oh, okay. If you want to make a record, we can do that now. Or if you're fine, Sean, I Yeah, I, or we can do it later. I just was... Yeah, it, yeah, it's up to you. I just wanted to know that we aren't on the record yet. Okay, yeah, yeah. Jennifer Crumbly, case number 222799-990-FH. Good morning, Your Honor. Karen McDonald on behalf of the people. Thank you. Mark Keyes on behalf of the people. And good morning, Your Honor. I'm Shannon Smith on behalf of Jennifer Crumbly, who stands to my right. Good morning, Your Honor. Sean Godwin, P7500 for Jennifer Crumbly. Good morning. Um, all 17 jurors are here. We're going to bring them in on this sort of I wanted to mention to you that um, having a bench conference isn't as convenient as it may have been in the past. Uh, media has uh, indicated that I should ask them to cut the microphones at a time when we do a bunch of conference, but I also want to know that, uh, you know, want to note that 16 and 17 are kind of up in my world here. So um, it, it's, it's difficult to have a bunch of conference. Uh, we might have to step into the hallway or do something, but I, I think that the, the two jurors who are sitting right here are able to hear what's said, so keep that in mind. Thank you, Judge. Um, Your Honor, I just wanted to make a very fast record that yesterday during jury selection, I made an objection when um, Ms. McDonald stated she can prove this case. Um, the court ended up instructing Ms. McDonald to move on and ask a question about if they would hold her to her burden. I just wanted to place that objection on the record. Um, on the record. I don't recall specifically um, what was said, but you know, obviously the record speaks for itself. But I was intent on moving on asking questions, so I don't remember exactly what was said. Thank you, Judge. And it was, it was made in the course of uh, jury selection conversation with the jurors, and the prosecutor can't prove the case, and why are we here to begin with? But this court did instruct the jurors appropriately. I believe the jury selection process was conducted in accordance with all court rules and statutes. I have one, I'm sorry, one brief thing. Uh -huh. 
to come to your attention that one individual who was subpoenaed as a witness is in court today. I ask for, for a mutual sequestration of all witness, witnesses except for the officers in charge of the investigation. I have no knowledge of who that is. Well, I certainly don't either. Um, there's a mutual sequestration order. Yeah. Um, so yeah, there is. Who's the? Megan Mirowitz. Okay. okay. So, I, I don't even know who Megan Mirowitz is, but she's going to have to step out. and the deceased in the courtroom. I understand. And, and going back to Ms. Merowitz, she's the defendant's friend. She's subpoenaed because of statements made. We didn't at, ask her to be here for jury selection. In fact, he told her she didn't have to come until called. Okay. So she was not invited by the prosecutor's office to sit through this. Okay. And right. my, my statement was more of a general statement about uh, people trying to, you know, I don't want people wearing their heart on their sleeve. I know it's hard to do, but, it, you know, it impacts the jury. Yeah, I'm, I'm not in charge of witnesses. You guys are in charge of the witnesses, and there is a mutual sequestration order. So if, if a witness were to sit through um, part of the trial, they may, may easily not be permitted to testify. So, okay. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. We agree. I didn't realize she was back there. So Yeah, no, I understand. And you may not have ever seen or met some of your witnesses, so I understand that. Are you ready for the jury? Yes, sir. instructions to you uh, and you're going to get a written copy of the instructions so don't try to write down what I'm going to say all right um, members of the jury you've been chosen to decide a criminal charge made by the state of Michigan against one, one of your fellow citizens I'm going to ask you to swear to perform your duty to try the case justly and to reach a true verdict if your religious beliefs do not permit you to take no you may instead affirm to try the case justly and reach a true verdict. Could you stand and raise your right hand? Here is your oath. Do each of you solemnly swear or affirm that in this action now before the court, 
you will justly decide the questions submitted to you, that unless you're discharged by the court from further deliberation, you will render a true verdict, and you will render your verdict only on the evidence introduced in accordance with the instructions of the court, so I hope you got. Yes. Thank you. You may be seated. You'll be given a written copy of these instructions that I'm going to read to you, and you'll be able to refer to them at the end of the trial. Since no one can predict the course of the trial, these instructions may change at the end of the trial. At the close of the trial, I'll provide you with a, a copy of my final instructions for your use during your deliberation. I'm going to explain some of the legal principles you'll need to know, and the procedure will follow in this trial. The defendant is charged in counts one through four with involuntary manslaughter. The prosecutor has alleged two separate theories of defendant's guilt, which may be established under either or both of the two theories. The first theory of involuntary manslaughter is doing a grossly negligent act causing death. To prove this charge under the first theory, the prosecutor must prove each of the following elements beyond a reasonable doubt. First, in count one, that the defendant caused the death of Madison Baldwin. In count two, the defendant caused the death of Tate Meyer. In count three, the defendant caused the death of Hannah St. Juliana. And in count four, the defendant caused the death of Justin Schilling. That is that Madison Baldwin, Tate Meyer, Hannah St. Juliana, and Justin Schilling died as a result of storing a firearm and its ammunition so as to allow access to the firearm and ammunition by her minor child. There may, or may be more than one cause of death. It's not enough that the Defense Act made it possible for the death to occur. In order to find that the deaths of Madison Baldwin, Tate Meyer, Hannah St. Juliana, and Justin Schilling were caused by the defendant, you must find beyond a reasonable doubt that the deaths were the natural or necessary result of the Defense Act. Second, in doing that, the act that caused Madison Baldwin, Tate Meyer, Hannah St. Juliana, and Justin Schilling's death, the defendant acted in a grossly negligent manner. Gross negligence means more than carelessness. It means willfully disregarding results to others that might follow from an act or failure to act. In order to find that the defendant was grossly negligent, you must find each of the following three things beyond a reasonable doubt. First, that the defendant knew of the danger to another. That is, she knew there was a situation that required her to take ordinary care to avoid injuring another. Second, that the defendant could have avoided injury, injuring another by using ordinary care. Third, that the defendant failed to use ordinary care to prevent injuring another when, to a reasonable person, it must have been apparent that the result was likely to be serious injury. As previously noted, the prosecutor has alleged two separate theories of defendant's guilt. The second theory is gross negligent, negligence and failing to perform a legal duty. In the second theory, the prosecutor must prove each of the following elements beyond a reasonable doubt. First, that the defendant had a legal duty to Madison Baldwin, Tate Meyer, Hannah St. Juliana, and Justin Schilling. The legal duty charged here is one imposed by law. In Michigan, a parent has a legal duty to exercise reasonable care to prevent their minor child from intentionally harming others or prevent the minor child from so conducting themselves in a way that creates an unreasonable risk of harm to others if the parent knows that they have the ability to control their minor child and knows of the necessity and opportunity for exercising such control. Second, that the defendant knew of the act facts that gave rise to the duty. Third, that the defendant willfully neglected or refused to perform that duty and her failure to perform it was grossly negligent to human life. Fourth, that the death of Madison Baldwin as to count one, Tate Meyer as to count two, Hannah St. Juliana as to count three, and Justin Schilling as to count four were directly caused by defendant's failure to perform this duty. That is, that Madison Baldwin, Tate Meyer, Hannah St. Juliana, and Justin Schilling died as a result of defendant's failure to exercise reasonable care to control her minor child so as to pre prevent him from intentionally harming others or from so conducting himself so as to create an unreasonable risk of bodily harm to others, knowing that she has the ability to control her child, knowing of the necessity and opportunity to do so. There may be more than one cause of death. 
It's not enough that the Defense Act made it possible for the death to occur. In order to find that the deaths of Madison Baldwin, Tate Meyer, Hannah St. Juliana, and Justin Schilling were caused by the defendant, we must find beyond a reasonable doubt that the deaths were the natural or necessary result of the Defendant's Act. With respect to the alternative theories, it's not necessary that you all agree on which theory has been proven, as long as you all agree that the prosecutor has proved at least one of those theories beyond a reasonable doubt. A person accused of a crime is presumed to be innocent. This means that you must start with the presumption that the defendant is innocent. This presumption continues throughout the trial and entitles the defendant to a verdict of not guilty unless you are satisfied beyond a reasonable doubt that she is guilty. Every crime is made up of parts called elements. The prosecutor must prove each element of the crime beyond a reasonable doubt. The defendant is not required to prove her innocence or to do anything. If you find that the prosecutor has not proven every element beyond a reasonable doubt, then you must find the defendant not guilty. A reasonable doubt is a fair, honest doubt, growing out of the evidence or lack of evidence. It's not merely an imaginary or possible doubt, but a doubt based on reason and common sense. A reasonable doubt is just that, a doubt that is reasonable after a careful and considered examination of the facts and circumstances of this case. The trial follows this procedure. First, the prosecutor makes an opening statement where they give their theories about the case. The defendant's lawyer does not have to make an opening statement, but she may make an opening statement after the prosecutor makes theirs, or she may wait until later. These statements are not evidence. They are only meant to help you understand how each side views the case. Next, the prosecutor presents evidence. The prosecutor may call witnesses to testify and may show you exhibits like documents or objects. The defendant's lawyer has the right to cross-examine the prosecutor's witnesses. After the prosecutor has presented all of their evidence, the defendant's attorney may also offer evidence, but does not have to. By law, the defendant does not have to prove her innocence or produce any evidence. If the defense does call any witnesses, the prosecutor has the right to cross-examine them. The prosecutor may also call witnesses to contradict the testimony of the defense witnesses. After all the evidence has been presented, the prosecutor and the defendant's lawyer will make their closing arguments. Like the opening statements, they are not evidence. They are only meant to help you understand the evidence and the way each side sees the case. You must base your verdict only on the evidence. My responsibilities as the judge in this trial are to make sure that the trial is run fairly and efficiently, to make decisions about evidence, and to instruct you about the law that applies to this case. You must take the law as I give it to you. Nothing I say is meant to reflect my own opinions about the facts of the case. As jurors, you are the ones who will decide this case. Your responsibility as jurors is to decide what the facts of the case are. This is your job and no one else's. You must think about all the evidence and all the testimony and then decide what each piece of evidence means and how important you think it is. This includes how much you believe what each of the witnesses said. What you decide about any fact in this case is final. Part of your job in deciding what the facts of this case are is, decide, is to decide which witnesses you believe and how important you think their testimony is. You do not have to accept or reject everything a witness says. You are free to believe all, none, or part of any person's testimony. In deciding which testimony you believe, you should rely on your own common sense and everyday experience. However, in deciding whether you believe a person's testimony, you must set aside any bias or prejudice you may have based on the witness's disability, race, national origin or ethnicity, gender, gender identity or sexual orientation, or religion, age, or socioeconomic status. There's no fixed set of rules for judging whether you believe a witness, but it may help you think about these questions. Well, was the witness able to see or hear clearly? How long was the witness watching or listening? Was anything else going on that might have distracted the witness? Does the witness seem to have a good memory? How does the witness look at that while testifying? Does the witness seem to be making an honest effort to tell the truth? Or does the witness seem to evade the questions or argue with the lawyers? Does the witness's age or maturity affect how you judge his or her testimony? Does the witness have any bias or prejudice or any personal interest in how this case is decided? 
Have there been any promises, threats, suggestions, or other influences that affect how the witness testifies? In general, does the witness have any special reason to tell the truth or any special reason to lie? All in all, how reasonable does the witness's testimony seem when you think about all of the other evidence in the case? When it's time for you to decide the case, you're only allowed to consider the evidence that was admitted in the case. Evidence includes only the sworn testimony of witnesses, the exhibits admitted into evidence, and anything else I tell you to consider as evidence. The questions the lawyers ask are not evidence. Only the answers are evidence. You should not think that something is true just because one of the lawyers asks questions that assume or suggest that it is. I may ask uh, some of the witnesses questions myself. These questions are not meant to reflect my uh, opinion about the evidence. If I asked questions, my only reason would be to ask about things that may have not been fully explored. I usually assume that if I don't understand something that a witness is saying that one of the jurors might be sharing that confusion. So um, if you can't hear something that is uh, being said or presented, or if you can't see or hear a witness, please uh, raise your hand immediately, all right? During the trial, the lawyers may object to certain questions or statements made by the other lawyers or witnesses. I'll rule on these objections according to the law. My rulings for or against one side or the other are not meant to reflect my opinions about the facts of the case. Sometimes the lawyers and I will have discussions out of your hearing. Also, while you're in the jury room, I might have to take care of other matters that have nothing to do with this case. Pay attention, do not pay attention to those interruptions. You must not discuss the case with anyone, including your family or friends. You must not even discuss it with the other jurors until the time comes for you to decide the case. When it's time for you to decide the case, I'll send you to the jury room for that purpose. You're in two different jury rooms uh, right now, but you'll be in, obviously be in one jury room when there's 12 of you deliberating. When it's time for you to decide the case, I'll send you to the jury room for that purpose. Then you should discuss the case amongst yourselves, but only in the jury room and only when all the jurors are there. You must not talk to the defendant, the lawyers, the witnesses, or anyone you may, who may be connected uh, to the case. You might see one of the lawyers in the hallway and they won't even say good morning to you. There's a reason for that. Uh, this means that you may not speak to these individuals, even if it has nothing to do with this case. You should be very cautious about speaking to people because you may inadvertently speak to someone connected to this case. <coughs> this restriction is necessary to avoid even the appearance of any improper conduct on any person's part. If anyone tries to discuss the case with you or in your presence, tell them to stop. Explain that you are a juror and you are not allowed to discuss the case. If they continue, leave. Report the incident to court staff as soon as you return to court. When the trial is over, these restrictions no longer apply. When the trial is over, you may, if you wish, discuss the case with anyone. Uh, please wear your uh, badges the entire time you're in the courthouse. Okay. During the trial, do not read, listen to, or watch any news reports about the case. Under the law, the evidence you must consider to decide the case must meet certain standards. For example, witnesses must swear to tell the truth, and the lawyers must be able to cross-examine them. Because news reports do not have to meet these standards, they could give you incorrect or misleading information that might unfairly favor one side. So to be fair to both sides, you must follow this instruction. The restrictions I'm about to describe are meant to ensure that the parties get a fair trial. In our judicial system, it's crucial that jurors are not influenced by anything or anyone outside the courtroom. Under the law, the evidence you must consider has to meet certain standards. For example, witnesses must swear to tell the truth, and the lawyers must be able to cross-examine them. <clears throat> because information obtained outside the courtroom doesn't have these safeguards, it could give you incorrect or misleading information that might unfairly favor one side or another. These restrictions start now and continue, continue until I discharge you from jury service. It's your duty as a juror to decide this case based solely on the evidence you see and hear in this courtroom. You must not consider information that comes from anywhere else. This means that until you deliver your verdict, you must not read, watch, listen to, or receive any information, including opinions or commentary about the case, whether in newspapers, on television, the radio, the internet, or on social media platforms. You also must not research any aspect of the case during the trial. This means research using a cellular phone, computer, or other electronic device to search the internet, as well as research with traditional sources like dictionaries, reference manuals, newspapers, or magazines. You must not investigate the case on your own or conduct any experiments concerning the case. 
including ex investigation or experiments using the internet, cellular phones, computers, or other electronic devices. You must not visit the scene of any event at issue in this trial. If it's necessary for you to view the scene, the court staff will take you there as a group under court supervision. You must not consider as evidence any personal knowledge you have of the scene. You must not share any information about the case by any means, including cellular phones or social media. This means that even if you're not discussing the case with someone else, you may not post any information about the case on social media websites or any, any other matter. If you discover that a juror has violated my instructions, please report it to my staff immediately. You may take notes during the trial if you wish, but of course you don't have to. If you do take notes, you should be careful that it doesn't distract you from paying attention to all the evidence. Sometimes people are taking notes and they don't hear the next question and answer. When you go to the jury room to decide your verdict, you may use your notes to help you remember what happened in the courtroom. If you take notes, do not let anyone except the other jurors see them during deliberations. You must give them to my clerk when you leave each, each evening. Your notes will not be examined by anyone, and when your jury service concludes, your notes will be collected and destroyed. Um, at this point, I always like to tell jurors it's possible to replay a witness's testimony um, upon your request. Um, we have our IT department come up off the videotape program, uh, so the witness's testimony is being videotaped. I just I'd like to tell you this caveat. Um, you would be required to hear the entire witness's uh, testimony, uh, not just the portion of interest. You can't like all fast forward to a certain part and all yell, aha. Okay? It's the only way it's very to both sides. Uh, if you hear a witness's testimony, you have to hear the entire thing. All right? There's, there is more than one defendant involved in this matter. You should consider only the evidence presented in this defendant's trial. Each, each is entitled to have his or her case decided on the evidence and the law that applies to him or her. You can see that we've chosen a jury of 17. After you've heard all the evidence in my instructions, we'll draw lots to decide which of you will be dismissed to form a jury of 12. Okay, we're, there's 17 of you because life happens, all right? But I did order you all last night to stay healthy, so I hope you're doing well. All right. Uh, possible pen penalty should not influence your decision. If you find the defendant guilty, it is my duty to fix the penalty within the limits provided by law. I'll definitely be giving you more instructions during the trial. After the all, all the evidence has been presented, you'll hear the lawyer's closing arguments. Following the closing arguments, I'll give you additional instructions about the rules of law that apply to this case. You should consider all of my instructions as a connected series. Take them all together. They are the law you must follow. After my final instructions, you'll go to the jury room to decide on your verdict. The verdict must be unanimous. That means each juror must agree on it, and it must reflect the individual decision of each juror. It's important for you to maintain an open mind and not make a decision about anything in this case until you go to the jury room to decide the case. You must not let bias, prejudice, or public opinion influence your decision. Each of us may have biases or perceptions about other people based on stereotypes. We may be aware of some of our biases, though we do not express them. We not, may not be fully aware of some of our other biases. Take the time you need to test what might be automatic or instinctive judgments and to reflect carefully about the evidence. I caution you again to, to avoid reaching conclusions that may have been unintentionally influenced by stereotypes. You must reach your own conclusions about this case individually, but you should do so only after listening to and considering the opinions of the other jurors who may have different backgrounds and perspectives from yours. Um, I think, did everyone um, pull out a menu for lunch this mm -hmm. morning? Um, I guess I didn't ask my staff whether there were any special dietary needs. Those could be accommodated by tomorrow, but maybe um, not today. So everybody filled that out. All right. Okay, so now we're going to hear openings. And um, as I said, <coughs> uh, openings are uh, not evidence. Uh, they're how each side sees the case. Good morning, everybody. to introduce you to Hannah St. Juliana, Madison Baldwin, Tate Muir, and Justin Schilling. They died on November the 30th of 2021. They weren't in a car crash. They weren't sick. They were murdered in an act of terror 
committed by Jennifer Crumbly's 15-year-old son. Jennifer Crumbly didn't pull the trigger that day, but she is responsible for those deaths. These kids were gunned down inside Oxford High School with this gun. It's a six-hour, nine-millimeter handgun purchased four days before the shooting by James Crumbly, Jennifer's husband and father of the school shooter. This was a purchase celebrated by Jennifer on Instagram. These are her words. This is her post. Mom and son day testing out his new Christmas present. My first time shooting a 9mm, I hit the bullseye. The evidence will prove that by the time this gun was bought, the school shooter was in a downward spiral that had begun months before. The evidence will also show you that Jennifer Crumbly was aware of that. Despite her knowledge of his deteriorating mental crisis, despite her knowledge of his growing social isolation, despite the fact that it is illegal for a 15-year-old to walk into a gun store and walk out with a handgun by himself, this gun was gifted. You will also learn that despite all of that background, this firearm was not secured in a way to prevent her son from gaining access to it. The evidence will also prove to you that even with all of that, on November the 30th, Jennifer Crumbly was still given the opportunity to prevent these murders from ever happening. Instead, she chose to do nothing. This drawing, this math worksheet, was sent to her November the 30th, 2021, at 9.30 in the morning. That's more than three hours before the first shot was fired. These writings, that drawing, created by her son. She was sent this by her son's school counselor when he requested an immediate meeting with her at the school that day. He requested that meeting because this drawing, those words, suggest both weapon and injury, even to someone with only limited knowledge of the shooter. Apparently, that raised an alarm with Jennifer Crumbly because she did go to the meeting with her husband, but before she did, she privately communicated her own concern with her husband. This will be admitted in evidence throughout the trial. This is a portion of a Facebook messenger thread from Jennifer to James Crumbly. Jennifer words in blue. Emergency, November 30th, 2021, 9.35 a.m. Then she sent a picture to James. His response, my God, WTF. And then he wrote back about the vet. He was at their barn, worried about their horse. Jennifer's response, he said he was distraught about last night. And then, I'm very concerned, headed to a school. That's at 10, 12 a.m. Yet despite their private concern, the evidence presented in this trial will show to you that that meeting at the school was nothing like that school counselor or the dean of students who sat in at a meeting had ever experienced before. Those two individuals, even with their limited knowledge of that drawing, had expected the defendant or her husband to take their son home and set an appointment with the mental health professional. But they didn't. You see, you will learn that these kind of meetings, when they occur with parents, can last an hour or longer. This one was abruptly ended by Jennifer Crumbly after just over 11 minutes. And then she left. <clears throat> you see, this drawing alarmed everyone who saw it, including those who only knew the Crumblies in limited settings, or even to those who had never met their son before. The two people in the world, with all of the information, all the background to put this drawing into context for James and Jennifer Crumlin. And you will learn that in that meeting, they didn't share any of it. They didn't say anything about the fact that that firearm was identical to the six hour nine millimeter. Identical. They didn't mention how that gun was stored. 
They didn't mention anything about his increased mental distress. You'll learn that after the meeting when they left, they didn't embrace him. You'll learn that their home is just down the road from the Oxford High School. They didn't stop by the house to look for the gun. You'll learn never once did they ask their son, where's the gun? They did nothing. They didn't do any number of tragically small and easy things that would have prevented all of this from happening. One thing will present itself during this trial, just how senseless November 30th was. And that's because of all of the easy, ordinary things for someone to do that nobody did. What I just outlined to you is a snapshot of the evidence that will be presented in this case. You will hear the facts and the evidence from the witnesses. You will hear from between 20 and 25 of those witnesses. You're going to see over 400 exhibits. You're going to hear from witnesses who were in law enforcement. You're going to hear from individuals who work for Oxford High School. You're going to hear from people who do Jennifer Crumbly in social situations and those who work with Jennifer Crumbly. You're going to hear from victims in this case as well. Those who are inside the school on November the 30th. You're going to learn a little bit about the scope of the investigation. You'll learn that during this trial, the defendant's cell phone, her husband's cell phone, and their son's cell phone were seized. They were all forensically analyzed. Through all of that data received, in addition to data obtained through cell phone towers, social media search warrants, uh, through information received through banking rec records, GPS pings from gun ranges, all this information will be presented to you, and you'll be able to obtain a digital footprint of the Crumbly family. And you'll get an idea, you'll get a view into the Crumbly life in the days, the weeks, the months preceding the shooting. You're also going to learn a little bit about the aftermath of the shooting. Specifically, you're going to see a pattern emerge in Jennifer Crumbly after the shooting on November 30th. That pattern will include and show you that she immediately began to downplay and downright lie about her level of knowledge of her son and that weapon and that drawing on November the 30th. This pattern will continue up until the time that she and her husband are found hiding from the police in Detroit. This pattern will show you that her first instinct was to lie, her second was to run. Now, the evidence will show you that she didn't pull the trigger, but she's responsible. But there is no claim that she gifted that fire to her son, knowing he was going to commit the attack. There's no claim that she wanted him to commit the attack. So how can she be held responsible when her son pulled the trigger? And the answer is, she's not charged with murder. She's charged with involuntary manslaughter. You see, murder is it's an intentional killing. Involuntary manslaughter, by definition, is unintentional. It's rooted in negligence. You've heard Judge Matthews tell you that every crime is made up of called, something called elements. This is no exception. You're going to learn that involuntary manslaughter is committed when someone's acts or their failures to act or their failures to perform their legal duty were grossly negligent, and that gross negligence was a cause of death. A cause of death, not the cause of death. And that's very important. Because, as you've heard, and you'll hear it again and again in this trial, that in a case such as this, when somebody else was a cause of death, the person who was grossly negligent can and still will be held responsible. That is, if the person who pulled the trigger, if the shooter in this case, his act was reasonably foreseeable to the defendant. To the defendant, specific to her, not to everybody else in the world, not to a stranger, not to a teacher, but to his mother, one of the two people in the world who raised him, who lived with him for 15 years, one of the two people in the world who had all the information necessary to put that drawing into context. So what's gross negligence? You will learn that it is a willful disregard of danger. 
gross negligence is when you could use ordinary care, just ordinary care, to avoid a known danger, and you don't, even though it is apparent that serious injury could occur. <clears throat> and that's what this case is about. It's about Jennifer Crumley's willful disregard of the danger that she knew of. That's why we're here. We're not here to talk about good parenting or bad parenting. It's not illegal to be a bad parent. We're not here to put restrictions on gun owners. That's not our job. That's not your job. That's for lawmakers. We're not here to talk about who else might be culpable. Or who else you think shares some blame. You will learn about the meeting on November the 30th. You may not like the fact that neither the school counselor nor the dean of students searched the school shooter's backpack. That's okay. That's okay. Because that does not mitigate Jennifer Crumbly's culpability. You're going to learn a whole lot about James Crumbly and her son. But James, he's not on trial today. He has another trial in front of another jury. Their son, his case is over. He's already been charged and convicted and sentenced for terrorism causing death and first degree murder. Today is Jennifer's turn to stand trial. And you will evaluate the evidence as it pertains to her and her own life. We're here because when Jennifer looked at this drawing, she didn't look at it the way a stranger would. When she looked at this drawing, she looked at it knowing the context and the origin. And when someone with that kind of information looks at this, the unimaginable becomes predictable. It becomes reasonably foreseeable. That's why, even though she didn't pull the trigger on November the 30th, she's responsible for those deaths. I ask that during this trial you listen to the testimony, you review the evidence, and you follow the law. If you do that, you will undoubtedly reach a fair and just verdict. If you do that, you will find this defendant guilty as charged. Thank you. I would, thank you. Your Honor, is it okay if I just move this? Oh, you can move it anywhere you want. There's a lot of stuff. There's cords and stuff. I'm sorry, Sean, can you just help me on the floor just forward? And I'm going to keep it to the side because I don't need it. Okay. I just have a few notes. Sure. On my way to court today, I blasted Taylor Swift to warm up my voice and calm my nerves. And there was a line in one of her songs that summarized what this case is about. Band-Aids don't stop bullet holes. And that's what this case is about. It's about the prosecution attempting to put a Band-Aid on problems that can't be fixed with a Band-Aid. The prosecution has charged Jennifer Crumbly with involuntary manslaughter in an effort to make the community feel better, in an effort to make people feel like someone is being held responsible, in an effort to send a message to gun owners, and none of those problems will be solved by charging Jennifer Crumbly with involuntary manslaughter. It's the same effect as when your child comes to you with a boo-boo and you give them a Band-Aid that they put on that doesn't take away the pain and can't undo what's happened to them. And in this case, a Band-Aid will never bring back the lives that were lost by Hannah, Justin, Tate, 
and Madison Baldwin. And the evidence in this show, in this case, is, is absolutely horrific. Much of the evidence is going to make you sick and disgusted and scare you, traumatize you, and quite frankly, there's no reason the evidence needs to be shown. Mrs. Crumbly, myself, everyone in this courtroom agrees that on November 30th, 2021, the worst possible thing happened when Ethan Crumbly used a gun and terrorized the Oxford High School. So as you are watching the evidence, I ask you to keep in mind that much of what the prosecution is going to show you is going to alarm you and disgust you and be horrifically sad and tragic. But that evidence is about Ethan, I'm sorry, excuse me, about the shooter. And in this case, we have agreed to call Jennifer Crumley's son the shooter because he is the shooter and he is the one, as you will see from the evidence, who was responsible for the tragedy that unfolded on November 30th of 2021. Prior to November 30th, Jennifer Crumbly was the mother to a 15-year-old son, and she did not have it on her radar in any way that there was any mental disturbance that her son would ever take a gun into a school, that her son would ever shoot people. The evidence at trial is going to show you that Jennifer Crumbly did the best she could as a mother to a child who grew up into a teenager and had no way to know what was going to happen. Jennifer Crumbly raised a son that she took to soccer practice, basketball, bowling, She's the kind of mother who, when a mole on his back changed color, a one millimeter mole, she took him to urgent care. She's the kind of mother who's texting her husband, who is at home, working from home, where is Ethan, where is Ethan, where is Ethan, at 3.14 in the afternoon, getting texts back saying, Ethan gets home at 3.16, what's your problem? And she keeps texting, where is he, where is he? You will see that if anything, Jennifer Crumbly was a hypervigilant mother who cared more about her son than anything in the world. Jennifer Crumbly is not a perfect parent, and we don't claim that she is. But what the evidence is going to show in this case is that the prosecution has very selectively pulled out slivers of evidence from a forest of trees to try to convince you that there was something wrong with Ethan and Jennifer Crumbly, as his mom, should have known. And at the end of the day, these slivers of evidence that are going to be presented to you will have no context and no explanation and the defense will agree that on their face, it looks bad. But like any of you who look back at text messages sent a year ago, they may look bad without context and explanation. And so we would ask that you reserve any judgment on these slivers of evidence until the defense presents evidence itself, and we will be presenting evidence in this case, to show the context and what was truly happening on these days that the prosecution is going to try to make you believe something more was happening. By way of example, the prosecution has one day where they claim Ethan needed help and Jennifer Crumbly was out with her horse. James Crumbly was with her at the barn. They had just gotten a new horse. Ethan is 15 years old at home. 
claiming there's a demon in the house, there's something going on, and the prosecution is going to try to use this one little point in time to convince you that Jennifer Crumbly was somehow neglecting her son. Much of the evidence in this trial is also going to center around James Crumbly, who is not on trial in this case. He has a separate trial, as Mr. Keese told you. You're going to hear evidence that James Crumbly and Ethan Crumbly liked guns. They had three guns. Two guns that were purchased earlier in 2021 and a gun that was purchased at a Black Friday sale the day after Thanksgiving in 2021. <clears throat> you are going to hear evidence that James and Ethan went to the shooting range often, that James was responsible for storing the guns, and to be quite frank, Jennifer Crumbly didn't know anything about guns. Jennifer Crumbly, you will hear evidence, she went to the shooting range one time with James and the shooter, and she went a second time after the gun was bought. She was attempting to find a way to spend time with her son, who had just lost a dog, had just, his friend had moved away from him. She's trying to find a way to connect to him. But on that day, when Jennifer Crumbly went to the shooting range, you will hear evidence that she didn't even know where the gun was or how to put it in the car. She had her husband prepare the gun to take it to the range. He had hid the gun in the bedroom of their home. The gun had a cable lock, a trigger lock, in place. James Crumbly had the key to the trigger lock that kept the gun secure. James Crumbly used the trigger lock key, took the, the cable lock off, put the gun in the back of Miss Crumbly's car. Mrs. Crumbly simply drove to the gun range. You will see video of their experience at the gun range, and you will see that the shooter is the one showing Mrs. Crumbly how to use the gun at the range. And when they're done at the range, the gun was placed back in the back seat of the car, not back seat, but the back of an SUV. And Jennifer Crumbly drove home and not being responsible for storing the gun and not even knowing where the gun specifically was placed. Jennifer Crumbly left the gun locked in the trunk, the back part of her SUV, and James Crumbly was responsible for getting the gun out, putting the trigger lock back on, storing the gun, and Mrs. Crumbly had nothing to do with that part of what happened. Over the next couple of days, this is right after Thanksgiving, the family is picking out their Christmas tree, talking about Christmas presents. There was certainly some sadness in the shooter's life, but nothing that would have amounted to any reason to believe he's going to shoot people or commit a school shooting. You will hear testimony that on the day of the shooting, Jennifer Crumbly went to work. She is essentially the breadwinner at this time. Mr. Crumbly was in between jobs. He's about to get a job offer. Mrs. Crumbly is trying to keep the household finances up. She's at work and she finds out through an email and text message that her son has drawn this alarming drawing the prosecution put on the screen. Jennifer freaks out when she sees the drawing. You will see the text messages that show she's urgently texting her husband, emergency, call me now, and she races out of work and goes to the school. Upon arriving at the school, she meets with Sean Hopkins, the school counselor. She meets with Nick Ejak, the school principal, and she meets with James Crumbly, 
and the shooter. And they are all in a room together where the shooter explains why he has put together this drawing and what the drawing means. The family and the school talk about how a counselor would be a good idea for Ethan, I'm sorry, the shooter to get into some kind of counseling. The meeting is not nearly as severe as Mrs. Crumbly was initially expecting. Trained professionals at the school who evaluate children represent that the shooter is of no risk to anyone and they allow him to stay in school. The testimony will show this is not a situation where Jennifer Crumbly refused to leave or refused to take her child from the school. She was provided the option of take him home or leave him here. The shooter struggled when they had online school during COVID. It caused him great anxiety to miss school and he wanted to stay that day. The school was fine with it. Mrs. Crumbly did leave the school and left the shooter at the school, not knowing he was going to become a shooter within the next few hours. Jennifer Crumbly, the evidence is going to show you, returns to work and suddenly there is news that there is an open shooter at Oxford. Jennifer Crumbly, it's not even on her radar that her son would be the one with the gun doing anything. Her immediate concern is that her son may be hurt. As she is driving to the school as fast as she can, she has conversations with her husband and becomes aware that the gun at their house is missing. And in Jennifer Crumbly's mind, and you will hear evidence of this, she believes that perhaps her son has done something stupid, like taken the gun and shot it in the air or done something. She knows he's still alive and believes that it's going to be okay. Whatever's happened, they can cross that bridge. A little bit later, there's more conversations, and Mrs. Crumbly becomes concerned that the shooter is actually attempting suicide, and Jennifer Crumbly texts her son, Ethan, don't do it. It still has not crossed her mind that he would ever shoot another person. Ultimately, Jennifer and James Crumbly are called to the substation where they learn that their son has become a school shooter and has shot people and that there are fatalities. Jennifer Crumbly will, will tell you she still could not believe that was true and went into a complete state of shock and despair and stress and not knowing what, realizing her life and everyone's life was going to change. And her initial comments are about how her son, how could her son have ruined so many lives that day? Jennifer Crumbly sees her son at the substation and for the first time when he looks at her, his eyes looked black and it was a son she did not recognize. Jennifer Crumbly and James Crumbly go back to their house where law enforcement execute a search warrant. Law enforcement takes their cell phones, um, which the Crumbly's handed over. The Crumbly's have to go and buy burner phones or track phones so they have something to use to be in touch. They begin to realize that there are death threats around their house. People are planning riots around their house and they cannot be in their home. Jennifer Crumbly and James Crumbly drive to a hotel where they spend the night. They are trying to figure out 
what is happening, and all Jennifer can think about are the things she believes she can control, like keeping her job, keeping health insurance, figuring out money, figuring out lawyers, and trying to digest what has just absolutely tragically unfolded. In the days following the event, while the prosecution says the evidence will show Jennifer Crumbly is lying, Jennifer Crumbly is truthfully telling the world she had no idea and finding out that she is about to be charged in this band-aid effort by the prosecution with involuntary manslaughter. Jennifer and James Crumbly go to the bank. They're advised by friends and family and you will hear testimony that their money could all be taken out of their accounts and they know they need money to be able to live and hire lawyers and figure out what to do. They withdraw all of the money from their bank account. The burner phones they're using, they can't get access to any of their accounts because of this two-part uh, authentication you now have to do. So they go to the Metro PCS store where they buy new telephones that they can actually use to access their social media, their accounts, their contacts, and they end up with multiple cell phones. After that, they work to find lawyers. They don't know what to do. They don't understand what they're being charged with. They're under the stress of knowing their son is going to, is gone, and, and life will never be the same undoubtedly. And on Friday, December 3rd, the Crumbleys find out when a press conference is held that they are being charged with four counts of involuntary manslaughter. And at that point, they work, try, they attempt to try to figure out what to do, where to stay, where to go, what to do. And they ultimately ask a friend if they can stay at his art studio until they know where to go and what to do. They make plans to turn themselves in to the court on Saturday morning, because remember this is late in the day Friday. Saturday morning at 8.30 when the court opens up and does weekend arraignments. And overnight, the prosecutor's office, the sheriff's department, the fugitive apprehension team, the U.S. Marshals have a statewide search claiming that James Crumbly and Jennifer Crumbly are on the lam, they are running, they are fleeing, they are trying to avoid charges, and it couldn't be any further from the truth. They are at their friend's art studio, they are waiting for instructions, and they are waiting to turn themselves in first thing Saturday morning when arraignments take place at the court. James and Jennifer Crumbly are sleeping on a mattress in the middle of the night when police locate them. You will hear evidence. They're not really hiding. They're standing outside their car, their vehicle, smoking cigarettes. They're standing outside their car, um, talking on the telephone. They're communicating with various people they know. There's absolutely no evidence to suggest that they're fleeing. You will see body camera footage where when police come into the art studio to find them dead asleep on this mattress, they are cooperative, they are taken into custody, and they are arrested. The prosecution has grossly misconstrued facts in this case, and I ask that you wait to make any judgment until all of the evidence has been presented and you have seen every detail of it, including Jennifer Crumbly's testimony, and she is going to take the stand and tell you about her life with her son, about the day he became the shooter, and about the day he did something she could have never anticipated or fathomed or predicted. 
she will tell you that when she saw the materials in this case, she learned that her son had not been her son for months, <laughs> that he had been manipulating her, that he had been hiding things from her, that he had been sending text messages, alarming text messages, to other people. You will hear that the school never advised Mrs. Crumbly of problematic issues that if she had heard about, she would have jumped right on top of it. Despite the fact the evidence will show that Mrs. Crumbly is on power schools, managing missing assignments by her son in his grades, the school never told her about times the shooter was trying to sleep in class, about a test he had failed, about the shooter being called to the office. She was never informed. You will hear testimony. She was never informed that the shooter wrote an autobiographical get to know you poster where he says he feels terrible and his family's mistake. The school never notified Mrs. Crumbly of this. You will hear testimony that the school never notified Mrs. Crumbly that the shooter was having a, quote, rough time when he spoke to the school counselor. You will hear testimony that the school never notified Ms. Crumbly that previous work found in the shooter's files showed that it leaned a little bit towards the violent side. You will hear testimony that the school never told Mrs. Crumbly about an index card the shooter wrote in class that had odd responses with a drawing of a loaded gun magazine and a person holding it out. You will hear that Mrs. Crumbly was never told much of the information the school had. And so when the prosecution is urging you not to assign fault to anyone else, at the end of the day, we ask that you pay attention to the evidence that Mrs. Crumbly knew. And quite frankly, when you evaluate that evidence and know what she knew and what she didn't know, and learn the context behind the slivers of evidence this prosecution's presenting, you will see that this was absolutely not foreseeable, this was absolutely not expected, and I am going to ask that you find Jennifer Crumbly not guilty of involuntary manslaughter. Thank you, Ms. Smith. Can you, can you tell me who the person this is? I'm gonna ask the jury. I knew I should have given them a Okay, so I'm going to take up the 10 minute break and then we'll hear the first one. Okay. All right, for the jury.
Let them in around the back side, please. The prosecutor. Seems to be good.
it's not. It's not. Here. Great, great. Here. That was her own question. You saw her. I, found, I had to find it last night. I found it last night because I knew she was asking me about it, and I was like, I don't remember where it was. I know that, that she was worried about that. Oh, here, this is it. Can you show me this other time sex? That's what it is. I, I like wrote it down last night because I was like, I knew she wanted to see it. Okay. 
Thank you.
discussion? Probably late to tell you this, but there's a little step there. Um, I found that out the hard way <laughs> in the dark the first time I stayed here, so be careful. All right, maybe see you. Marquise on behalf of Table, Karen McDonald is here as well. And thank you, I'm Shannon Smith on behalf of Jennifer Crumley. Sean Godwin. Uh, who's the first question? Molly Darnell. Okay. Ms. McDonald's to review from Molly. Your Honor, just before. is going to introduce that I'm going to object to. I just want to let the court know. Um, do you know what number it is? I do. It is um, number seven. Um, are, you, are you stipulating to the admission of the other ones or not? Yes. I know we were going to talk about this. Yes. Yes, I believe that um, Mr. Arnold's exhibits five, six, and eight, and we have no objection to those. Seven we do, and I believe that's already been a ruling by the court. I just have to continue my objection. Okay, so this this was ruled on previously. Yes. Correct. Okay. All right. So seven was already it was already admitted in the written opinion. It was, right? Judge. Okay. I just have to maintain my objection. Sure. Thank sure. you. Okay. For the record, that is a portion of the Oxford High School uh, surveillance footage. Correct. Okay. And for the record, we just think it it's not necessary. All right. All right. Could you step forward? <laughs> It's a little cozy in here. I apologize. <laughs> Could you uh, raise your right hand? Do you swear or affirm the testimony about to give? Or is it true? So I'll help you that. Yes. Okay, you can be seated. And then, um, could you state your name for the record? Spell your first name, last name. My name is Molly Darnell. M O L L Y D A R N E L L. Go ahead, prosecutor. Good morning. Good morning. I'm going to call you Molly. I assume that's okay. That's okay. Okay. Um, Molly, can you tell the jury what your profession is? I'm an educator. Where 
Is it, are you a teacher? I am a teacher. Okay. Um, and who is your employer? Oxford Schools. Okay. How long have you been in, uh, how long have you worked for Oxford Schools? I started working for Oxford in the fall of 98. Okay. Would that be your entire career? That is my entire career. Okay. And you stayed in that one school district? Correct. Okay. Um, your current position is what? Um, I work for Oxford Virtual Academy. All right. And when did you begin that position? I began that position 18 months ago. Okay. Uh, I'm going to take you back to November 30th, mm -hmm. 2021. Can you tell the jury what your position was at that time? At that time in Oxford, I was um, under teacher contract, but I was the ELA coach and um, the International Baccalaureate Coordinator. So I worked specifically with curriculum and teachers, um, like instructional moves in the classroom. Okay. So ELA, what's ELA? I'm sorry, thank you. It's English Language Arts. All right. Thanks, Mr. Uh, so how much contact did you have with students compared to teachers at that point? I would say minimal in comparison to teachers. All right. And you, you did, though, spend some time in the classroom in your career? Absolutely, yes. I spent the majority of my career in the classroom. Okay. Um, so on that day, um, what was your typical day like around that time in that position? So in that position, I would work with um, building kind of professional development opportunities or I was working with, you know, working with teachers individually. On that day in particular, I was working with the media specialist and my other coaching colleagues, my other instructional <coughs> coaching colleagues on building professional development for the next day. All right. Did you have a classroom? I had an office uh, that I shared with two other individuals and it was like half a classroom, but it was in the educational um, hallway. So it was a classroom made into two yeah. offices. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, can you tell the jury when classes began that morning? What was the schedule of the day? It began and end, if you, if you remember. Um, so you're referring to like the start day of the school yes. day? The school day started um, around 7.30 um, and ended around 3 o'clock. Um, and I know Oxford had a, a different, they didn't have mm -hmm. exactly the same schedule yeah. every day. Yeah, we had a rotating seven, so we met six days a week. Um, or sorry, we met six classes a day, um, and we, but we had seven classes. So they, the students only were there in every single class for four hours All right. a week. Can you tell the jury what passing time is? Passing time was about, Oxford's one of the larger high schools in the state. It's the largest single floor high school in the state, I think, at the time. Um, and Do you so know how many students? I, I, you know, off the top of my head, I don't. Okay. Um, and... Um, and so there were about eight minutes between passing times, uh, or between passing. All right. November 30th, 2021, uh, were there any COVID protocols still in place? Yes, we were still in masks um, at that point in time, yes. And were lockers being used? Lockers were not being used. Okay, so how were the kids getting their things from class to class? They were carrying book bags. Yep. I'm going to um, show you what's been marked as people's proposed Exhibit 5. I don't believe there's an objection, Your Honor. That's correct, Your Honor. When I say I'm going to show you, there's, it's going to be on this screen and this screen. <laughs> okay. Molly, what, what is that? Uh, that's the layout of the high school. All right. So that's a map of the school. Correct. Okay. And can you tell me where your classroom slash office was? Um, so if you're looking at that yellow portion, I am, thank you, um, I am where you see 222, and then there's 226, I'm that little sliver right in between there, and that was 224. Okay, Mark's going to show you yep. on the map. He's Correct. not letting me have access to the clicker for the yep. trial, so <laughs> relying on him. Okay, so is that your classroom? Yes, that like little sliver where you can see, it looks like a bunch of names are written in there. Mm -hmm. um, that was the room that I was in, yes. Okay. And I'm going to take you to um, around the time of about 12.50. Okay. Um, what were you doing during that time? So on that day, um, 
the, the year prior I was in the classroom and, um, and I had a student who popped by um, around that time just to check in and wanted to chat. Um, I had a chat with her. There was, I believe it was the beginning of passing that she stopped by. We had a quick little chat. Um, was that conversation in your it was office, in the office or in the hallway? Yep, it was in the office. Was the door open or closed? The door was open. Okay. Um, we had a little chat. Um, she left. I was alone in the office. Um, and passing was still happening, so I moved to my, um, my desk space just to check some emails, check on a, you know, a couple of things. Okay. Um, so your desk was in the back of the classroom? Yeah, it was towards the back side, yes. Facing the door? Facing the door, okay. correct. Um, and did you have a practice of what you did during passing time? So sometimes I would go out in the hall um, and check, like just to check and see what was going on, or I might chat with the teacher or two. I didn't on that day because it was towards the end of passing time, and so I knew things would be wrapping up and teachers would be heading back to their classes. Okay. Uh, so at some point, did you see or hear anything unusual? Yeah, so... Um, all of a sudden, I could hear a commotion in the hallway, and I look, you know, looked up from my, from my laptop, and I see a bunch of kids running through the hallway. It was a pack of kids, um, and they were moving pretty quickly, and there was a commotion around it. Um, I couldn't tell if it was like excited, you know, that that it was like higher pitched though, and it was almost like some of the kids' hands were extended, like they were trying to move really quickly. Okay, for the record, you have your hands, both your hands yep. up, shoulder, um, Okay, and that seemed unusual to you? It did. Okay, did it seem unusual because of it, it was at the end of passing time, or just because of the movement and the sound? It was the movement, it was the sound, it was the large bulk of kids okay. that were moving. Um, what did you do? Um, I exited my office. I believe that there was possibly a fight. Um, so I, I run out of my office. I'm about midway through where 222 is. Um, and I see all those kids exiting out of door four. So I know there's not a fight. So if you look at the map, you come out of your classroom and you look down the hallway and they're all running out of the school? Yeah, on a door four. Okay. And that was unusual. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? Yes, I had never seen that before. All right. Um, and, and then what happened? Um, I paused for a second because I'm thinking, like, well, what, what is, what's going on, right? I don't know what's happening. Um, I head back into my, my office space. The hallway is completely clear. Um, and I walk into my office, and I'm like, all right, what what could possibly be happening in this moment? Was, was it unusual for the hallway to be completely clear? Um, the, I don't believe the bell had rung yet, so okay. that was unusual. Okay. And so what did you do? Um, it was, um, in pausing, um, trying to like gather what to do next, I heard three things pretty quickly together, like so quickly together that I have a hard time distinguishing what ha came first and what came last. Um, but there were the sounds of like three like loud pops um, that I could have mistaken for lockers closing if we were using lockers. Okay. So when you heard the loud, the three pops, what did you think they, that sound was? I, well, again, there was... There was that, there was, um, doors started slamming. I could hear like boom, 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 boom. And, um, and then uh, the principal at the time, Steve Wolf, came over the PA and said, um, we're heading into lockdown, this is, not a, this is not a drill. And how long had you known Steve? Uh, so a couple years at that point in time. Okay, did his voice sound panicked? Um, his voice sounded, it was like, a, urgent, but you could tell he was like tempering any, um, you know, like panic. So was that before the, the loud pops or after, if you can remember? Honestly, I, I, I cannot remember. Okay. When you heard this, was your door open or closed? My door 
when I came back in, um, I pulled it, but it didn't shut, so it was open um, a couple inches. Okay, so what did you do? Um, at that point in time, I moved to shut my door. Okay. Um, did you, after the pop, did you smell anything? No. Did you see anything? No. All right. And then you t tell the jury what happened when you turned around and headed to the door. So um, I walked to the door. I immediately pull it shut. Um, to the left of my door, so my door was here, and there was a glass part, like, you know, floor-to-ceiling glass. And then right here was a night lock system. Can you tell the jury what a night lock system is? So a night lock is a simple gadget that goes into the door that goes into the floor so that if the door were unlocked, it's like a second security measure. Um, if the door was not locked or even if it was, um, someone can't get in. So if the glass is shut out, they can, even if they were trying to undo the door, they can't open the door. And when did you learn about night locks? Um, maybe four years prior. Okay. Did you do that? Well, why did you install the night lock? Um, well, one, I was directed that we're in lockdown, okay. right? So as soon as I knew that we're, we're in lockdown, that's what you do. Um, did you, were you able to install the night lock? So I grabbed the night lock, you know, I undid the, the, the piece, grabbed it, um, and looked down at it. So I also, um, some of the doors have different installs, that whether the door goes, you know, in or out from mm -hmm. the room. And so I looked at it to see, just to remind myself which one, um, because the other office that I have at the middle school, or had at the middle school at the time, had at, a different. At this point, Molly, the door is shut or closed? The door is shut. Are you facing the door or facing the I'm way? facing the door, okay. so I'm, but I'm close enough to that wall because I had just grabbed it. Do you know about what the distance was between you and, and that door? Um, not even a foot. Okay. And then what happened? Um, I look at it. And out of my peripheral vision, I can see some sort of movement. Um, and so I look up. Um, and I see someone dressed in dark, oversized clothing. And you're looking through that glass looking pane that glass next pane. to your door. Okay. Uh, they have the mask on, uh, a hat, glasses, and a hood. Um, and I lock eyes with them. Had you ever seen that person before? I had not, no. Did you know if it was a student or is that a no? I, have, I did not know if it was a student. All right. And you said you locked eyes? I locked eyes. Um, and then instantly I noticed I see some, some movement. And so I looked down and um, I realized he's raising a gun to me. Can you describe? Yeah, the gun, um, the gun was, it was black, and I remember thinking, uh, as he's raising the gun to me, that there was no orange tip. Um, I had heard prior that BB guns have an orange tip. When you say he was raising the gun, can you explain what that, what that looked like? Um, was it, was it, one arm or two arms? Well, I just saw the one starting to move up. I saw the gun, and I moved. Which way did you move? I moved away from the, from the glass partition, away from the, from the door, toward back into the room. Okay. You just described, you saw something in your per peripheral vision. You looked up. Um, you locked eyes. I locked eyes. He didn't hesitate. About how long was that from the time you saw the peripheral vision and then the gun was raised? A second. Okay. If that... When you locked eyes with this individual, what did you see? I'm sorry, can you repeat that question? Describe that for me. Um... I lock eyes with him, and I instantly see that movement, and, and I jump to the side. Okay. What happened after you jumped to the side? Um, as I jump, 
I can. And was the night? Did you ever get the night lock installed at that? The point? night lock is not installed at this point. Okay. So when I move, um, I kind of jump and turn my body this way at the same time. Okay, and you're for the record, you're motioning, turning your yeah. shoulders to the right. To the right, mm -hmm. um, and I feel uh, like my my left shoulder moves back a bit, and I feel a burn like hot water had stung me. Where did you feel that? Um, in my um, arm. Which arm? In my left arm. Okay. Up You're pointing to your, your yeah. right below your shoulder. Yep. Okay. And are you are you standing up? Or are you sitting down? Or are you? I'm standing up at this point in time. Um, I feel that hot that hot burn go through my arm, um, and I turn back. There was a window in the back of my room that leads out to the courtyard, and I see a bullet hole. Okay, I'm going to um, show you on the screen. It's been marked as um, people's proposed exhibit six. What is that, Molly? Uh, that's the office that I share. Okay. And that, can you just describe where the desk is, where, what, what you just described, and point that out? You said yep. you turned around um, to the back of the classroom. Yep. So you can see on that window exiting, there's a white mark. Right there? Yep. That would be the bullet hole. Did you, is, is that what you... Um, noticed when you turned around? That is what I noticed when I turned around, correct. Okay. At this point, what were you thinking? A BB gun can't do that. I... It seems like really silly. What seems silly? That I couldn't wrap my head around what was happening. I mean, after you felt the, the warm and you still were thinking it might be a BB gun. Yeah. Okay. So what did you do? Was um, the night lock installed at this point? The night lock's not installed at this point, and, and the only thing I'm thinking is I have to barricade this door. Like, there was instinct that kicked in. Um, so what you can't see is right around that corner there was this huge filing cabinet. And I think if we can point so to the, around that corner to... Yeah. Okay. And um, so I grab it, because I'm afraid to go back towards the door at this point in time. And I try to move it, thinking maybe I can pull it out enough and push it. And it was just too heavy for me. So that rolling cart was sitting next to it. Um, that's when I pulled out the rolling cart and I, no, sorry, I take that back. It's I okay. didn't do that yet. I crawled down on my hands and knees and I put that night lock in. Um, and then I moved for the rolling. I was like, I just have to keep barricading. I just have to keep barricading. And so I grabbed the rolling cart. Is the object in the... Yeah, you can see it's a little red object on the rolling cart. Yep. Oh, that's the night lock. <coughs> yes. Okay. But that, it's sitting on the, that's the rolling cart, right? Correct. Okay. All right. And were you able to put it in front of the door? I was able to put the rolling cart in front of the door, correct. Okay. And then what did you do? Um, then the only thing I can think of is he's going to come back and finish what he wanted to do. Could you hear anything else in the hallway? At this point, I'm not hearing anything. Okay. And so what did you do? So I, continue, I go back to that large cabinet, because I know if I'm anywhere in the back of this room, he can see. So I need to hide in this front corner. And so I pull that, um, that large filing cabinet back just enough to crawl behind it, so that if he comes to that window, he can't see where I'm at. So the way, way the classrooms are, is you have to be at a certain angle to see certain parts of the room from the hallway, correct? Correct. Okay. And you said you moved to that corner behind because what? Because I, I, I didn't want him to see where I was at. Okay. Once you were behind the cabinet, um, were, you, were you sitting? Uh, I was crouched down. Um, I was trying to make myself as small as possible. I, tried, I got really low. Um, I was on my bottom, crouched as close together physically as I could make myself. Okay. What did you do next? Um, I had texted my husband, I love you, active shooter. Um, and then I started feeling blood dripping down my arm. 
And what did you do? Um, At this point, had you registered that you had been shot? I don't think I was registering that I was shot. I just knew that I was bleeding. Okay. What did you do? Um, I had a um, carnigan on that day, and so I, well, you can see in the photo there's this red little bag on the side, on the right side of the wall. Those are, um, yep, those are medical response bags that we keep in every room. Um, so if someone's bleeding or if a, a tourniquet's needed, uh, they're in there, but I was too afraid to go back and grab it. So, um, so at that point I knew I needed to put a tourniquet on, I knew I was bleeding. Um, I removed my carnigan and I used one of the sleeves of the arm, uh, wrapped it up on top and pulled with one arm and my, my teeth with the other uh, to tighten it. And Molly, um, how many inches down was that wound? Um, it sits right here. Okay. And you brought a card in so that you could Remove. show the jury what that yeah. was like so they know exactly where you were headed. Yep. Go ahead. Um, I don't know if you can all see okay, but... You can step down if you... Okay. Can everyone see? Mm -hmm. So you can see it kind of sits in the back. So when I was turned, that was the entrance and the exit. And there's two holes there. Yep, so it entered here and exited here. Um, and the space in between, uh, the, the heat of the bullet cauterized. Um, the skin? The skin. Okay. You can sit back down. Um, you put the tourniquet where on your shoulder? I put it above the wound. Okay. How do you know how to do that? Um, we go through trainings um, once a year regarding um, what to do, okay. you know, in a situation. What, what happened next? Um, I put the tourniquet on, and it, I'm in my head, I'm thinking, okay, what, what do I do next? What's like the next move here? And my daughter texts me. Um, she didn't go to Oxford High School, but she went to a neighboring school district. Um, and they had heard through social media that there was a shooting at Oxford High School. And so she sent me a message and just said, um, Mom, are, are you okay? Um, and I responded to her that um, I love you. Um, I'm sheltered in place, and I'm fine. You didn't tell her you were I did not tell her I was shot, no. Molly, I want to go back, and I'm so sorry. When um, the shooter raised his, his hand, um, what, what were your, um, what did you notice about, if you noticed anything about his stance, or you said you locked eyes? Yeah, his feet were set about hip distance apart. Um, and that's, you know, he, he was, and his shoulders were like he was square, right? He was square. Um, how long were you in that classroom? Um, I was in there for about 20 minutes. Were you communicating with anyone else in the school or um, law enforcement or administration? No, um, there were a couple teachers. Um, my, my hallway had a text thread, and that was not active. There was nobody texting on that. But another part of the building where the English Language Arts Department is at, they, um, they were texting. And, and one of them said, um, I heard there was a shooter. And I responded that I saw one. Did you respond that I'd been shot? I did not. Why is that? Um, I think I didn't want to like create panic. Like I wanted to make sure that people knew it was serious, but there's no like I'm okay. Okay. At this point, did you have any idea where the shooter was? If anyone else had been hurt, what were you hearing? Anything? Nothing. And it was it was absolute silence for a long time. Um, and then um, I started to hear a volume of footsteps, and I thought. They must be evacuating a classroom. Um, and so when that shift occurred, I texted the teacher next door and I said, hey, 
Um, you're the only one that knows right now, but I've been shot. Um, I hope I'm the only one. How long was that? How mm -hmm. long were you in the room then? At that point, it was, it was probably 18, 15, 18 minutes. Okay. At some point, did somebody ask you to leave the, the classroom? Yes, so the teacher next door was like, oh my gosh, um, I'm calling the office. There was another teacher in the room with her who texted administration. Okay. And at some point, did somebody come to the door? Yep, so the text from administration, um, Kurt Noose was at my door within maybe two minutes. I don't, I, 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 time's hard on that. Um, and he was like knocking, uh, Molly, Molly, are you in there? Um, I've known Kurt News since I, since I started in Oxford. I did not trust that that was him at my door. What were you afraid that it was? I don't know. Um, everything that I knew to be reality wasn't. So did you answer back, or did you open the door, or did you just remain silent? I was. I said, I'm in, I'm in here, and he said, are you okay? Um, I don't remember how I responded. It was within a second or two that, um, that then there were police at the door, and they were like, are you in here? Are you injured? I said, yes. Um, and then I said, I think I said, do you want me to, uh, it was, it was clear that they wanted me to, like, we were going to, they were going to, they were there for me. And they couldn't, they couldn't just open the door. They can't just open that door. That night lock um, prevents them from getting in the door. And Molly, if you know, how would you get into that room if someone doesn't remove the night lock from the inside? Is there a way? So I know there's a special tool to use, but you'd have to take everything off that door, and that's all steel. So the frame, actually. Yes. Okay. Uh, and so they were asking you to, to remove the night lock. Did you do that? Um, oh, I said, do you want me to remove the night lock? And they said, yes, remove the night lock. And then I said, do you want me to open the door? And they said, yes, open the door. And, uh, and I'm down on the ground while I'm doing all of this. Like I'm removing the night lock, and I'm opening up the door from my knees. And they like scoop me up, and I can see two the two officers that scoop me up. But there's I can see Kurt standing there against the lockers, and I can see four cops with guns. Did you see any students? I did not see any students. No. Okay, Molly, I'm gonna play um, a surveillance which is marked People's Exhibit Seven, which I know there is an objection to, um, but the judge previously ruled. Um, just to let the jury know, this is, you're not going to see any victims in this, except for Molly, um, and nor are you going to see any students. While he's um, getting that on the monitor, um, when you say you saw two officers with guns, how far away were they? And were they in the same direction? Um, they were, um, so I, when I, when they scooped me up, the two that scooped okay, me up. Have you look here. Yep. Is that, is that the hallway? That's the hallway. Okay. Um, so you can see there's a multiple around. So it wasn't just the two. And where's your classroom in this photo? Um, it's it's farther down, right? So you can see, uh, yep, like the they're going inwards towards the classroom. Okay. It looks like that's an officer there. Okay. So I could see. I knew that they were officers based on the vests that they were wearing. Um, okay. And so they're just um, they were just around, right, as well, like securing the area, I suppose. All right. Thank you. That you, Molly? That is me.
at this point, are you hearing any, anything in the building? No. Uh, the, everything is silent. Like, uh, almost like it's so, uh, like echoey, it's so silent. Okay, now you can see through that glass door. Is that you? That is me. What's happening? Uh, he's removing uh, the, the self-made tourniquet from my crown again. Um, and he's putting on an actual tourniquet. Okay. And at some point you get into an ambulance, correct? Yes. So at this point, um, he says, I'm going to radio to see if there's an ambulance available for you. Um, uh, making sure that no one else needed it ahead of me. Okay. Um, you eventually get into an ambulance. They take you where? They took me to look here. What happened when you got there? Um, so I um, get to Lapeer, and um, the doctor comes out to the ambulance and introduces himself. Um, and they said, I was sitting in the ambulance the entire time, and then they said, we're going to put you on the gurney. Um, and I said, I can, wa I can walk. Like, if I can walk, I want to walk. And so they help me out of the ambulance, and I walk in, and they're like studying, you know, like hold, kind of almost holding me up, studying me. And the hallways are lined with doctors and nurses. Did you see any other victims? I did not, no. Okay. Um, and they treated your wound? They did. Okay. Um, were you able to, um, I, I assume they ran some tests. I want to be <coughs> cognizant of the judge's prior ruling about um, what you can testify to. But um, at what point, how long were you at the hospital? I have no idea what time I walked in those doors. Okay. Um, I was there for several hours. Um, Did you learn at some point there were other victims? Um, I did ask when I was in the hospital. Um, is anybody else been injured? Um, and, and I was, you know, I was told that there were other victims and a few fatalities, yes. Okay, at some point did you hear a teacher was shot? I did. And what did you think? I, I instantly thought it was, um, another one of my colleagues. I knew the direction that I, you know, I saw him turn, so I knew what direction it came from. And, and who was the teacher in the um, I thought it was Lauren Jasinski that was shot. But who was the teacher they referred to? It was me. At some point, um, you were shown weeks later um, a picture of your doorway. Mm -hmm. Do you remember that? I do. Okay, do you remember who showed that to you? No. Okay, was it, was it me? I did, well, I did see, um, I did see it in your office, yes. Okay, and you were preparing to testify? Yes. Um, I'm going to put that picture on the, on the screen. It's People's Exhibit 8, I don't think there's an objection. Um, Molly, is that your classroom door? It is mine. Um, yes. Okay. Um, what was your reaction when you saw that? He was aiming to kill me. Do you know which one of those shots landed in your shoulder? I don't. Um, I have no idea which one landed in my shoulder, but I know the top one. That's where my head would have been. And the two down below are my chest area. Okay. I unlock that door every day. And what was your, um, did you have some, what's your, what, what, is, what is your, when you think about the, the wound and why you weren't hit, why was it in the chest? That door, the distance, the door, and me moving was the only reason that I'm alive. How many inches from your heart was that, uh, that injury to your shoulder? The actual wound is six inches, um, but my, my turn might have made it less.
be excused, Your Honor. Yes. You can step down here, please. Thank you. Who's the next witness? Christy Gibson Marshall. I'm also concerned of giving a heads up to the jury so anyone's prepared. And then, Your Honor, again, um, the defense objects to, I believe it's just one exhibit you're using. Mm -hmm. Ms. Gibson. Oh, this witness? I believe it's only exhibit mm -hmm. nine. Okay. Mm -hmm. This was previously extensively briefed. Yes. Um, I made it at the moment about it. But your objection. People call Christy Gibson Marshall. Good morning. Could you raise your right hand? Do you swear or affirm the testimony about today? Was it true to help the guy? All right, please be seated. Mm -hmm. Can you state your name and left in this morning to face the last name? Christy Gibson Marshall, K R I S T Y G I B S O N hyphen M A R S H A L L. Thank you. Good morning. May I call you Christy? Yes. Christy, could you please tell the jury where you're employed? Oxford Community Schools. How long have you been with Oxford? 29 years. And what do you do right now? I'm an assistant principal. Okay. And that's at the high school? At the high school. How long have you been the assistant principal at the high school? Six years. And what did you do before that? I was an elementary principal. Also in Oxford District? Yes. Now, if you could tell the jury a little bit about your role as an assistant principal. Um, what are some of your responsibilities? Teacher supervision, um, evaluation, curriculum and instruction, um, supervising, uh, su I do parent communications, um, it's hard to think of all the stuff that my big giant list while I'm sitting here. but. Um, 
we we have a student relations team that works together to um, support our alphabet um, part of the alphabet. We big goal is like to to me my my biggest role is supporting students and and. I love the kids, so just bringing energy and having fun with them. You've been in education, you said, for 29 years? Yeah, yes. So prior, up until this role, you were an elementary school principal? I was, and then prior to that, I was a teacher. Teacher before that, okay. Now, as it happens, the school that you were principal at was Jennifer Crumley's son, one of those students. Yes. Okay. And what grades, if you recall, was he there? Fourth and fifth. Did you have any contact with him in your role as a principal in those fourth and fifth grade years? No. Did you have any contact with his mother or father? Not that I remember. I had an email about a uh, report card once, but that's all I remember. And that would have been years prior? Like fifth grade going to sixth. <clears throat> now I'd like to direct your attention to November the 30th of 2021, about 12.50 in the afternoon. So we have the screen in front of you. That should be displaying People's Exhibit 5. This is a map of the Oxford High School? Yes. If you could tell us, if you recall, where you were about 12.50 in the afternoon that day. I was in the cafeteria. I started in the cafeteria supervising lunches. So what would be, I guess, there are the commons. So right Yes, here? correct. Okay. So was that lunchtime when you were there? Yeah. Okay. Yes. <coughs> and is there a time where you move? So around that, around that time on November the thirtieth, did you have a specific area of the school you would go to, or did you move around? Um, we didn't have a, an assigned area, but um, I like to go to the senior courtyard um, after lunches and just kind of help see this. Yeah, that courtyard area. Okay. The hallway out in front of this courtyard area. Be, between where you see 400 and um, 401. Okay. Uh, our seniors hang out there and they congregate um, in a good way, not terrible. Let me just clarify. Um, it's kind of like the rite of passage and we just like to kind of go there and keep traffic flowing. Okay. Yeah. Is that something, something you would do on a routine basis? Yeah. Um, my bad mom joke on that one is that I make it a senior citizen window and I stand in that area. <clears throat> was there a, a point that day when you realized something was going wrong? When I was approaching the um, senior courtyard, so when I was coming down the hallway from the commons, what says commons, I call it cafeteria, by the media center, by the courtyard, um, and hit the 500 um, room, when I kind of got to that triangle there, that diamond there, um, one of the students that I know pretty well, um, went running by and said, get the hell out of here. And he was laughing and running, and I was like, mm. that was a mixed message. Sure. At that point, was there an announcement on the loudspeaker? No, not at that point, no. No. Was he the only one running? Um, shortly after him, there was a group of kids laughing and running behind him. Um, when I stopped to ask them what was going on, they weren't entirely sure. Um, but as kids started to pass, you could see it got more serious. Okay. I grabbed my walkie-talkie and I, I... What do you mean it got more serious? What do you mean by that? Their faces got more... I'm sorry. Their faces became more serious. Did that signify something to you when you saw that? Yeah. Just something... Them running signified something to me because it's not a typical behavior. Okay. Um, but the running and laughing was confusing, and then when their faces became more serious, I was... Very, started to get very worried, and that's when I grabbed my walkie-talkie. Okay. What did you do with your walkie-talkie? I said, I'm not sure what's happening, but kids are running in the hallway, which is very odd, and um, look like they're trying to leave the building. So where did you go? Um, I, well, they, shortly after I got on the walkie, they, they went to Alice Alert, and so what's I... What's Alice Alert? Alice Alert is our... And it's our intruder, I'm going to call it intruder alert because that's what it was that day, but 
it's a um, notice that we need to take cover, lock down, be aware. It's so an is emergency that assistance. an alarm ringing, or is that somebody who's, who's making, giving a message over the PA system? On that day, it was a message over the PA system. Do you recall who, who gave that message? Steve Wolf. And who was that? Steve is our principal. He's the principal. Okay. So is this shortly after you saw the students leaving that appeared to be more serious to you? Practically the same. Yeah, it was like they went, when it, the more serious students came by, the announcement went on. Now, when you hear that announcement, what were you supposed to do? I'm supposed to lock down. Did you? No. What did you do? I went to check the hallways to make sure people were okay. When you first started to check the hallways, did you see anybody? It, the hallways cleared so fast. Um, when I made the turn down the 400 hallway, I ran into a teacher who was locking his door, and then a student came up who was running late. He asked if it was a drill. I let him know that it didn't matter if it was a drill or not, just you gotta take cover, get okay. in there. Um, and then I proceeded down the hallway. I was the only one in the hallway at that point. Did you hear anything? First, I smelled something. I smelled what I thought was cap gun. Later, figured out it was gunpowder, um, and then I heard two, two gunshots. Where were you when you first smelled what you thought to be cap gun? Probably by like the, the somewhere between four oh nine and four fourteen. Okay. So you were continuing to walk down that hallway, the four hundred hallway, towards the two hundred hallway. That's in yellow highlight. Yes, that's where I heard the gunshots. I was going that direction. You were walking towards the gunshots? Yep. Yes. As you walked down the hallway, did you see anybody else? No. Tell me where you went. When I got to the end of the hallway, I went... I realized how dumb this is. I turned left to go towards where I heard the gunshots. So this hallway... And I went towards... 225. So you came down the 400 hallway and you turned left towards 225? Yes. Tell us what you saw when you made a left. I saw a student laying on the ground. Did you know who he was? I didn't at that time, no. Okay. Um, his face was covered. And then as I continued a couple of steps, I could see another student walking my direction. He had just dropped his, his arm was up and then he dropped his arm. Did you recognize him? Not at that point, no. He was too far away. What did you do when you saw a student on the ground? I, there was a garbage can between he and I, so I moved the garbage can out of the way and I put my foot near him and nudged him and told him to stay there. Did he respond? No. No. Could you tell if he was injured at that point? Um, you could tell he was injured. What happened next? Uh, Ethan then came into closer view, and I could tell it was Ethan. He had been at the school where you were a principal? Yes. Did you interact with him at all at Oxford High School? Just normal, like how I interact with everybody. High fives, hugs, silly stuff that I do. Okay. Um, I brought my elementary to the high school, you know, so I just... just did you, did you say anything to him? When he got close enough to me that I could... I mean, we were sharing the hallway, so he was kind of walking down the center and I was kind of over to the side, so that's... We are probably, what, three feet apart. I um, asked him if he was okay. It just didn't <coughs> seem right that it would be him. He just... So I need to back up just a little bit. When you saw, you didn't know who it was at first, a student down the hallway, you said he had lowered his arm? I knew it was a shooter when he was down the hallway. Okay. Could you see if he was holding anything? I could see a gun. At that point, were you, was he walking towards you or away from you? He's walking towards me. It was when I realized it was Ethan that I didn't 
think he could possibly be the shooter is what happened. Like I know I said that I knew he was a shooter down there because I could see, I could rationalize that that is a gun. He is putting that gun down. He just shot something. Okay. Now, I know this is difficult, but I need you to use your teacher voice and, and speak. Okay. Well as I can. You saw him coming towards you. How close, how far from, from him were you when you recognized who it was? He was probably um, by the room 221 um, when I could tell who he was. Okay. And I was standing um, between, well, between 226 and, and uh, that white section there that, There's exit doors there. Now, you, you said you said something to him? Yeah, I, I, it seemed so odd that it was him. So I said, buddy, are you okay? What's going on? And when he didn't respond to me and he looked away, that's when I knew it was him, that he was the shooter. Did he point the gun at you? He did not. What did you do at that point? I got on the walkie and I told um, I told my team that I have eyes on a shooter and I have a victim. Now this <coughs> hallway, 200 hallway, there's a curve to it. Yeah, yes. Okay. And he was walking, if we followed Mel's cursor here, he was walking down the 200 hallway towards 233 and 237? Yeah, he was walking that direction. That direction? Yes. Did you watch where he went? No. What did you do? There was a student who was injured, so I went to him. I didn't. <coughs> okay. I knew he needed me. And um, I know you're aware, but there's been certain um, rulings by the court. So, just in general terms, did you render aid to that student? I did. Could you tell if he was injured at that point? Yes. Did you recognize him? Yeah, I knew it was another one of my students from Lakeville. Tate near. I just took my breath away. Were you on, you were on the walkie-talkie, you said? Yes. <coughs> so I let them know I had... I let them know I had... Eyes on the shooter, and that I had a victim. Kurt News asked me where I was. It's probably the biggest hallway we have, and I said I was in the 200 hallway. Kurt let me know that that's a very big hallway and needed more direction. I um, I don't know why I couldn't <coughs> process the fact that like my exact location. I told him I was near the 400. Did you stay with Tate until help arrived? Yes. Now, you have seen at least a portion of the Oxford High School surveillance video, is that right? Yes. I'm going to show you what's been marked as People's Nine. It's been admitted. It cannot be broadcast on the media. Oh, I, I've never seen it, so tell me. Oh, the entire, this is a, a short clip of it. <laughs> okay. Have, okay, so you, you guys are not video. Okay. Everybody gets it? No. We're going to stop the live stream? Should we stop the live stream? Yes. Yes, Judge. Okay. Yes, please. Okay. Right. I, I do want to give notice to the jury as well. This is the moving image of a, a victim on this video.
Christy, tell us when we see you. I am approaching right in the yellow jacket there, the gold jacket. Okay. For the record, this is at 12.51 p.m. on November the 30th. So no one's come by at this point? No. About, that's that's when he came by. He said, "Get the hell out of here!" I don't know if you could see him okay. running through there. The first student. And you see more students running. These kids are kind of laughing, and then you'll see me stopping. There we go. And there's my walkie. And you're walking down the, the and middle I'm hallway there. Walking towards the direction that the kids told me. <laughs> they clear the hallways very, very, very fast. That's you at the top of the screen? Yes. I didn't realize that we passed there. This is where the teacher came out. I'm checking another classroom to make sure they were okay. And then continuing on. This is where I'm saying, that's when I, when I stepped aside, that's when I said I, I had eyes on the shooter because he flinched a little bit, at least in my perception that he did. This is where <coughs> I moved that's the garbage can. The that's, that's tape. When I'm talking on the walkie, I try to s step back a little bit because I think it, I, don't know, I think it threw Ethan off a little. And so there he is coming up to me. And I start talking to him here. And I'm letting them know that I have a victim and I have a shooter. I'm asking them questions. And I just come right, I turned my back on him and I came back to tape because I just, I didn't know it was tape then. And then I, that's what right there is when I know it's tape. This is after the police arrive on scene and cut portions of it. Yeah. So police arrived on scene and they were trying to figure out his name. The shooter's name? Yes, and so I left Tate to go tell them who it was, and then I went right back to Tate. I did not want to be away from Tate. I, I was telling Ken, his name's Ethan. Thank you for your statement. Um, we're going to head across. Uh, uh, you can resume, they can resume the live stream, right? Yes, sir. I'm sorry, is, is the prosecution doing the prosecution? Yes. I'm sorry, I really can't think straight. Oh, yeah, I think he said that he's like, Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, I, I have no questions for you. I'm sorry. Thank you. Thank you. Can this witness be excused? Thank you. So sorry, can we just have a minute, like a break or a, can we have a 10 minute break, please? Oh, sure. Sure. I'm going to give you a 10 minute break, okay? All right, for the jury.
be seated. Can we talk in chambers? I just need my client to have a minute to like. Okay, sure. Okay, sure. I, I, I guess I want to. You can not be seated. I want to confirm with the deputies. If I've done about a bajillion trials in the, with the courthouse. I, I wasn't always under the understanding that the defendant had to go downstairs every time we take a break. But is that what you're? I've been ordered by my sergeant. Okay. Well. All right. Okay, so you have to take her downstairs right now. Is that accurate? Yes. Okay. All right. So we're gonna have a lot of time on that break. Okay, thank you. All right. All right. Why, why, is there something you want? Yes. Okay. I, um, I, I, yes. Are we on the record? Can we go on the record? Are we on the record? We can go back on the record. Okay. 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 You want to be on the record? Yes. Okay. You can be seated. You are on the record. Your Honor, um, this court, upon the defense's um, request, instructed the prosecutors not to show emotion. You instructed the prosecutors to tell our witnesses not to show emotion. And you instructed us to let right. our victims know. I, I understand right. the ruling, Your Honor. I do. Yeah. You're concerned about influence of the jury. I, yeah. I, have, I take no issue with it. But it was a difficult thing. It's difficult, and we're doing it. And then to have not just the defendant, her lawyer, sit there sobbing. So I, that did, I did not I, sob. I just, I just want to finish, Your Honor. I just want to finish. I, I just, I, I think if, if that is the instruction, we are trying really hard to respect the court's instruction because I understand the reason for it. Okay, I didn't tell people not to show emotion. I, I, some of that is involuntary. Um, but there, there have been times in this courtroom during trials when people will show facial expressions or they'll, or, you know, things like that, or, or make comments. I understand, this is a very emotional situation for everyone here, right? I, if someone was audibly sobbing in the, the audience, I would hope that they would exit. I, and as you said, you know the reason for it. I didn't tell anybody not to, to show emotion. I, I guess some emotion is involuntary. So I, I guess I'm, I'm asking what you're asking of me. I just, I think it just, it, it, it should apply to both, both sides. Okay. Judge, first of all, I was not sobbing. And this is horrific. This I've is never, horrific. I've never seen this before. It's okay. horrific. That's okay. why we asked the court not to play it. I, this is horrific. I don't know how the press okay. She's watched it a hundred times with these okay. witnesses. Had, it's horrific. You had, you had this video you, for two, over two years. I don't know. I don't have this video. I have to go to their office to watch it. I, you've seen it. Isn't no, it? I, I haven't. Because it's not necessary. It's not relevant to my client's case. We've already litigated this, but we're, we're doing our best. We were not sobbing or making... A scene in any way. All my eye makeup still on. I check my camera. I'm not gonna. I'm not. I'm not having. I need to the bathroom. I need a break. Okay. Okay. We're having a break. That's what we're doing. And you're gonna keep your voices down because. I'm sorry. The, well, I, the the walls are cardboard in here. So. I'm sorry. Can okay. Can we start with the jury instruction? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Okay. 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 If, uh, if people don't at least try to check themselves, to exit, if it's um, that excruciating, which I know it is, I, you know, I'm not a robot. I'm trying to keep myself from sobbing. I'll do it at 6 o'clock tonight, okay? I appreciate that, Your Honor. That's all I miss. Okay. All I Your Honor, we don't have the option to leave the courtroom. We're trying our best. We're trying. I promise okay. you we are trying our best. All right. Thank well, you. Everybody needs to take a deep breath. She has to go downstairs, right? And um, we're going to call you right back. Have her come. Right. How long do you think the next witness is? I'm, you know, I'm, I'm bringing lunch in for the next day. witness is Cammy back. I anticipate very brief questioning. Okay, because I'm I'm having the lunch, their lunch delivered so they don't have to come with the people in the cafeteria. It, it should be less than 30 minutes. So okay, it'll work okay. Out. Fine. All right. Are we going to okay. break from that for that witness? Yes. Okay, thank you. Yes. Great. I apologize. For well, I. It, it's it, it's bad though. It's horrifying. It's, it's, it's horrifying. It, it is horrifying. I, but I, you know, we're trying. We're I, trying. Okay. We'll keep trying. All right.
Let me double check. Defense has no objection to exhibits 24 through 30. Okay. 
I know the court will check with me, but I just want you to. Okay, thank you. Thank you. If you were bringing the candy back, well, I guess you might want to bring the jury in. Make sure. Can you back and spell your first and last name, please? C A M M Y B A C K. Go ahead, Pastor. Thank you. Ms. Back, I'm going to ask you to keep your voice nice and loud for me, okay? Okay. Now, is it true, Miss, that you work at a retail store that sells firearms? Yes. And that's in Oxford, Michigan? Yes. Okay. Um, how long have you worked there? Uh, four years. Okay. What's your current title? Uh, office manager. Have you always been the office manager? No. As office manager, um, do you assist with gun sales? Yes, I do. Okay. And what did you do before you became the office manager? I was a counter. I'm sorry? I worked the counter. Okay, the counter? Yes. Okay, so you would deal with customers? Yes. And you're familiar with the procedure when someone um, purchases a fire? Yes. Okay. <clears throat> Now, there is a specific process when somebody purchases a handgun, is that correct? Yes. Could you tell us a little bit about that, please? So, when you come in to purchase a firearm, whether it's um, a handgun or a long gun, um, we have to have your ID. Um, you have to fill out a 4473. What's that? Um, it's a federal firearms form for okay. the customer. Um, once that is done, um, Myself or whoever will run a NICS check um, on the computer. Okay, can you tell us what that is? That is where you send it over to. Um, oh, I just lost my train of thought. Oh, <laughs> uh, to the FBI, and okay. then they take it from there. Okay. Do you know what happens with that? When you I do the not. FBI? Nope. So you take this information in, and the uh, customer fills out certain forms, and you send that off. Yes. Okay. And how long does that process usually take? Um, sometimes it could take seconds. Sometimes it could take up to 30 minutes okay. or longer. Is someone able to walk in and buy a firearm or to buy a firearm and walk out with that gun purchase that day? As long as they pass the background check. As long as everything checks out? Yes. Now, what happens if things um, don't check out or if there's some kind of delay? Does that ever happen? Yes. Okay. And tell me about that. So... Um, if a customer is delayed, uh, you, we are giving them a Brady date, which is five days. Um, within those five days, um, the NICS check could come back as a perceived or it could come back as a denied. Um, after five days, if there is no response, then we are allowed to um, hand the firearm over to the customer. Okay. Do you know the circumstances in the background why somebody might be or denied? I do not. Okay. Now, when the store you work at sells a firearm, do you also provide a ATF pamphlet on handgun safety? Yes. Is that with every handgun purchase? With every handgun, yes. Okay. And 
Tell me about that pamphlet, please. What kind of information is contained in there? Um, it just states um, the do's and the don'ts um, as far as, you know, when you buy a firearm, child safety, um, how to lock it, um, just to pretty much keep your firearm safe and out of the hands of, you know, anyone that doesn't need to have it. Okay. And that is uh, provided by the ATF? Yes. Okay. That's the, the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms? Yes. All right. Does your store also provide a trigger lock statement? Yes. Okay. And is that one of the standard forms that has to come with the firearms purchase? Yes. Okay. And tell me what that is, please. So it just... Um, the trigger um, lock form, um, we take and we make sure we check the box, that it has the lock in the box, and that it has a, a box that can be locked. Okay. Now we say the lock in the box. What do you mean by that? The trigger lock. Okay. So when your store sells a firearm, you also provide a, a lock with it? Yes. Okay. And that's not an actual gun safe, correct? That's, that's a smaller locking device. Yes. All right. Um, and that happens with every um, handgun sale from your store? Yes. I'd like to direct your attention to November the 26th of 2021. Do you remember that day? I do. Okay. And were you working? Yes, I was. Did you, well, first of all, I should ask you, as office manager and someone who's been employed at the store for four years, every time a firearm is sold, is your receipt kept? Yes. Okay. Um, on November the 26th, 2021, did you sell a handgun to James Crumlin? I did. Okay. And was he there with somebody else during that purchase? Yes, he was. Okay. Was it an adult or was it a teenager? Teenager. Okay. Did you come to learn who that person was? Later, yes. Okay. And, and you came to learn that it was the defendant's 15-year-old son? Yes, sir. Okay. But you didn't know that at the time? No, I did not. Okay. Now, during the purchase uh, between yourself and James Crumlin, did his son do anything? Never. Okay, so he was there, present, but he didn't interact with you? No. I'd like to direct your attention also to June the 15th, 2021. Um, did James Crumbly make another purchase of a fire on that day? That I cannot say. Okay. If I showed you receipts, um, would that refresh your memory, you think? Yes. Okay. So what I'm going to do is go through some exhibits with you. It'll be on the screen in front of you. These okay. are all stipulated, too. Can you see that? Yes. Okay. This is exhibit 24. This is, do you recognize this is a receipt from the store you work at? Yes. Okay. This is June the 15th, 2021. Do you see the date? Yes. All right. And the purchaser is James Robert Crumbly? Yes. And it has his address. And it has the item uh, purchase, and that's a Cobra Classic for $180 total. Yes. And that's actually a, a 22 Derringer pistol, is that correct? Yes. Okay. 24 has been admitted, I believe, with stipulation. Um, I, I believe that Ms. Smith was willing to uh, stipulate to 24 for 30, is that correct? That's correct. 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, and 30 are admitted, so. Okay. Thank you, Judge. This is exhibit 25 right here. It says pistol sales record. Can you tell us about that, please? So each time that a pistol is sold, we have to uh, provide the customer with a pistol record. Um, they, they are given those, and they are instructed to have those dropped within 10 days of the purchase. Okay. Now, this has a description of the pistol. Is that right? Yes. So it says... This is a Cobra Classic. We just saw the receipt for. Do mm. you see that on there? Yes. Okay, and it says pistol shot in the number two. What does that mean? It's a two shot. Okay, so it's a small handgun? Yes. And barrel length 2.25. Is that in inches? Yes. Okay. It says purchase transfer date is June the 16th of 2021, whereas the receipt was June the 15th, 2021. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us what happened there? So um, I believe that Mr. Crombley may have gotten a delay on June 15th, and he had a proceed either later in the day on June 15th, or he may have gotten a proceed early morning on June 16th. Okay, and that's because there's some kind of delay in the background information? Yes.
Um, Ms. Bag, is it true that some handguns sold by the store actually come with their own cable locks, not just from the retailer themselves? Yes. Okay. So, whereas in on, on uh, November the 26th, you provided a, uh, a lock, not every handgun has to be provided a lock by your store. Yes, it the, does. Because the manufacturer gives the lock themselves. Yes. Okay. So, I don't think that was clear, so I just want to back up for a second. So... Uh, some guns that come in from the manufacturer, the manufacturer do not provide locks. Okay. We have to provide those. Got it. Sorry. Okay. No, that's okay. <laughs> okay. No, that's my fault, not yours. Okay. The um, Six Hour, for example, they do not provide their own locks. Is that right? Some they do, some they do not. Okay. And if they don't, then you would fill in that gap? Yes. All right. Now, this is Exhibit 26. This is a receipt, James Robert Crumbly, June the 16th. And this is the Caltech P1722 LR, total price $349. Do you see that? Yes. Okay, this is Exhibit 26. And again, this is June the 16th. That's the day that he would have received the Derringer. Yes. Be right? Okay. And here's Exhibit 27, which is the actual pistol sales record. And again, purchase transfer date, June 17th of 21. So there was a delay in this purchase as well? Yes. Okay. And this description is, it's a 16 shot, barrel length is 3.8 inches. Yes. So it is, it's bigger than the Derringer. Yes. Okay. Now I'm moving on to Exhibit 28. This is from November the 26th of 21, the date we've already spoke of. So this is a receipt, total $519.35. Again, James Robert Crumbly, is that right? Yes. Okay. And this is the day you recall seeing somebody with him? Yes. His son, okay. Do you recall if his son was with him in June, or did you not complete that purchase? I did not complete that purchase. Okay, that's fair. But as office manager, you can tell us that those records are from your store. Yes. Okay. Here's exhibit 29. This is the pistol sales record. And this is from the Sig Sauer on November 26. Is that right? Yes. Okay, so this is a 15 shot and it's 3.75 inch barrel. Yes. Is that right? Okay. And he walked out with that gun on November the 26th, 2021. Is that the date that we have right there? Yes. Okay. Now, hypothetically speaking, if there was a 15-year-old who walked in your store and tried to buy a handgun, would you let him? Absolutely not. Okay, that would be illegal, right? Yes. Okay. Here's Exhibit 30. This is a portion of the financial, for the firearms transaction record. I think you referred to it as a 4473. Do you recognize this? Yes. Okay. And was this provided, this was filled out by James Crumley? Yes. Okay. And... What's the purpose of this form here? That is to keep a record for ATF for all firearms that are sold. So there's certain certain boxes are checked here, and the condition of the gun is notified. In this case, it was it was used. Yes. Okay. Um, and the purchaser has to assert certain things before he can he can walk out with that with that gun. Is that is that right? Yes. And one of those boxes are, are you the actual transferee or, or you are the actual buyer of the gun and it's not for somebody else? Right. Because it is not legal for someone to buy a gun for somebody else through your store, correct? No, it is. Well, that person has to come in and, and uh, fill out this paperwork. That yes. Right? right. So it would not be legal for an adult, for example, to check this box that the gun is for himself and then transfer it to a child. Yes. Can you dip, tell us the difference between a cable lock and a trigger lock? So a cable lock, um, you have to take the slide off of the pistol and run the cable through the barrel and bring it out and to lock. Trigger lock goes directly on the trigger. Okay. 
And do you recall what was provided to James Trembley on, June, on, on November the 26th? I believe it was a cable lock. A cable lock, okay. So it looks like a rope. Yes. And then at the end of the rope, there is a, a locking mechanism? Yes. And then that's um, fastened by a key, would that be right? Correct, yes. Okay. There's some firearms that can't be secured with the cable lock versus trigger lock, or is it unique to certain guns that you need one versus the other? I don't believe so. Okay. Does your store always provide either a cable lock or trigger lock, or does it depend? They, we provide both. Both? Yes. Okay. But on this particular occasion on November of 2021, it was a cable lock. It was a cable lock, yes. I have nothing for it. Oh, hang on one second. Sorry. Thank you, Judge. No. Um, thank you, Your Honor. Um, I just want to go back through the exhibits. Would it be easiest if I had the prosecution go back through them if I ask, or is it easier if I just transfer it to my laptop? Okay. I can do this. Okay. Um, can you put up exhibit number 24, please? Just so that the jury can see it. And if you want, I can put it on my computer. I have them. Oh, we have another flash drive, don't we, that we provided to the jury. I, yeah. I have them on my computer. Do you want me to take the reins and use my laptop? Yes. yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, Your Honor, we just need to switch this over then. Oh, God. Just hit that button. And then I've got to plug in my. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Shannon Smith and I represent Mrs. Crumley. I'm going to ask a couple of questions. And if I ask anything confusing, can you please just slow me down and let me know? Sure. Okay, thank you. It's not my job to confuse you. I want to make sure you understand each question I ask. Okay. Um, the first exhibit the prosecution showed, exhibit 24, which was admitted, is a receipt for a Derringer gun. And I just want to be clear that Derringer gun was purchased by James Crumbly, correct? I cannot say. If you look at the receipt. By the receipt, yes. Okay, so by the receipt, it indicates James Crumbly purchased the weapon. Mm -hmm. and it's, it's, yes. Yes. yes, I'm sorry. And it's fair to say that Jennifer Crumbly's name does not appear anywhere on that receipt. No. We went, we talked about exhibit 25, the pistol sales record. Um, and this was the uh, pistol that was bought back in June of 2021. On this receipt, or I'm sorry, on this pistol sales record, James Crumbly is the person who purchased this pistol. Is that correct? Yes. Jennifer Crumbly's name does not appear anywhere on this pistol sales receipt, correct? No. I'm sorry? No. Thank you. All right, exhibit 26 was admitted. This is a receipt from a Caltech gun that was purchased, correct? Yes. And again, on this receipt, it indicates that James Robert Crumbly purchased the gun. Yes. And J Jennifer Crumbly's name does not appear anywhere on that receipt. No. All right, I'm turning to exhibit 27, which was admitted. This is the pistol sales receipt 
from the Caltech that we just talked about in the, in the prior receipt. I'm sorry, this is the sales record. The sales record indicates James Crumbly bought this, this gun. Yes. Okay. And Jennifer Crumbly's name is not listed as the purchaser or she's not anywhere on this record, correct? Yes. All right, I'm going to number 28, which has been admitted. This is the receipt from the Sig Sauer that was purchased in November of 2021, correct? Yes. You have a direct memory of the purchase on the Sig Sauer gun, correct? Yes. And on this receipt, this gun was purchased by James Crumbly, correct? Yes. The receipt does not have Jennifer Crumbly's name. No. And when this gun was purchased, James Crumbly was accompanied by a teenage boy and no one else, correct? Correct. And you were testifying that um, you didn't have any interactions with the teenage boy who was with Mr. Crumbly. Correct. And when you saw this teenage boy with Mr. Crumbly, there was nothing about him that stood out to you as unusual or weird or something that would have raised concern about selling the gun to James Crumbly with his son, correct? No. I'm sorry, there, the court's making a record, so it's, it's really important we talk one at a time. I, I'm not trying to cut you off in any way. I just need to make sure the record's really clear. Sure. So I'm just gonna re-ask, and I'm, I'm doing it just to have a clear record. When, when you saw Ethan Crumbly with Mr. Crumbly buying the gun, there was nothing about him that concerned you about selling the weapon to Mr. Crumbly, correct? Correct. And on that date, you vividly remember it was only the two of them at the gun store purchasing that weapon, correct? Correct. And again, on Exhibit 29, this is the pistol sales receipt. Jennifer Nick Crumbly's name does not appear anywhere on the pistol sales receipt, correct? Correct. And I'm gonna open Exhibit 30, which has been admitted. This is the firearms transaction receipt. This is specific to the November gun that was purchased, the Sig Sauer, correct? Yes. And on this form, James Crumbly is the only adult that filled out this form, correct? Yes. Jennifer Crumbly's name does not appear anywhere on this form. No. And the information provided um, was all provided by James Crumbly, correct? Correct. And you cannot sell a weapon to a 15-year-old who walks into your store if they came in and wanted to buy a gun, correct? Correct. And if you don't know the answers to these questions, I can ask someone else, but I'm gonna ask you, um, when a parent buys a gun, um, you have, a parent has a right to take their child to a shooting range, correct? Yes. A parent has a right to take their child hunting, correct? Yes. A parent has a right, when they own a gun, to allow their child to use the gun at things like a gun range or hunting or along those lines, correct? Yes. You testified that with the Sig Sauer gun, it did not come from the manufacturer with a lock, correct? A cable lock. That was a used gun. Okay, so the used gun did not come with a cable lock in the case, correct? 
It may have. If it didn't, you provided a cable lock yes. to that gun. Yes. And in order to take a cable lock off a gun, you have to use a key, correct? Yes. And the key is, it's not just any key, it's a key specific to that cable lock, correct? Yes. And in Michigan, there is no, as far as you know, and if you don't know, you can tell me and I can ask another witness, there is no requirement that a person has to store a gun in a safe, correct? Judge, I'm going to object. That's calling for legal conclusions. Well, it, 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 it is. It, it is calling for legal conclusions, isn't it? I'm, I'm, I'm assuming you guys could stipulate to that at some point. But, or, other way, is that appropriate for this or, witness? Yeah. Okay, we'll, we'll yeah, take care of that later. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, when you sell guns to people at your store, you also, um, you do not, you're not required to also sell them a safe for that gun, correct? Correct. As a precaution, if it does not come with a cable lock, you make sure that every gun that leaves your store is sent out with a cable lock if one can be put on that gun, correct? Cable lock or trigger lock. Or trigger lock. Yes. Okay, thank you. There is not any time that you recall seeing Mrs. Crumbly at the store looking at guns, considering buying a gun, anything along those lines, correct? Correct. And of course, I don't expect your memory is perfect. I'm just asking by recollection, you don't recall that Mrs. Crumbly was in there? She was not, no. It's also not illegal for a father to bring children in or a teenager in with them to purchase a weapon, correct? Correct. Mr. Crumbly is not the only person who has ever been in the store purchasing a weapon with minors present, correct? Correct. And there is nothing that when you come to the door of the store that says minors cannot enter the store or, or look at what, what you have in terms of your stock, correct? Correct. May I have just a minute? Sure. I have no further questions. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Just very briefly. Ms. Mack, I'm just going to clear a few things up. I'm afraid I wasn't terribly clear. Some sure. things. Um, first of all, after the shooting in Oxford High School, agents from the ATF, they came and spoke with you. Would that be right? Yes. Okay. And ATF, that's the government agency that sort of regulates the finance or the firearms transactions. Yes. Okay, at least to your understanding. Yes. Okay. And when you, well, first of all, let me ask you this. Do you recall on November the 26th when that Sig Sauer was sold to James Crumbly, if he shopped around at all or if he went right to that gun? He went right to that gun. And did he make any statements about that? That he had had his eye on for some time. I would object okay. to the hearsay of the uh, co-defendant who's not present in this trial. Yes. It's not offered for the truth of the matter, sir, the judge. It's offered to show that he went right for that gun. Well, I guess he, he asked whether or not he uh, looked around. He didn't, he didn't look at anything else. No, ma'am. Thank you, Judge. And um, were you able to tell if um, that transaction for the SIG Sauer on 11 26 21 was for cash or for credit? It was cash. Cash, okay. And you did that by comparing the receipts on November the 26th, and there were no credit or check transactions that had been made in the amount of $519.35. Correct. Okay. Thank you, Dr. President. Can I ask you, there's also an Exhibit 31. This oh, is. that's going to come through Agent Brandon. Okay, I just wanted to make sure you didn't have to uh, bring this up the stack. Um, I'm, I'm going to start. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Judge. Thank you. Your lunch is here. Okay. Um, the fact that we're um, providing lunch doesn't mean that you can't 
leave the building or go out to your car and do things like that. I just I want to avoid any interactions in the cafeteria um, that uh, could, could impact you. I don't, I don't want people talking to you. Um, and I don't want to feel comfortable. All right. So um, your lunch is in the cafeteria. Um, as an hour. We'll come back at about. Um, you can return to the jury room at 10 after 1 minutes. Lunches are in the jury room. Um, don't discuss the case with anybody. Don't do any research. Don't go on Facebook. Don't uh, read any news on your phone or computer or otherwise. Um, and don't discuss the case with anybody. And we'll be back at about 10 after 1. Okay. All right, for the jury.
Thank you, Mark. Please, some people. Thank you. I'm Shannon Smith. I'm here with Jennifer Smithley. Please, let's know us. Sean Godwin. I'm here with Jennifer Smithley. All right, Kelly, you can be seated. Uh, I wanted to let you know that my colleague, Judge Brennan, has been conducting a jury trial this week that she started on Monday. No one else in the courthouse was permitted to conduct a jury trial while we were doing this one, but she did take a jury on Monday. Um, I just learned that three jurors on her trial were approached by media and asked if they were jurors on a friendly matter. Uh, the Sheriff's Department is conducting an investigation. Um, as we know, jury tampering is a crime. If I find out that anyone approaches a juror in this matter, uh, they will immediately be taken into custody in uh, order to uh, appear before Judge Warren. This is not a threat. I'm going to bring you one, okay? Thank you, Judge. Thanks. Just so the record's clear, our next witness is Agent Brett Brandon. Counsel's indicated that she has no objections to any of the exhibits. I'll, I'll make that record before you. Okay. Does. And that's correct. Special Agent Brett Brandon. And judge, for the record, we did speak uh, with counsel. There's a stipulation to the admission of all exhibits through this witness. That's 31 through 75, Judge. I, Your Honor, just give me one second. Okay, sure. Yes, that's correct. I just was checking the number. Thank you. I'm sorry. 31 is listed as, but you're going to do it through. Yeah. Okay, okay thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Could you raise your right hand? Do you swear and affirm the testimony about to give the truth? So I'll help you out. I do. Could you pull the door for you? You have a step up. Have a seat. Um, could you state your name for the record? It's not your first name. Yes. Uh, <coughs> Brett Brandon, B R E 
T T Brandon B R A N D O N. <clears throat> Thank you, Josh. Good afternoon. Afternoon. All right, just to um, let everyone know, there's this is, there's a lot of exhibits here, so um, Mark and I are, are going to try to do this um, at least get the exhibits together to to be as efficient and quick as possible. Um, <clears throat> Special Agent, what's your formal title? Uh, it's a Special Agent with the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms, and Explosives, commonly referred to as the ATF. All right, and um, as part of the, as being a Special Agent in the ATF, what are you assigned to right now? Uh, right now I'm assigned to the uh, Pontiac Gun Violence Task Force. Uh, it's a partnership with the Oakland County Sheriff's Office uh, focused on investigating uh, the criminal possession and use of firearms, specifically uh, shooting investigations. Okay, and for those of us who don't, or people might not know exactly, uh, it, it should be common sense with the name, but what, what does the ATF do? The ATF enforces the nation's arson, explosives, and firearms laws, but as you might expect, our primary focus is on uh, enforcing the federal firearms laws. Okay, and does it involve state laws or regulations in any way? Yes, so as, uh, as I stated before, I'm on the Pontiac Gun Violence Task Force, and uh, through that and other partnerships, we commonly uh, embed with and work with state and local law enforcement on a daily basis. Okay, so you, stu you, you do still enforce state laws in that capacity? Yes, investigate state crimes, yes, with, okay. the, with the state and locals. Investigate, thank you. Um, can you tell the jury what your background and experience is? Yes, um, I have a Bachelor of Arts in Political Science from Oakland University, uh, I also uh, went to law school for one year at the Catholic University of America. Um, I then uh, went to the ATF National Academy and completed the uh, requisite training to become a special agent. So you, you would rather be a special agent than a lawyer? Yes. Okay. <laughs> um, and, and how many years have you been in the ATF? Uh, I've been an agent for uh, a little over 10 years, and I've been with the agency for uh, nearly 15 this summer. I was a student intern uh, working primarily in intelligence, uh, for four years, both in undergrad and that one year of law school. Okay. Approximately how many uh, shooting investigations have you been involved in? Uh, hundreds. Hundreds? Yes. And um, you, you testified earlier, your job is to enforce and investigate federal firearm laws, but you do, do you have a general understanding of, of state firearm laws? Yes, I investigate... Uh, crimes committed within the state of Michigan uh, involving firearms as a part of my assignment on the task force and other previous assignments with that task force setting, yes. Okay. Uh, Special Agent, are you, um, are, do you know who Jennifer Crumbly is? Yes. Do you see her anywhere in the courtroom today? I do. Would you um, describe what she's wearing? Uh, she's got a uh, gray and white sweater on seated at the defense table in the middle. Thank you. May the record reflect he's properly identified. The record reflect the court identification of the defendant Jennifer how uh, did you get involved in the investigation um, on this this prosecution and, and one with the shooter? Can you explain to the jury how that happened? Yes, I'm the uh, federal agent assigned to the Oxford shooting investigation. Okay, and, uh, let's go back to November 30th. Do you remember where you were that day? Yes. I where was, were you in the morning? I was in the uh, Detroit Field Division office um, in downtown Detroit. Okay, and when did you first hear of the shooting? Uh, within uh, several minutes of the shooting, um, an assistant special agent in charge at the time came into my partner and I's office and informed me that there had been a, a shooting uh, at Oxford High School. Uh, he knew that I uh, grew up in a surrounding town, was aware of the area, and uh, wanted to inform me. Um, I immediately grabbed my things and ran out the door uh, out to my, my car and drove north. Okay. You, you've responded... And part of your job, do you respond to active shooters? Yes. Okay. Um, when you heard about the Oxford shooting, did anyone um, assign you or tell you you had to drive there and, and go to the scene? No. And did anyone else in your office at that moment go with you? Uh, at that time, I think information was still coming in. At that time, I don't think anyone had responded yet. No. And what, what made you go immediately? Uh, I had familiarity with the area. I knew exactly how to get to Oxford High School. I'd also uh, been involved in another investigation recently with the Oakland County Sheriff's Office at that time. Uh, I had a close relationship with them and uh, thought that I'd be able to get on the ground quickly and, and help out in any way I could. 
And this was the community that you're familiar with? Yes. Okay. Um, about how long was it after you heard that you left the building? Immediately. My uh, chair was still spinning, uh, according to my partner. So your, was your partner there when you left? No, he had stepped out for a minute. And when he came back, your chair was spinning? Yes. Okay. So how long does it take you to drive from downtown Detroit to Oxford High School in a normal day? With traffic, it uh, could be quite a time, definitely around an hour. All right. Um, talk to me about once you got on the road, uh, on the way up there. Uh, as I started driving on the freeway, I believe it was when I got to uh, uh, the Troy area, the Big Beaver exit, uh, that I began to notice other law enforcement with their lights and sirens activated also driving uh, north on 75 and joined somewhat of, I'd call it, a caravan on I-75 joining other people. What was the rate of speed in the caravan? It was, it was fast, but it was safe. Um, so th there was no traffic. People were... Was everyone moving to the side of the road? Yes, people were getting over at that time, yes. Okay. Um, as you drove, were you aware whether or not it was a, a false alarm or if it was a real active shooting situation? As I drove, I began to receive information uh, from our intelligence uh, <coughs> employees that uh, it was indeed a real shooting and that there were reporting there were uh, victims and fatalities. Okay. Do you remember who else you talked to on the way to the shooting? I spoke to uh, ATF Intelligence Research Specialist Michael Malone. At one point, uh, I also spoke to my wife. Um, about how long did it take <coughs> you to get there? Approximately 35 minutes. And you arrived with a caravan of other first responders? Yes, as, as I got off uh, a little pier road around 24 um, to drive north towards the high school, um, it was like the Red Sea had parted and everyone was parked on the right side of the road. Um, and there was a caravan now of people coming from Auburn Hills and Pontiac, um, unmarked cars, marked cars, and uh, joining that caravan to, to get to the high school. Lights and sirens? Yes. Um, what did you observe when you approached the Oxford High School complex? When I arrived at the school, um, I saw some Oakland County uh, deputies that I had known from prior cases, um, as well as other people from uh, other departments starting to, to run towards the school. Uh, at that point, I don't exactly recall when I learned that the um, shooter was in custody, but I knew there was no gunfire going on and, and no one was moving as if the threat was still active. Um, it became clear to me that the, not the scene was secure, but that the, the threat had been either eliminated or detained. Did you see any students? in the parking lot or around? No. Were you able to determine where the students were? Yes, as uh, I drove past, uh, I believe it's the Meyer there, I, it seemed like there was way more cars than normal in that parking lot, so I assumed that's where they were meeting. Okay, so you approached the building and um, you en did you enter the building? Yes. Um, which uh, entrance? Can you pull it? Um, it would have been- Never mind, it's gonna be too much. The, we, we had a map of the school that we um, that we admitted earlier, but where where in relation to that hallway did you approach the building? Uh, I arrived at the main entrance, uh, which would be off Ray Road, and where the parents would drop off their students in the morning or pick them up in the afternoon and the buses go. Um, I arrived at that entrance. Okay, when you approached the entrance, uh, were you allowed in? Yes, my uh, law enforcement status was verified and I was allowed to enter the building, yes. Okay, tell the jury what you did. Um, as I entered, I realized that they were on their, uh, I believe at that time, their second clear of the building to make sure that it was safe. Um, again, I had worked with other uh, individuals from the Oakland County Sheriff's Office, and they informed me that Lieutenant Willis was in charge. Um, at that time, I thought the best use of my uh, federal abilities and, and assistance would be to locate the firearm and start the urgent trace. So I just want to stop you there backing up. You go into the building, and when you say it was a second clear, so just to make sure everybody knows that means the students were, were no longer there? Yes, the students have been evacuated at that time, yes. The, sh the shooter was in custody? Did you, were you able to learn that? Yes, during that time is when I learned that the shooter was in custody. Okay, and, and what was the scene like when you approached? And, like, how many people did you see? Uh, there were dozens, if not 100 law enforcement officers in the main 
front office area of the school. Okay. And you were told that Lieutenant Willis was the the ranking officer in charge? Yes. Okay. This this guy right here. That's right. Okay. And did you did you track him down? Yes. Where was he? Uh, he was standing in front of the administrative offices in the front of the school. Okay. And and what did you do? Uh, I told him that I was from ATF. Um, I believe some other people let him know who I was as well. And then uh, I asked if I could get the identifying information and physically observe the firearm used in the shooting. Why did you do that? Uh, so to start a, a, a trace to determine who first bought the firearm, I needed to know the make, model, and serial number of the firearm. And I wanted to physically inspect it to make sure that the information I was getting was accurate. Okay, but it might seem like an obvious question, but that's, that's also what... The ATF does, correct? Yes, that's our that's our primary role in a situation like this. In addition to being, act, you know, responding to the active shooter situation, um, that is the you know the number one thing that we offer that other people can't start themselves. Yeah. Okay. And so, what was uh, Lieutenant Willis's response to that request? Uh, Lieutenant Willis brought me to where the firearm was located. It was in a uh, trash receptacle with some other items. I believe a couple magazines and uh, maybe the shooter's cell phone. And I was allowed to take pictures of those items and markings. Uh, and I transmitted that information to uh, ATF Intelligence Research Specialist Michael Malone to start the urgent trace. Okay. When you say a trash bin, this, this wasn't a stationary thing. This was someplace the, the, uh, the weapon and the magazines were placed there by, by uh, some law enforcement, correct? Correct. Okay. To basically contain them? Yes. All right. And had they been touched? Do you know? Uh, to my knowledge, uh, they hadn't been touched. Uh, they, I know they, the, gun, the firearm was made safe. And a round was ejected to make sure there was no other additional rounds in the firearm. Uh, but other than that, I don't think it had been handled at that point. Okay. And you immediately started tracing the gun, you said? Yes. Okay. And, and then what did you do? Uh, it was learned through that process that an individual in Rochester, Michigan, had purchased that firearm. I'm sorry, Special Agent Liz. Describe the weapon. Were you able to tell what kind of weapon it was? Yes. It was a uh, Sig Sauer. Uh, SP-2022 9mm pistol with a specified serial number. Okay. And you, I'm sorry I interrupted you, but you were able to, to um, find out who owned the gun? Yes. So based on the tracing process, uh, which ATF can contact the manufacturer to find out who they sold the firearm to, and that would be a federal firearms licensee. Most people call them gun stores, but they're federally licensed uh, gun stores. Um, through that process, that, that gun store gets contacted, and then they provide the information that uh, identifies the first purchaser of the firearm in interstate commerce. Um, and that information identified an individual in Rochester. Uh, two special agents went and spoke to that individual who stated they sold it back to the uh, gun store in Oxford, and then those agents then responded to Oxford. That How quickly Oxford. was that happening? Uh, with, within an hour. They found out in an hour to go to this person, individual in Rochester who said he already sold it back to the, the, the federally licensed store. Yes, I, I don't know how long it was between the actual start of the tracing process to when they eventually made it back to the gun store, but it was very quick. And again, the, the, the way you trace a weapon is, the, is what? Can you tell the jury? Yes, so the, the tracing process Federal firearms licensees, gun stores, have to maintain records. It's called the 4473 that shows who they sold the firearm to. Um, they are paper copies held at the business. And so ATF would contact the manufacturer to find out who the manufacturer sold this firearm to. But how do they identify which gun it is? Uh, it's, it's based on the, the make, model, and serial number of the firearm. So every firearm has its own individual serial number? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, what... You said you were agents were doing that, um, and they ended up at a the store where the gun was sold back to. Correct. Yeah, All right. Correct. What were you doing doing during this time? Uh, at that time, I looked for uh, Lieutenant Sam Marsban of the Oakland County Sheriff's Office. I had, again worked with him on prior cases, and uh, wanted to see what I could uh, assist with. Um, it became clear that they were uh, the Oakland County Sheriff's Office was beginning to type a search warrant for uh, a residence in Oxford, the Crumley residence on East Street. And um, I began gathering facts and creating timelines for Lieutenant Mars Band to use in the search warrant affidavit. Okay, and at some point did you find out um, what the other special agents found out from, from the gun store and, and who that gun was sold to? Yes. And what did you discover? 
Uh, it was sold to James Crumbly on November 26, 2021. Okay. At that point, um, you said you started assisting Lieutenant Marsman? Yes. Okay. And then what did you do? Uh, as a part of those responsibilities, um, uh, Detective Wagrowski was uh, pulling the surveillance video of the school for the, the shooting, and I started to create a uh, timeline of events and pass that information along to Lieutenant Marsman, um, as well as, I believe, looking for uh, Ethan's class schedule to determine his whereabouts throughout the day. Okay. Um, when you learned that the gun was sold on November 26th to James Crumbly, um, before we get to that, how old do you have to be to, to purchase a gun in Michigan? Well, under federal law, how, how old do you have to be? Under federal law, to purchase a, a handgun uh, from a farm, federal firearms licensee, you have to be 21 years old. Okay, and do you know under state law? Uh, yes, based on my participation in this investigation and others, uh, to buy a, a handgun from a federal firearms licensee, uh, under federal law is 21. If you're buying a firearm from an individual in the state, uh, that requirement's not there. It's not a federal law to do that. It's 18 years old. Okay. And to be clear, we're talking about handguns? Yes. Okay. Um, were you able to determine whether or not uh, James Crumbly um, or anyone else in the household um, had owned any other firearms? Yes. Can you tell the jury how you determined that? Uh, yes. As a, a part of taking place in the, uh, or taking part in the search warrant at the Crumbly residence, um, I learned that uh, James Crumbly had previously purchased um, two firearms from that same uh, gun store in Oxford. Okay, and what were those, the names of those firearms? What kind of handguns? There was a uh, Cobra Classic uh, ENT Derringer 22 caliber as well as a Caltech P17 22 caliber pistol. Okay, I'm going to um, hand you what's already been previously admitted, um, the actual physical evidence, and we are going to Can you, what's this marked and admitted as People's 32? Is it a 32? Can you um, tell the jury what that is? Yes, this is the uh, Sig Sauer uh, SP 2022 9mm uh, pistol that was used in the school shooting. Okay, and just so the jury knows, you've made that um, safety handle, correct? Correct. Okay. And I just hand it to you for a yep. second, just so everyone can see it. Can you, do you know about how much that weighs? It's, it's heavy. For me, it's heavy. Yeah, it's, it's, not a, it's not a light firearm, no. Okay. Um, that's previously admitted. Um, it's Exhibit 32. It's Exhibit 32. Special Agent, that is the murder weapon, correct? Correct. Okay. And what's the significance of a 9mm? versus another handgun, particularly the Derringer and the Caltech. So the, the cal it would refer to the caliber. So the caliber is, the, is measured in the diameter of the bore of the firearm. The bore would be where the uh, projectile or bullet expels from the firearm. Uh, if it's the 22, is just the measurement versus the 9 millimeter, meaning that the 9 millimeter is a bigger round than the 22. Okay. I don't think they saw that. So. No. The, the bore, I'll take the, the bore you're referring to is right here? Nope, it would be where the projectile actually would come out of. Here? Nope, it would be through if you could actually, this would be considered the bore and that is the side, the diameter of that is the caliber of the specific round oh, in Can you just hold it up just a little bit so yes. that the jury can see? Okay. Um, you were able to determine that the 
there were two other weapons that James Crumbly purchased, correct? Yes, correct. And were you able to determine when those weapons were purchased? Yes, uh, one was purchased on purchased and picked or purchased on this uh, June fifteenth and picked up on uh, June sixteenth. That would be the uh, Cobra Classic uh, ENT Derringer, and then on June sixteenth, uh, uh, James Crumley purchased the Keltec P seventeen twenty two caliber pistol, but did not pick it up till the seventeenth of June. Okay, I'm going to take this for a second. Peoples 33. You can just grab that out of the box. Yep. And can you tell the jury what that is? Yep, this is the Cobra Classic uh, Derringer purchased uh, uh, on June 6th, picked up on June 16th. Okay, can I have that first yes. so I can see? Does everyone see that? Okay. So this is significantly smaller than the 9mm. What is, uh, you said earlier, it's the caliber, um, but some might look at this and say it doesn't even look like a handgun. It's yes. very small. It, it is very small, and, and it only has a two-round capacity uh, for the firearm, uh, but it is still a firearm, yes. Okay. And then I'm going to hand you People's 34. What, it, what is that? This is the Keltec P17 uh, 22 caliber pistol purchased uh, by James Crumley on June, uh, picked up on June 17th. Okay. So I've just handed you and admitted three separate weapons that were in the Crumbly household. Um, this was the murder weapon referred to. Did you, did, are you, you've examined all the evidence in this case. In fact, you're, you're one of the officers in charge, correct? Correct. Okay. And, uh, is this the same gun that was posted um, by Jennifer Crumpley as the as a Christmas gift to her son? Yes. Okay. And how, how do you know that's the gun? Is there anything unique about it, just looking at it? Yes, that's the, that's the specific make and model, and obviously the serial number uh, would be distinct as well for the purchase by James Crumbly. Okay. okay. And then this is the Caltech, significantly lighter. Do you, do you know the, how much each weighs? I don't know off the top of my head how much each weighs, but it is lighter than the SIG and uh, the Derringer. Or okay. The Derringer and the SIG, are, or the Caltech, are less than the SIG. Okay. Can you um, tell me what the difference is in terms of caliber um, between the Derringer, the Caltech, and a, a 9 millimeter? Actually, can you tell the jury? Yes. So the, the Derringer on the top is a 22 caliber. The Caltech in the middle is a, 20, a 22 caliber, and the Sig Sauer is a 9 millimeter. Okay, so what what would you typically use a, a Derringer and a Caltech for? Uh, generally speaking, target practice. Um, I guess some may use it for self defense. Um, I would say more than 9 millimeter for uh, self defense and target shooting. Okay, and how you said you investigated hundreds of, of shootings? Yes. Okay. Any um, multiple victim shootings? Yes. All right. Have you ever responded to an investigation or a scene on multiple victim shootings where a, a Derringer was used? Uh, I, I can't say for certain if a Derringer was used, but a 22 caliber, regardless of the type of firearm, I, I don't believe in my career I've ever worked a, a multiple victim case with a 22 caliber uh, scene. Okay. Why is that? Uh, this is like, again, Your I guess. Honor, I would object to that. That would be speculation on why he hasn't. Um, yeah, there's probably a better question. He, but he doesn't know why can I get? Can I just get some leeway and I'll, 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 I'll clear it up. I'm just going to get to that question very, very quickly. Well, because he, that, that does help for speculation. So, go ahead. Okay, thank you. Um, what What is the weapon you normally see if on a act on a multiple victim shooting? Your Honor, I would object to the relevance of this. It. This case is about the Sig Sauer being the weapon. We don't dispute that. We all know that. Response. My response is that that weapon is more dangerous. Your it Honor, causes more damage. I object to I, this I just, record. Just, I object to making this record in front of the jury. Miss McDonald is using this opportunity to tell the jury information that I'm objecting to, and I'm asking if we can approach. Okay. Do 
you want us on the hall? to show in our case the reason why that weapon, the 9mm, was purchased and why it's significantly <clears throat> different. That, that is, and it's absolutely relevant. It, it has yes, to do with... present other evidence that will show why that... Yes, including statements of the shooter. Your Honor, I, I think that's extremely... Well, there, there are some statements that are coming into the trial, right? There are, Your Honor, but there is there is no way the prosecutor can prove this weapon was bought to kill people, specifically by James Crumbly or Jennifer Crumbly. And this case is about Jennifer Crumbly. It's not about Ethan. It's not about James. Um, okay, so part of it is about what they knew, though, right? Part of it is about, about what the parents knew. Part of it is about what the parents knew, mm -hmm. but... There is no evidence to lay a foundation that my client knows anything about the deadly capability of these guns. Nothing. She has no, it, it there sounds is like no it, foundation. It sounds like an argument she's going to make in defense, and in, in, in her defense, and she has a right to. I just want to be able to have my, my witness testify about what kind of weapon this is and what the reason you have a 9 millimeter versus a twenty two. Well, I guess another question is that, that's, is that you, you can shoot more bullets out of that quicker. Is that, is that what you want to know? That and, no, and the type of damage like those bullets can I do. I know a lot of, about guns you can take. Right? I, I thank you, Your Honor. Okay. I'm just, okay. I'm not sure every member of the jury does. So I'm just, I'm trying to explain it in, to people who are not familiar with firearms. Okay, well, yeah. No, I, I understand that. Part, part, part of what you're saying might might um, be argument, but it, it's a fact question that the SIG can eject more rounds quicker. You can shoot rounds quicker from the SIG. Power I don't know. I don't know that that's necessarily true. So if you just give me a couple questions. Okay. All right. Thank you. What okay, is the, the difference question. between the the SIG and a twenty two? It's the, the size of the round is the main difference. Okay. okay. The size of the, the actual bullet, for lack of another, I yeah, know you say round. Okay. Yes. And why does it? Why does the size matter? Uh, the size matters because the you know the larger the bullet, the bigger the hole. Okay, more damage, whatever it is you're shooting. Correct. Okay, thank you. Um, all right. You said that. Uh, when all of the, when the other special, age, special agents were um, finding out where, where these weapons were purchased, you were still at the school. Yes. And then can you um, talk about what you did with Lieutenant Marsman? Yes, I was uh, watching the surveillance video from the school documenting um, the shooter's uh, path through the day as well as his actions during the shooting. Okay. And what were you able to view? The actual surveillance video of the, the shooting taking place. And who showed that to you? Um, I was with uh, Lieutenant Marsban and Detective Wogrowski. Okay. When you say the actual surveillance, what does that mean? So there was an administrative office inside the high school that uh, had the computer system with this, uh, the surveillance video playing on a large monitor. Um, I was in that room reviewing the footage as it played. Okay. And we're going to get back to that, but... Um, at some point, did you actually go to the home? Yes. Why did you do that? Uh, Lieutenant Marsban uh, had obtained the search warrant at that time, and I responded to assist with the search warrant. And when you arrived, who else was there, if anyone? Uh, multiple detectives from the Oakland County Sheriff's Office uh, and also uh, Lieutenant Marsban. Did you actively take place, or, um, search the home, or were you just present? Uh, I actively assisted in the search. Okay. Did you recover anything in the house related to uh, these weapons or relating a, a case, anything? What did you find? I, I don't want to put words in your mouth. Yeah, I, was, I was present uh, for the recovery of evidence, uh, and I also observed uh, two targets on uh, the wall in what would be the, um, I guess you'd call it the shooter's childhood bedroom, which shares a wall with his uh, parents' okay. bedroom. Before we get to that, did you recover these two handguns in the in the um, in the house? 
I was not the one who recovered them, but I was present when uh, everything was there. Okay. Yes. Um, did you were, were any other cases or boxes or anything related to the to the firearms recovered? Yes. Okay, I'm going to hand you what's been marked as people's 35. Can you tell the jury what? Yeah, it's a minute. Well, what that is. Yes, this is the uh, pistol case that came with the Keltec pistol. It would be the middle firearm on the table over there. So this? Yes. And you previously testified, and, and through the other witness, this was purchased June 21st. Uh, it would be June 17th. Oh, I'm sorry, June 17th. Okay. Yes. Okay. Is that it? Yes. All right. And does that case have a locking mechanism? Uh, it's, it's not locked now. There are two holes in it, like most standard pistol cases, where if you needed to lock it, you could slide standard locks through each one of these holes. So these holes right here? Yes. Okay. Is that um, a cable? Is that what you do with a cable? No, we're, we're going to get to that, Your Honor. <laughs> I promise. Um, okay. Can you un, uh, open that, that case? Okay, do you know where that case was found? Uh, yes, it was in the kitchen, I believe, underneath the island or in a cabinet. Okay, um, and you're, if I can see this for a second, you open it up and what is, what's inside this Caltech case? That is a cable lock. Okay, um, is this how it was discovered? Was this cable lock in the Caltech case when, you, when this was found? Yes. Okay, I'm gonna hand you the cable lock. And can you tell the jury exactly what that is? Yes, so a uh, cable lock is used uh, as a mechanism to uh, make a firearm inoperable, um, and it's something you have to defeat to operate the firearm. What do you mean, defeat? So you'd have to find the key, unlock it, or take it off in some other way to uh, load and discharge the firearm. Okay. Um, when you examined that for this first time, what, if anything, did you notice about it? Uh, I noticed there wasn't much wear and tear. The packaging didn't have many markings on it as if this thing, if this, if the cable lock had been taken in and out. It's very wide, so taken out many times, there'd be more markings on the sides of this cable lock. It looks almost uh, new. Does it look like it's ever been disturbed? No. Are there, how many keys go with the cable lock? Uh, generally, you receive two keys on the same, uh, key ring for one cable lock. Okay, are there two keys in there? Yes. Okay. Anything else about this? No. All right, have you ever opened this up? No. And as far as you know, no one's actually disturbed this? Uh, not to my knowledge. Okay, no. so this is, this is in the same uh, condition as it was when it was found in the Caltech um, case, correct? Yes, that's my understanding. Okay, can this be used on all of these handguns? It can be used on the, the Keltec pistol and the Sig Sauer pistol. Uh, I'm not sure how small that cable is um, for the Derringer. Um, it, it may fit, I'm not quite sure. Okay, thank you. This is exhibit 39, yeah, the cable lock. Oh, the lock is separate. Yes. Okay. Okay. And that's it. I'm handing you what's been um, admitted as People's 36. <coughs> and what, what is that, Special Agent? Uh, this is a black um, safe with a combination on the front. Um, it was found in the Crumley parents' bedroom on the uh, shelf in the TV stand or, or dresser where they kept their TV. Okay. How many um, numbers is the combination? It's three. All right. And what is it set at? Uh, zero, zero, zero. All right, what's significant about 000? zero, zero? Uh, that is generally the factory default for a lot of uh, safes. Okay, so even though to some people who aren't familiar with firearms this might look like a box, this is actually what you refer to as a gun safe, correct? Yes. You call this a safe? I would call that a safe, yes. Okay, what, if anything, was was found inside this safe? Uh, both the Derringer and the Keltec pistol were located inside that safe. Okay, I'm going to hand this back to you, and then I'm going to hand you 
the Caltech that was found in it. And if you could place that in there as it was found. Okay. Imagine the slide was forward on this when it was found. And then I'm handing you the Derringer. Okay. Can I see that back? Is this how these two handguns were found in, um, the, home, in the bedroom of Jennifer and James Crumbly? Yeah, I don't recall the exact positioning, but both were placed in the in that safe. Yes. Okay, and it was uh, it was closed and locked to zero zero zero. Uh, I'm not sure the combination at the time when it was recovered. I know that the combination is zero zero zero. Okay. Um, have you had an opportunity to examine this and um, determine whether or not um, the the sig fit in this this safe? Yes, the SIG is too large of a firearm. The safe will not close with that firearm inside the safe being the SIG. Okay. Will it not close if, the, with, if there's another one of the other handguns, or it, it, it won't fit no matter, regardless of whether a handgun was, another handgun was in there? Uh, it will not fit by itself or with another firearm. It will not close. Okay. All right. I'm handing you what's been admitted as People's 31. What is that? This is the pistol case for the Sig Sauer 9mm pistol uh, used in the school shooting. Okay. So, in other words, that is the case that this Sig was, was sold in? Yes. Okay. And do you know where that was found and where, where, where was it recovered, if you know? It was located on the bed in the uh, uh, Jennifer and James Crumley's bedroom next to an empty box of Patriot Defense ammunition. Okay. And does that have a locking mechanism? Uh, it doesn't have one inserted, but as the other pistol case, there are two holes in the pistol box that you could place a locking mechanism through to secure the case. Okay. And Your Honor, I would just object um, as to foundation for where this, where the gun case was found, because this special agent came in after other law enforcement had pulled that case out, opened it, and put it on the bed. And so it's very misleading for this jury to hear that this gun case is just laying on a bed. And so I, I would just ask that there be foundation laid about how he... Okay, I understand. So, could you, can we respond? Yeah, okay. But judge, he was, he was on scene at the search warrant scene. He was on the search warrant scene, but what she's saying is, is he, is he initially the one that found that case and was it found on the bed? Can you clarify? It, it was found on the bed, but I, I, I think it, at least two times Miss Smith said she didn't object to foundation on our exhibit. In which case, it sounds like she does because that's that's a foundational question. And that's not true. I object to the question. I don't object to the exhibit. I I object to the foundation about the testimony of that being found on the bed, making it sound like these parents left it out on the bed. We're happy to have another. The person we we have. Um, when uh, you, officer story to, to when you saw the gun case, it was on the bed. No, no, not when I was in the search warrant house. No, I, when I was in the house for the search warrant, I did not observe it on the bed. No, at that point, it had been moved off the bed. Okay, we're we're happy to bring that in through another officer. Okay. No, no problem. Um, okay, can, can we you get clarification then on where he saw this gun case? I I, I can ask Ben Cross. I'm sorry. Never When's mind. the first time that you had a chance to examine that, special agent? I believe it was on the, uh, with the other evidence, either on the kitchen counter or on the dining room table inside the Crumley house um, once I arrived on scene. So you saw it that day? Yes. Okay. Um, and can, if you can place it on the ledge there so the jury can see it, um, can you turn it around? Is it, is it, is it clasped right now? Are you, uh, you're leaving for its admission, right? It's already admitted. Oh, she stipulated to the admission. And you know what happened? It was listed under a different okay. witness, but we do stipulate. Okay. Okay, thank you. Um, could you, uh, is, it, is it classed completely right now? Yes. Okay, could you, um, oh, can you, would you mind, would you mind if you, if you stand right there? Yep. They're all like starting to stand up to see, so. Is that okay, Judge? Sure. Okay. I, I'd like you to demonstrate how to open that um, for the jury, if you could just maybe place it on the ledge so that they, they can all see it. Your Honor, we can't see it. Can we? You can move it. Okay. Or can we just see it maybe twice, like sure. show them the sure. Thanks. And I'm sorry, 
ATF Youth Handgun Safety Act Notice. All right, and if you open up the hand, the uh, pamphlet, what are the first two items there? For the record, that's 37, right? Yes. That's a, that's a demonstrative aid, 237. Oh, okay. Right. I'm going to get to okay. So at the top it says Youth Handgun Safety Act Notice. The first bullet point says the misuse of handguns is a leading contributor to juvenile violence and fatalities. Number two, Safely storing and securing firearms away from children will help prevent the unlawful possession of handguns by juveniles, stop accidents, and save lives. How familiar, familiar are you with that pamphlet? Uh, from this investigation, pretty familiar. Okay. And what, do you, what, what is the purpose in the law around, if you know, why, why, do, why is that included in every sale? Uh, I, I think the, the, head, the, no, the um, title of the pamphlet speaks for itself. It's a Youth Handgun Safety Act notice. It's putting you on notice that not safely storing your firearms will contribute to juvenile violence. Okay. Um, you've had an opportunity to examine all of the evidence in this case, probably the digital evidence, um, the evidence from the phones, the physical evidence, the narratives, correct? Yes. Okay. And what did you notice when there, the gun, the, the SIG was photographed by the shooter and then the, um, a couple of the other images taken. Was the pamphlet with it? Uh, in some photos it was, in others it was not. Okay. And up until recently, what did you think happened to the pamphlet that was sold with the, with the SIG? Your Honor, I would object to speculation. Isn't it speculation? I'm, I'm getting it. I would just ask for a, a little leeway. Okay, it's part of his investigation. Wait, why, wasn't it, why isn't it speculation? What do you think is happening to Did you know what happened to it? No. Okay. And then recently, did you discover what happened to it? Yes. Can you tell the jury how? Uh, preparing for trial, I opened up the Sig Sauer pistol case. This right here? No, that would be oh, I'm sorry, yes. this one. Okay. Here. Uh, this was in the last week? Yes. Okay. And uh, I noticed that there was a piece of paper underneath the foam, so I lifted up the foam and found a receipt from the, uh, um, ref what we're referring to as the gun store in Oxford for the firearm, as well as the ATF. Youth Handgun Safety Act notice. So it was under the foam in the case that the SIG was uh, stored in yes. when they left the gun store? Yes. Okay. All right. Thank you. One moment, Turner. That's 37. Okay. One of the cases. Yes. Special Agent, what are the requirements um, once you purchase, you've been cleared to purchase, and you do purchase um, a gun in Michigan once it's cleared and checked and you're allowed to purchase it? So Can as you a just part, take it home and it's yours and you, that's it? No. So as a part of this investigation and others, um, I am aware that uh, when you purchase a firearm in Michigan and are given a pistol sales record by the uh, federal firearms licensee, you do have 10 days to take that to uh, basically local or county law enforcement. Okay, were you able, or are you able to ever determine whether or not that was done? 
for any weapon? How do you do that? Uh, so there's a law enforcement database. Robert, I would just object. I may we please approach. Uh, What is required after you purchase the weapon, legally purchase the weapon? So, based on both work experience and personal experience buying firearms, uh, we're instructed to take that pistol sales record to the local or county law enforcement within 10 days of the purchase. Okay. Is, that's different from having a, a, a CPL? Yes. Okay. Talk to the jury about what that is. I think sometimes people get confused if they think once you get your, your CPL, then you don't have to register it or vice versa. So a concealed pistol license basically is just a permit to carry the weapon on your person uh, within the state of Michigan. It's called a, called a concealed pistol license. Which is not an issue here, but it's not. It's different than registering the firearm. Yes. Okay. And I think the last question I asked um, was, is there a way the ATF can determine whether or not a handgun was registered in Michigan? Uh, there, there's a way that you know state, local, and federal law enforcement can query in Michigan to determine if a firearm has uh, a firearm uh, registered. Yes. Okay. Okay, and can you tell the jury how that Yes, yeah, so there's a, a, a law enforcement database that state, local, and federal have access to that you query uh, the serial number of the firearm and it determines, it'll pop up who the firearm is registered to if it's registered. Okay, and did you do that? Yes. Okay, and so the Derringer, was this registered? No. Okay. And the Caltech, was this registered? No. Okay, and then the SIG, was was that registered? No, it was not. But I will say that there is a he had some time. To he had that. some time to still drop it off after, but there were events that occurred. Obviously, the shooting happened within that ten days. Right. Thank you. One moment, Your Honor. <clears throat> So um, we previously admitted um, the trigger lock statement, 
and Mark's going to try to pull that up and keep track of it. There it is. And it's, it's People's 38. Um, who, whose signature is that, if you know? What's the name on the, on the statement? Uh, under, under purchaser, it says James Crumbly. Okay, and can you tell the jury what this trigger lock statement means at the top, the, 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 the boxes and, and yes. what it what indicates because they're checked? Uh, so this form uh, was provided by the, uh, the gun store in Oxford during the purchase. Uh, it was filled out by both uh, James Crumbly and Cami Beck uh, during the purchase. And the first part says, this sale included... The first box that checked is, uh, it says, a trigger lock or other device designed to disable a firearm and prevent the discharge of a firearm or a gun case or storage container that can be secured to prevent unauthorized access to the firearm. It basically means that those two things have been provided because those boxes are checked. Uh, in this case, being the cable lock and the gun case itself, if you put locks in it, could uh, be locked. Okay. Thank you. And that's been previously admitted. Um, I want to take you back to watching the surveillance of the shooting. And when I said, and I asked you, what does that mean? Um, from what time to what time did you were you able to to watch surveillance in the school? Are you referring to the, my, like the actual time of the day? No. How much surveillance did you watch, and and what did it include? Uh, I watched a majority of the footage, including Ethan's whereabouts through the day, shooters. or the shooter's whereabouts through the day, and then also uh, the actual shooting itself and uh, the aftermath of that. Okay. Uh, and if you know, were you able to determine how many rounds were fired? Uh, 32. Okay. And watching the surveillance um, from an investigative standpoint, was, was anything... Um, interesting or um, cause you to, to take other steps? Yes, there were, there were three main things that, that caught my attention during the video, uh, specifically during the shooting. Uh, the, 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 there were three things? There were three things, Okay, yes. can you list them for the jury? Yes, so first, uh, as the shooting began, uh, the shooter was using only one arm for a majority of the first part of the shooting. Um, and then as he moved down the hallway and um, Tate comes into view of the screen. Um, he takes a two-handed shooting grip, takes a, uh, I would call a shooter stance, feet wide, his shoulders roll forward, and he takes aim with using the sights and fires one round. When you say using the sights, what do you mean? Uh, it, meaning that there's, there's a mechanism on the firearm that allows you to take aim. Uh, if I can... Yep. Okay, I'm handing you... The SIG, which is the murder weapon, can you show the jury? You are gonna have, might have to stand up. Yes. So uh, here you see how there's two white dots back here. I'm sorry for this is a safe firearm. Uh, the two dots back here are considered the rear sight. See that over there? And if you line up the front sight with the rear sight, that is how you aim a firearm. Uh, in the video, I noted that Ethan did that. On the, shooter. The, the, the shooter did that on the first shot as well as the second shot he took at Tate. Okay, especially we have not shown that that surveillance um, video at this point. So I'm I'm going to try to um, provide some context. And um, what did you when you were watching this? And you, you mentioned the stance and lining up the sights. Um, was this a was the shooter rushing? Um, was the shooter going at a fast pace? What can you describe what you saw? Yes, during that specific portion, he came to a, a dead stop and took aim. And then as he moved forward, he walked two or three steps forward and then took aim again uh, and, and discharged the firearm. And what seemed <coughs> remarkable about that to you, well, if anything? Your Honor, I just object to the relevance. This is not the trial for the shooter. I... Your Honor, the, the knowledge of uh, firearm proficiency is absolutely relevant and it is a, a contested fact and it is relevant to these proceedings. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to allow it. Um, I, I hope you guys do understand that, right? Uh, we're, some of these things overlap, but you were carefully chosen to distinguish between what the shooter did and what we're here about. And we all trust you to do that. So I, I know it's difficult and, and an emotional day, but um, some of these things are not to 
horrified or upset you, but to, to, to let you know some of the circumstances. So I hope that you uh, separate those things. And it, it is offered precisely what he's testifying to about the proficiency with the firearm that the shooter had. Um, yeah, I'm gonna allow it. Thank you. What, if anything, was remarkable about that? Uh, when I first saw it, I, I immediately said to others in the room that I thought that the shooter had been to a shooting range or had had training in firearms. And that's based on what you just testified to? Yes. Okay. Um, particularly with the, the shot fired that killed Tate Muir, was there anything about that other than the stance? It was, it was the stance, the way he rolled his shoulders forward, um, and then the way as he walked up to take the second shot that he re-established a stable shooting platform to take the second shot. Okay. Um, thank you. The entire shooting lasted how long, if you know? Uh, it, it, the entire shooting, I, I don't recall the exact length of time, but it was, it was less than 10 minutes. Okay. Um, did you ever, did you, were you able to um, observe the, um, any loading of magazines in, in the SIG? And I, I should back up. What is the magazine? So a magazine is the part of the firearm that contains ammunition that's loaded in the magazine while the firearm. Um, and I'm sorry to keep doing this. But sure. Can you show the jury where a magazine, how you would load a magazine if you had one? Yes. So I think there is actually one in the SIG evidence box. Here. So this is a. Probably, could you stand up so yes. we can see? So this is a uh, SIG uh, Sauer pistol magazine. It's a 15 round magazine. This would be inserted into the magazine well when it's loaded with ammunition. You would then send the slide forward, chambering around, uh, and at that point the firearm's ready to be discharged. Okay. And you said 30, 32 rounds were, were fired? Yes, there were 32 uh, fired cartridge casings or shell casings that were recovered uh, from the school, yes. And there were how many in a magazine? Uh, this Sig Mag, the Sig Sauer magazine, uh, is a 15 round magazine. And you can also fit an additional round in the chamber for a total of 16 rounds. Okay. Did you ever observe on the video the shooter um, <coughs> reloading? Yes. Can you tell me about that? Yes. So I believe it was the first time the shooter reloaded. Uh, he, the, the magazine was empty, and he loaded a new magazine into the firearm. Uh, at another point, this was the, the second thing that I thought was notable in the surveillance video. He conducted what at ATF were trained as a tactical magazine exchange. I know other agencies call it a a combat reload, but basically he was not out of ammunition in the firearm yet, but he knew that, I can't assess better what he knew, but. Why are you trained to do a combat reload? To make sure that you always have more rounds in your magazine, so that you're, you're um, that you have sufficient ammunition. So if you have half of a magazine, you would eject it, not throw it on the ground, you would put it in your pocket in case you need it, and then you load a full magazine, so now you're back to full capacity. And what's, what? What were you trained would be the purpose for that? When would when would you have cause to do that? Uh, if you so for us, we're trained if we're involved in a shooting. If you if you do that, that way you're you have a fully loaded magazine in case you need to re-engage a threat. Um, obviously, the circumstances here were obviously different. Okay. Thank you. One moment. <clears throat> The, that was the first thing. What, there were two other things. So that was that was so. The first was his shooting stance. The second was the tactical mag magazine exchange. The third thing was after uh, the shooter exited uh, the bathroom where he uh, gave himself up. Eventually, um, he ejected the magazine out of the firearm and placed it on top of a trash receptacle, which I found odd at the time because if you were just doing a school shooting, it seemed odd to take the magazine and make a firearm safe. So he walked out of the bathroom, and, and the, the evidence showed that is where Justin Schilling was killed. He walked out of the bathroom, and you say he took the magazine out, and you're saying that is making the, the firearm safe? Yes, I don't, I don't believe he ejected around from the, the chamber. I don't recall right now. I don't believe he did. But um, yes, he separated the magazine from the firearm as, as if you were at a shooting range and taking the magazine out and setting it on like a, a your stationary shooting platform. Trash can. Yes. Okay. And what did he do after that? Um, at, at that point, he got on the ground and was shortly thereafter taken into custody by sheriff's deputies. Okay. And when he was on, he, was he standing? Was he laying down? Was he sitting? 
No, he, he got into the, basically the, he was, he was kneeling and then got into the prone position with his hands up. Okay. Um, were you able to um, determine whether or not um, he used anything to protect his ears? Uh, during the shooting? Yes. I, I, don't, I don't recall, no. Okay. Um, was... I just want to make sure we got all three things. Yep, that is all three. Okay. So after you determined that what you, you considered it proficiency or somewhat? Yes, there was some level of firearms training uh, exhibited in the surveillance video. Okay. And so what did you do next? So the, f the following day, um, after uh, knowing that ranges would be open in the morning, um, also additional information came in during the investigation that there was possibility that they had been, the family had been to a firearms range recently. I began uh, looking for um, evidence of James, Jennifer, or Ethan Crumley at shooting ranges uh, in the area. Okay, and is this part of a normal investigation you would do in a shooting? Yes. Okay, um, and so you started going to local shooting ranges? No, I, I began calling. Uh, the first one I called was the most popular range probably in this area. Um, and uh, upon calling, they confirmed that they did have information and asked that I come in and verify my identity. Okay, and how far away was that from the Crumley home? Uh, not too far. It was in Clarkston, Michigan, so a couple towns over. Okay. Um, did, you, did you go to the range? Yes. All right. And what did you... Um, what kind of information did, were you seeking? Uh, so the range provided multiple receipts from uh, showing that, that James and Ethan and Jennifer Crumley had been at the range in the past, as well as surveillance video documenting range visits on September 25th and on November 27th, uh, I believe that's three days prior to the shooting. Okay. Um, let's start with um, exhibits. 40 and 41, is that what you mean? These, well, I'm going to ask you there. Okay. Special Agent, what, what is um, on the screen? These are Facebook, Facebook messages between James and Jennifer Crumley. And how were these retrieved? Uh, through a search warrant uh, served on Facebook. Okay. Um, we all, you also, in the investigation, reviewed downloading from the actual phones, correct? Yes. All right. Were these messages um, still on Jennifer Crumby's phone? I know they were on James's phone. Uh, I'm, I don't recall if they were on Jennifer's phone. Okay. Can Your Honor, you, um, Your Honor, I'm sorry. I, I stipulated, but my copy does not have these stars on it, and they have eliminated some of the messages. I think, the, I think that's why the stars are there. Yeah. Right. Right, so yeah. I object we're happy because... to We're happy to provide all of the messages. We were just for, con, to be concise regarding um, these messages were, are, are offered to show Jennifer Crumley's knowledge that they were at the, the store and the range, but I was just trying to be concise. But we're, we're happy to give it all for to the, the jury. For the interest of completion, completion on this, Smith, I, I'll admit any portions of those that you, that you would like. Um, yeah, I, Your Honor, I would ask for the whole, I, they gave me the entire you have it all. exhibit. You have it all. Okay, I have it all, but what you're putting up here is not at all. We're, so We're happy to provide all of it. We're just going to talk about these two, and, and, and she can, and we'll provide every single thing possible to the jury. I'm just trying to not go through all of the messages that weren't pertinent to the shooting. We're just taking slivers out. This is the problem. This is the whole the whole exhibit. The, the whole exhibit's going to come in, but that's that's okay. the reason that the stars are there to show that it's that it's not a complete chain. Okay. There's something in the middle. But um, I will admit the entire um, text chain, and you are also happy to present to the jury the, the entire text chain. Okay. Thank you, Judge. Um, and, and Your Honor, there's no evidentiary requirement that we have to publish every text message in a 2,000-page um, string if we want to pull out. I, I'm there, not there, trying to there misrepresent. Isn't. There isn't. Okay. But I'm just saying that if Ms. Smith would like those in, I, I would be happy to admit them for the, the purposes of completion. We want it all in, so okay. we're happy. We'll stipulate to it. Um, okay. This was only taken out not to deceive as much as to try to make... Th these are the ones about the gun range. But there's a lot of content about things like you know, oh, purchases oh. and all sorts of stuff. Um, okay, so can you read those to the jury, Special Agent? 
Yes, so this is dated June 15th, 2021. Uh, so J.C. Crumbly is Jennifer Crumbly's Facebook account that's in blue, and it says talk at 12 o'clock question mark, and then uh, James Crumbly, who's in green, responds taking Ethan to store at 12. Jennifer responds, you get gun. So that the last one was 1134. That's minus, UTC minus four. Is that, is that, is that 1134 a.m.? This has I mean, been adjusted to Eastern Standard Time. So it's really 1134? Yes. Okay. Um, and there's time passes, and now we're at uh, 117. And what does uh, Jennifer reply? Jennifer asks, you get gun. Okay, and the next slide. Uh, James responds, yes, and it says mo, but I believe it's supposed to be no. Uh, Jennifer respond, questions that, says huh. And then James says, we paid for the gun and bought it, but can't pick it up till everything clears Washington, in parentheses, FBI. Could be today, tomorrow, or next day. They don't know. Jennifer responds, gotcha. Bring me those fruit punch things when you come to bring hay. Okay. And then that same, can you read the text, the text on the slide? Yes, so Jennifer sends a message that asks, how much is your gun? James replies, 300. Okay. I want to um, direct your attention to Exhibit 24 that's already been um, admitted. What, is, what are we looking at? This is a receipt from the uh, gun store in Oxford for the Derringer that we've been talking about. For so this is the Derringer? Correct. Okay. And how much was the price? Uh, total price was $180.15. Okay. And then the next, who who purchased the Derringer? Uh, James Crumbly. Okay. What, did, what is Exhibit 26? This is a, also a receipt from the gun store in Oxford for the kel P17 pistol. So it's this one? Yes. All right. And per, the same day? Uh, were these on the same day purchased? They were, they were purchased on different days. Okay. And how much was this? Uh, the gun itself was $299.95. Okay. Thank you. All right. Um, I want to draw your attention next to... Um, I'm sorry, Your Honor, there's just a lot of exhibits and I want to make sure we get it right. Okay. Um, uh, 27? No, we did that. I'm sorry. Um, Facebook messages between James and Jennifer on June 20th, the 20, um, 2021. Can you read those? That's exhibit 42. Yes, again, so Jennifer is in blue and says, can you guys answer your phone? And James responds, no, at gun range, loud. Okay. And then exhibit 27. Um, can you tell the jury uh, what these two um, videos are? Yes, so there's, uh, on, on James Crumbly's cell phone, there was a video on the 20th of June at 12.58 p.m. that shows uh, the shooter shooting the Caltech pistol. And then after that, a couple minutes later, there's a video of the defendant's son shooting the Derringer pistol. And these are the, it's the same day of the, the, the Facebook message before you just read? Yes. Okay. And this is Exhibit 43 and 44. So the first video, the shooters, can you, can you tell which firearm he's using? Yeah, so the first video, uh, the shooter's shooting the Caltech pistol. This right here. 
Yes. Okay. This was the one for $300? Yes. Okay. And then the second one was that, the Derringer? Yes, that's correct. Okay. All right, I want to draw your attention to what's been marked as People's 45. Can you tell the jury what this is? Yes, this is a Facebook message from James Crumley uh, to Jennifer Crumley sending the video of, uh, it appears to be uh, the second video of, of uh, the shooter shooting the Derringer. So the second clip, which was, which was uh, shorter, where the shooter's uh, shooting the Derringer was sent to Jennifer um, from James. Yes. Okay. And... Um, Is this a is this a Facebook post? No, this is uh, this is a Facebook message from James Crumley to Jennifer Crumley. Okay, that's the I already said that. That's the second clip, right? Yes. And then People's Forty Six. What are we watching, Special Agent? This is the video that James had sent to Jennifer via Facebook that she then posted, uh, I believe, as an Instagram story that said, Ethan and James Crumley both got handguns this week, testing them out at the range. Okay, Ethan and James both got handguns this week, testing them out at the range. Correct? Yes. Okay. That's People's 46, Your Honor. I don't believe there's an objection. Yeah, it's um, I'm going to direct your attention to um, the Exhibit 47, which was uh, June 26th of 2021. What is that, Special Agent? This is a receipt from the uh, firearms range in Clarkston uh, for range time and <coughs> uh, targets. Okay, and... Um, exhibit 48. This is a Facebook message of, uh, I believe, Ethan, sh or of, uh, the shooter shooting at the range in Clarkston, uh, sent from James Crumley to Jennifer Crumley via Facebook Messenger. Okay. And then 49. Was that the same video that was sent from James to Jennifer on June 26th? Yes. And what am I looking at right there? Uh, this is the shooter at the gun range in Clarkston uh, shooting the kel pistol with the Derringer visible on the shooting platform. Okay. And do you know um, what Jennifer did with that? What is, what is, where was that um, posted? Uh, it was posted to an Instagram story on June 26th. Whose Instagram story? Uh, Jennifer's Instagram story. And is this the actual Instagram story? Yes, it is. Okay, thank you. Directing your attention to July 24th of 2021. Your Honor, what number was that? Yeah. 75. 75. 75. I'm sorry, it's oh, July 25th. Okay. Um, can you wait, tell? Wait, I'm, Pam, I'm, I'm so it's, sorry. What number? It's um, exhibit number 75. It's July 25th, 2021. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I'm just, I was trying to ask him so that we can. So it's 75. What, what were we were just watching? This is uh, a video taken on James Crumbly's cell phone of Jennifer Crumbly shooting at the Clarkston Range. It 
the Keltec pistol. Okay. The same, this one? Yes. Okay. All right. Directing your attention to August 19th, 2021, Exhibit 50 and 51. Can you tell me what this is? Yes. This is a video sent by the shooter to another individual. All right. And this was already admitted. What are we watching? This is the shooter holding the Keltec pistol. This? Yes. Okay. And then he sends the slide forward. Uh, there's no magazine or chamber or no uh, round in the firearm. Okay. Was there um, any text messages about it or just the, the image? There were also texts. Okay. I'm sorry. That was 50 or 51. I. We're going so fast right now, I can't. I think it's 50. That was 51. It's right? 50. The text is 50. The text is 50, the video is 51. Okay, the text is 50 that has the video in it, and then the video is 51. Correct. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay, text is 50, video 51. And that's, and I'm sorry. The, I am so sorry. We're text, just going so fast. The text um, contains the video. And that's at the gun range, the shooter holding the Caltech, or shooting the Caltech. Is that correct? I, if, I, I'm happy to, to clear it up. Okay. Um, Special Agent, what in that image are you able to um, observe? Uh, it appears to be a couch. Oh, okay. Do you know what time that was sent? Uh, I don't recall the exact time. I'd have to look at the text message. I believe it was later in the evening. Okay, we'll just we'll go back to that. What time was it sent, Special Agent? I believe this is the next video. It was 9.31 p.m. Okay. Were you able to find another image that showed that the shooter had had access to the Caltech? Yes. Uh, so on that same date, he sent another video to the same friend at 12.30 a.m. Uh, with the Caltech. And this is 52 and 53. Okay. Thank you. All right, Special Agent, you said this was sent at what time? Uh, I believe it was 12.30 a.m. Um, and on that same day, which was August 19th. Yeah, I believe it would be now the 20th. Okay, I'm sorry, August, the 20th, yeah. because it was after 12. Um, and what do you see in the background um, that, can you tell the jury what you observed in the background of this photo? Yes, so. This video, I'm sorry. This, this video is taken on the dining room table in the Crumley residence. Um, familiar with, after being inside and also reviewing uh, photographs taken at the house during this investigation, that the wood grain matches on that table to the, ta the kitchen table in their dining room. Um, in the video, the shooter loads a loaded firearm magazine into the firearm and then chambers around into the firearm. So, is this a concern to you? Yes. Can you tell the jury why? Well, as that uh, ATF safety pamphlet states uh, the access to firearm by juveniles. Your Honor, I would object because access to firearms by juveniles may be against the ATF pamphlet, but there's no evidence that there's not an adult there or anything happening. Okay, yeah, well, he, well he's, not counting, he's not counting on that. You don't know if anybody else is present. No, Your Honor, I don't. And, and Your Honor, I, I understand, that's, but that's argument, and it can right. be, she can use um, mm -hmm. my data. Um, was there any message accompanying this video to his friend? Yes. What was the message? Uh, my dad left it out, so I thought, why not? LOL. And, and that is... Um, Your Honor, also, we've already had extensive arguments about... I am objecting to all hearsay texts between the shooter and his friend that my client and Mr. Crumley have never seen, and this is one of them. Your Honor, you've ruled on this several times, and... Um, I ruled on this one? No. These, well, these are the text messages between the shooter and the other individual. She's pre you, you previously ruled that it's a I ruled on, I don't recall this one specifically. 
consensus amongst the ones that were ruled that were ruled on. Okay, um, I, I'm happy to make it. A, I, I believe that you have, but if not, I am happy to um, make the argument. This is um, e even if you haven't ruled on it, it's a, it's under the exception of a present sense impression. He's picking up a firearm and in that moment, videoing himself holding it and then saying, "My dad left it out, so I thought, why not?" Well, it's. Um, in keeping with 80, uh, 803-1, uh, and um, yeah, it's, in, it's in, uh, consistent with 803-1, isn't it? Your Honor, I just want to reserve all prior objections that have already been in motions, and I can rely on that. Special Agent, this is People's Exhibit 54. Can you tell the jury what this is? This is the uh, Google location information for James Crumbly. And it's uh, dated August 19th, 929. It's around the time of the first video of the last two that we've seen. And it shows that he's at the Crumbly residence on East Street. Okay, and the, and the same, the time on that? Uh, it was 9.29 p.m. Okay, and that's the video of um, where the couch, the couch was in the background. Correct. Okay, and then the next exhibit. This is 55, what is this? This is the uh, Google location information for Jennifer. Uh, it also shows that the uh, at, that East Street address, the Crumley family residence. Okay, so in other words, both Jennifer and James were home during the photo with, with when he was holding the, the Caltech and there was a couch in the background? Yes. Okay. And then 56. This it, is August 20th. Um, so it's the 1232 where the video was taken and the text, my dad left it out? Yes. Okay, and, and this shows what? This shows that James Crumbly, uh, the Gmail account associated with James Crumbly was at the East Street uh, family residence, Crumbly family residence. Okay, at 1.30 in the morning. At 12.30 in the oh, morning. 12.30 yes. in the morning, sorry. All right, and the next slide, 57. Uh, this is the same thing. It's uh, Google location information for Jennifer's account, and it shows uh, that she was at the Crumley family residence at 12.21 a.m. that day as well, during the time, around the time of the video. Okay, thank you. All right, I want to draw your attention to Exhibit 58. September 1st, 2021, this is a message between who? This is a message between James Crumbly and Jennifer Crumbly on Facebook. Okay, and the time is 4.56 p.m.? Yes. And what does the message say? Ethan and I are headed to gun range. Okay. And what are the special agent? This is exhibits 59 and 60, but can you tell the jury what they are? Yes, so uh, these are receipts for that day uh, for James Crumbly. Uh, it's range time, uh, targets, as well as renting a uh, Ruger LCR 22 caliber revolver and uh, paying for 22 caliber ammunition. <clears throat> and this is a video, Exhibit 61, of that um, same day? Yes. Okay, and I want to, that's people's 61, and then I want to draw your attention to um, September 25th. Did either defendant go to a shooting, or did this defendant go to a shooting range in Clarkston? On September 25th, uh, 
I believe I don't I don't recall for sure. I believe it was just James and Ethan that went. So it wasn't it wasn't this defendant. No. Okay. Did, were you able to determine whether or not she was aware they were at the range? Yes. And how did you how do you know that? Uh, I believe it was the same thing through Facebook messages. Okay, and this is um, sixty two, and this is a um, receipt. What was the receipt for? Uh, this was uh, range fee, uh, ammunition for uh, nine millimeter, a rental of an of a nine millimeter pistol, as well as twenty two caliber ammunition and uh, targets. In all of the um, videos you were able to um, obtain and observe, is this the first uh, range video using a nine millimeter? This is the first that I that I could find. Yes. That that we that we know of. Yes. Okay. All right. And this is 63. What are we looking at, Special Agent? So that's uh, James <coughs> Crumbly in the white sweatshirt and gray uh, baseball hat. And then the shooter is behind him wearing uh, a light gray sweatshirt, dark pants, Nike shoes, and a black hat. Special Agent, we see two firearms there, correct? Correct. Okay, what, if you if you can tell what um, kind of handgun is yours. So I, I believe the handgun that the shooter is picking up now is the uh, Keltec. Uh, and then the other one was one that they appeared to rent or to, if they were looking to purchase a firearm, sometimes that the range will let you test it out before you, you purchase it. So the one to the right of the shooter, what is that, if you know? I can't say for certain. I, it, it, the footage is a little grainy. Okay. Can you tell the jury what he's doing right now, if you know? I, you know, I believe he's having trouble with uh, the firearm discharging. He appears to be having some type of malfunction that he's not able to clear on his own. draw your attention then to exhibit October 3rd of 2021, exhibit 64. What is this? This is a Facebook message from James Crumbly to Jennifer Crumbly uh, at 12.01 p.m. that says, cool, just got, just got cleaning our guns, leaving for range in a few. Okay, that's 64, and then... Wait, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Your Honor, can we just slow down for one second? Because the exhibits I was given have more content. I just need to 
We separated them to make it easier to read one message at a time. I understand, but this is different than what you provided me, and I just need to make sure I'm keeping up. So thank you. I'm happy to go as, at any pace you'd like. Thank you. Josh. Okay, so this is Exhibit 64. Thank you, and I'm caught up. Okay. Okay, sorry. No, it's okay. It's all right. It's, all right. All right. it's, a, it's a lot of information. Um, it's a lot of information. Mm -hmm. 65. What is that, Special Agent? That's a receipt for the uh, gun range in Clarkston, dated uh, October 3rd, 2021, for range time, targets, and 22 caliber ammunition. Okay. All right. Was this the last um, documented visit before November 26th that we have? Yes. Okay. Let's go to November 26th. What, what, what day was November 26th? What's significant about that day? Uh, that was the date that James Crumbly uh, purchased the uh, six-hour SP-2022 pistol for uh, the shooter. Okay, and that was the day after Thanksgiving? Yes. Okay. Um, this has been previously submitted, I mean, I'm sorry, admitted this is the receipt for the SIG, correct? Yes. People's 28, um, and that was... Paid in cash and the amount is 519.35. I don't mean to lead, I'm just trying to do this to make it easier to understand. Yeah, I, have, a, I have no objection to that. Okay. Yeah, that's already in. Okay. Um, and um, on the 26th, when this occurred, um, if you want to go to the next season, this has also been previously um, admitted. This is the um, Purchaser's information, we've already talked about that. This was, I'm not sure if it was admitted, but it was shown in the opening. I believe there's no objection to it. Yeah, what it's admitted. Okay. 66. Um, again, for the jury, this is, this is, this is the SIG, correct? Yes, what's depicted in that picture is this, the SIG Sour Pistol, yes. Okay. Um, and when did Jennifer post about, I'm sorry. I'm yeah, sorry, excuse me. This is not Jennifer's post. This is the shooter's post. Um, that's the, this is a different post. This wasn't the one at the opening. Uh, I apologize if I'm confusing anybody. It's just a lot. Um, and what does this say? Uh, so this is an, an Instagram post by the shooter that says, uh, just got my new beauty today, six hour, nine millimeter. Ask any questions, I will answer. Uh, Special Agent, were you, ever to be able, were you able to determine, based on the forensic evidence um, of the phones, um, whether or not Jennifer Crumley uh, followed the shooter's Instagram account? Yes, she did. Okay. So this account where he posted, she followed it. We can't say she saw it, but we know she followed it. Correct, yes. Okay. Um, and that is a picture of the SIG? Yeah, so the first picture was the uh, six hour in the pistol box. Um, there, and then the second picture is the shooter holding the firearm. Uh, it appears to be inside the Crumley family residence, based on the floor. Um, and then there's the shooter again holding the firearm with the uh, sights aimed in. As you can see, that the three dots are aligned. I'm okay. so sorry. What number is that? It's all part of 66. 66. This is um, uh, uh, Instagram post from November 26, 2021. Okay, thank you. So 66, 66 then has multiple pictures. Three yeah, it's, okay, it's the, thank you. It's the one Instagram account that we, that we know is in common. Okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah. I just want to make sure. But it, when it's in piecemeal, I can't tell what's, okay. I, the number is not on the screen, so. Right. Right. I was wondering. That's why I'm having a hard time, so sorry. Yes. Are you able to take a break, Your Honor? Never. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I was looking for the natural break, okay. so. Uh, this, uh, yeah, this I don't think this is the fine time. There's about probably 30 minutes left of this. Oh, okay. So, yeah, I'm always. So I, 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 well, I'm sorry about that. No. I, 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 was, I was waiting until uh, cross examination. I'm so sorry. No, no I'm, I'm with you. Yeah. All right. So, uh, a few things. Um, you can't discuss your testimony um, with anyone right now because you're, you're still 
understand. Understood, Your Honor. Uh, um, that we can step out and um, we will come back at 3.15. How's that? All right. All rise for the jury.
Nine zero FH. Okay, so um, I got a note that I shared with both attorneys um, for, uh, from Juror 374. He's our parole agent, right? And uh, he said, I may know ATF Mike Malone and I've worked with him from 2005 to 2006. I've not talked to him since that time. I do not recall him being on the witness list, but he was mentioned in ATF Brandon testimony. I shared the Vote for both sides. I don't know. Does anybody care? Your Honor, um, we've had an opportunity to review the note, and we have no objection and don't believe. If the court could just inquire the juror if this would influence his testimony in any way, I cannot imagine it would, but I think it's important for the court just to inquire to that. Okay, do you want me to bring him in by himself? It's court's discretion on that, Judge, but we agree. We don't, we don't think it's an issue, but the record just should be made. Well, you know, I guess I'm happy that he's following the instructions that he's letting me know, yeah. right? That's why we have alternate. So, um, jurors can be brought in by themselves and did something wrong. I think they did something wrong, but hopefully they'll understand why. Could, could you bring in uh, 374 mm -hmm. and see? Thank you. Yeah, you're good now. Okay, so that's a half note, so it's going to be longer than half Yes. That's, that's all yeah. I'm guessing. Yeah, that's, that's right. Thank you. Thank you. We think we're going to finish here today, I hope. I don't, I don't think so, Your Honor, because one of the exhibits that still has to be played is a half an hour long. Oh, really? Okay. There's a video. It's, a, it's okay. Yeah. I want to tell you um, that we really appreciate your note. Um, okay. That's exactly what you're supposed to do. All right, that's what. Uh, that's why we have alternates in case something comes up. Right. So really, my only question for you is whether or not the fact that you might have met uh, this person, this ATF agent, um, mentioned by Brett Brandon, you knew him in 2005 or 2006, yeah, but Detroit, actually, what, what I know, if it's the same individual, he was working with Detroit, Detroit uh, Police Department okay. at the Internet 6th or 8th Precinct. Okay. So did you ever have a beer together? No. Okay. And uh, is there anything about the fact that his name was mentioned that would make you have difficulty being fair and impartial in this case? No. Okay. We, we, appreciate, we appreciate your note. I know that this is, yeah. So... I, I want to make sure. Okay, I appreciate that. Do you have any questions for him? No, I don't, and we have okay. no objection to him okay. remaining. Okay. No questions, thank you. Okay, thank, I appreciate your note. You, you can be seated if you want. We're going to bring your friends in. So. <laughs> <laughs>
seated. Yes, Your Thank you. All right. We have an opportunity, my co counsel and I, to reorganize so that we can do this as efficiently as possible. Um, Special Agent, I'd like to direct your attention to um, Exhibit uh, 66. I'm sorry. Um, this is the Instagram post um, of, of the shooter, and you already testified earlier that Instagram account was followed by Jennifer Crumbly. Um, is there anything about this image that you um, want to remark on in terms of what you see and what you don't see? Yeah, so in the image is the, the six-hour 9mm pistol. There's one magazine inserted into the uh, firearm. There's also an empty magazine next to the firearm on the right-hand side. Uh, in the image, there is not a uh, the ATF pamphlet or the cable lock uh, that was uh, sold with the firearm. And then a direct, and I believe 66 is already admitted, and 67? What is this, Special Agent? This is a uh, picture from Jennifer Crumbly's cell phone uh, taken, uh, I believe, 30 to 40 minutes after, uh, 30, I was in around 6.38, 6.40 p.m. on the 26th. Of the day the, the gun was purchased? Correct. Um, and this is a picture of the Sig Sauer is the bottom pistol with a magazine inserted. The top pistol is the kel uh 22 caliber pistol, and then there are the two Sig Sour magazines, the ATF pamphlet, and a cable lock with uh, a key inserted and a second key attached. And this was previously admitted, this cable lock, um, it's, it's People's 39. Um, can you testify about whether or not this is similar or the same? Can, can you tell that? I would say that it is similar. The, the exact same words and instructions are on the pamphlet and on the I'll call that a, a, I don't know if it's a sticker that's attached to the bottom by the, the lock there. This um, right here? Correct, but I've had an opportunity to review the words on both, and, and they do match up. Okay. Um, and you see the pamphlet um, in that picture? Yes. And Jennifer Crumbly took that photo the day the gun was purchased. Um, and you said around 6.30? It was between 6.30 and 6.40 p.m., I believe. Okay, thank you. Um, I want to go to now uh, the next day. That would be the Saturday. The 26th was Friday after Thanksgiving. The 27th was Saturday. Um, did you have the opportunity to review surveillance uh, video from a gun range in Clarkston? Yes. And do you know about what time uh, that, that surveillance began? In other words... Who's the surveillance of? Uh, it shows uh, Jennifer Crumley and the shooter entering the gun range, uh, paying for uh, range time, uh, targets, and 9 millimeter ammunition, 100 rounds of it, and then they proceed to uh, take turns firing the Sig Sauer pistol. Okay. So um, do, you re do you recall about the time they arrived there? Uh, it, was, it was approximately 1 o'clock p.m. Okay. Um, so the receipt is for, you said, 100 rounds? Yes, they bought two 50-round uh, boxes of Patriot Defense 9mm ammunition. Okay, and so the only um, firearm that ammunition is for is, is the, the shooter's Christmas gift, the SIG. Yes, out of the firearms in their home, it would only uh, be utilized in that one specific firearm, yes. Okay, and the previous... Receipts that we've admitted into evidence that you um, obtained. Is there any record of any purchase of a nine millimeter ammunition before this day? Not that I found. No. Okay. So, in terms of the evidence you obtained, this is the only, this is the first time and only time you saw a purchase of nine millimeter ammunition. Correct. Okay. Um, and and who was at the the range with the shooter? Uh, Jennifer Crumbly. Were you? Looking at the phone evidence and the forensic evidence from the phones, able to determine where James Crumbly was that day? Yes. Uh, I believe he was uh, door dashing uh, f during the during the daytime hours that day. He, he's, he was a door, dra door dash driver, correct? Yes. Okay. Um, and I want to um, draw your attention to the actual surveillance 
um, <clears throat> video, which is Exhibit 71. We are not going to play the entire video, Your Honor, although the entire video will be admitted into evidence and the jury can view it. Um, so uh, we're going to try to focus on the most relevant parts um, and then the entire video is in evidence. And you can play the video yep, if you want. Got it. Thank you. Okay. All right. Okay. Um, what are we looking at, Special Agent? Uh, so that's Jennifer Crumbly had just arrived and placed the six hour pistol box uh, on the uh, display case there, uh, and the shooter is standing over her shoulder. Special agent, we're going to fast forward. That you've already identified that gun case is the 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 SIG case and and not this cal. No, that, that it's this one, correct? Correct. Okay. So at this point, if you know, where is the, the gun? So the, the, the uh, handgun is in the six-hour pistol case with the two boxes of ammunition sitting on top. Okay. And Jennifer Crumbly is handling those? Yes. Okay. And what, is, what are they doing now? Uh, they're, they're putting on ear protection uh, before entering the range. The previous... Uh, footage shown of Jennifer Crumbly at the shooting range. Do you remember, did she have ear protection on? Yes. Can you explain to the jury what's happening right now, if you know? Yeah, right now, uh, the shooter is loading ammunition into the uh, magazines. Now, at this point, he, he had the gun for one day? 
Yes, approximately twenty, like around exactly twenty-four hours. Okay. And do you see a a, a lock anywhere in that case, or next to the gun, or the case? No. Special Agent, I, I do have a question while we're um, viewing this. Um, are all of the visits and purchases um, stored on surveillance and ranges mm -hmm. and um, licensed firearm dealers? So in this particular <clears throat> gun range, there is surveillance camera equipment. Uh, I don't believe it went back past September 25th, which is why there wasn't surveillance video for the previous visits. Okay. So what's happening right now? Uh, so that is the uh, six-hour pistol. I'm going to call that the, the stand, uh, as well as a loaded magazine. And now the shooter is placing a target uh, on the cardboard before sending it back down range.
So just for the record, the, the shooters already, were you able to tell how many rounds he shot? Uh, it, it depends on how full the magazine was, but if he had a full uh, magazine, it would have been 15 rounds uh, when, once he loaded in the firearm that he uh, discharged. Okay. And can you tell the jury what's happening now? Yeah, so now uh, he brings a new target over uh, for Jennifer Crumbly, um, and then he affixes it to the cardboard and then sends it downrange. It seems both of them were struggling at this point, as he did before. What are, what are they trying to do? He, he had the same trouble. So initially he had trouble inserting the magazine. This is different. He's trying to explain to her how to send the slide forward uh, by pressing the, the sending, by sending the slide release and sending it forward the chamber around from the magazine. And that's that action right there. So Jennifer Crumbly uh, took her turn at firing the the, um, the SIG. Were you able to tell whether it was just, it seemed like just a few rounds? Yeah, it was just a few rounds. It was a partially loaded magazine that was inserted into the firearm. Okay. And then, I know you have viewed this several times. At this point, the shooter does um, shoots, um, does another, um, I don't know how many rounds. Could the witness answer the questions and just be asked? I, I'm just really just trying to make things easy and more understandable. Um, and I, I, I was, we were going to fast well, forward. Okay. okay, so you're going to fast forward. What happens next? What happens next? So they, I believe, I think they exchanged turns one more time, shooting at the target, and then uh, I believe it's only one more time each, and then they, they depart from the range. Okay. All right, you're fast forwarding. To one, they're they're both completed. They, you think they, what did they both um, um, shoot more rounds or just the shooter? If you know, I'm not certain if, if Jennifer shot more rounds or not. I know uh, the shooter takes another turn this time around. Um, I don't I don't know exactly how many more times uh, Jennifer shoots. Do you know um, how many rounds total uh, were left? when they were finished shooting? So they discard an empty box of 50 uh, rounds of the 9mm ammunition into the trash can and then exit with only one box of 50 rounds. So when they departed, they only had the 50 round full box of Patriot Defense 9mm ammunition. Okay. And we can fast forward to that part. We're, we're going to try. <coughs>
special agent, is that where she just, the, <coughs> the ammunition is discarded? Yes, that's correct. Okay. And this is the um, picture of the target that was posted. Do you know, did you ever, did, was that ever recovered? Yes, there was targets in, <clears throat> in the shooter's bedroom. Uh, I don't recall exactly if it was Miss, Mrs. Crumbly's uh, target or not. I know Ethan, or the shooter's target was one of them, I believe. And can you tell the jury what he's doing now? Right now he's trying to put the uh, six hour pistol and three pistol magazines into the case and close it. Are the magazines full or empty or can you tell? They're empty. So the shooter's just trying to rearrange the pistol box so that it, it closes properly and can fully uh, clamp with those uh, that we demonstrated earlier, the opening of the clamps. The latch? The latches, yes. So Jennifer Crumbly's carrying the case with the SIG inside of it? Yes. And do you see if, it, is the shooter carrying anything? Yes, he has uh, the targets as well as the uh, box of 9mm pistol ammunition. Okay. And, and based on your investigation and all the, the physical evidence and digital evidence, um, was this the last known image of this weapon before it was used to kill? the students in Oxford High School? Yes. Okay. Okay, I'd like to draw your attention to Exhibit 72. Can you tell the jury what this is? This is an Instagram post by uh, Jennifer Crumbly on the date that they went to the range uh, later that evening. It says, took my new SIG out to the range today. I just wanna stop you, this is actually- is, I'm is, sorry. Okay. Whose, whose Instagram post is this? I'm sorry, this is uh, the shooter's Instagram. Okay. Uh, it was posted later that evening, said, took my new SIG out to the range today. Definitely need to get used to the new sites, LOL. And could you tell when that was posted? Yes, 1902 on uh, the date they went to the range, being the 27th, the day after Thanksgiving. Okay, and what time is that for? 7.02 p.m. Okay. Um, it's UTC oh. minus five, so is it seven or is it? I'm sorry, that is in UTC. Um, so at the time of this, <clears throat> it would be around two o'clock, 2.02 2 p.m. Can, can you tell the jury what UTC minus, yeah, so the, what, what, am, what am I talking about when I say that? It, it's just the universal time, so that, that is like the, uh, the time the Eastern time zone is either minus four or minus five, depending on the time of year, daylight savings time. So um, that is 72, and then I'm gonna, do you know, by the way, where um, Jennifer Crumbly was when this was posted, if you know? Uh, I believe she was still home at this point. Um, and I wanna draw your attention to 73. What is this? This is, this is the uh, Instagram post by Jennifer Crumbly of the Target uh, with mom and Sunday testing out his new Christmas present, my first time shooting a nine millimeter, 
I hit the bullseye. Uh, and this was posted about a minute later than uh, the shooter's Instagram post. So his post was 202 and hers was 203? Yes. Okay, and there's, there's more than just this post, correct? Oh, there's three images within the one post, yes. Okay. There's so it's the same uh, text, but three different images? Yes. Okay. And this, what is this picture of? So this is the third image. The first was the, the, the main target, then there was a zoom in of the bullseye, and then there was uh, this image, which was uh, of the firearm in the case with two pistol magazines and the ATF uh, Youth Handgun Safety Act notice beneath it. Do you know um, where James Crumbly was during this time? Was he still at, um, doing DoorDash deliveries? Yes. Okay. Um, do you know um, at some point whether or not uh, Jennifer Crumbly left the house that day when they returned from the range? Yes, she did. Okay. Do, do you know about what time? Uh, it was around, I believe it was around 2.30. Or it could have, uh, I know there was a Facebook message around 2.30 cent that she was shopping, so I don't know exactly what time she left, but I know she left uh, after that image was, after that Instagram post. Okay, and do you know when she returned? Uh, it was around 5.30 p.m. Okay. You know, I might be confusing Jennifer and James on that timing that Jennifer returned home uh, Okay, for that. Uh, it's okay. Um, yeah. I, we have another witness that will we'll, we'll testify about it. Um, just one moment, Your Honor. All right. I want to draw your attention to a previously, I believe it's previously admitted, 74, Exhibit 74. All right. And if we could zoom in on the drawing of the firearm in that diagram. We've already, um, well, tell the jury where, when you first saw this worksheet. I first saw this worksheet when I was at uh, Oxford High School on November 30th, uh, 2021, responding to the shooting. Okay, and what, what's your understanding about who drew those things and when? Uh, it was my understanding that uh, the shooter drew them earlier in the day um, and I have to say that I saw an image of, of this worksheet, uh, which is probably the same image. Um, and it was, uh, like I said, during my time responding to the school. Okay. Special Agent, what, if anything, caught your attention about this drawing? Uh, there were uh, several things, specifically with the firearm, um, after recovering it and looking at it, inspecting it. Uh, it appeared to be the same firearm recovered from uh, that, that the shooter used to commit the shooting, the Sig Sauer 9mm pistol. Okay, can you um, explain to the jury why you believe that? Yes, so when you look at the, uh, the image, the back of the, do you mind if I pick up the actual weapon? Go ahead. Okay. All right. But you're going to have to stand so the yep. jury can see it. So when you look at the back of the slide, there are serrations at the back of the slide here. Actually, I'll turn it this way. So there's serrations at the back of the slide in the same location that they are in the, pic the picture. The shape of the trigger guard of the picture appeared to be the same shape, as well as uh, the <coughs> magazine. The SIG magazine is unique in that it has this lip at the front. And when inserted in the firearm, it creates this secondary kind of, uh, it's not flush with the firearm, right? There's yeah, this lip. Can oh, just, yep, can you turn to so Move my chair back. Yep, there we go. Sorry, I just, I can't see what you're... Yep, no problem. So, there's a lip in the front of the firearm here when the magazine's inserted. And when I looked at the picture, it appeared to be that that was what was drawn at the bottom, where you see that lip. Did you see anything else about the drawing that was notable? Yes, the uh, ammunition appeared to be, um, after working this case and reviewing the image, um, and knowing the, the caliber of firearms in the Crumley home, it, it appeared that that uh, ammunition was not 22 ammunition um, for the simple fact that uh, the, the cylinder at the bottom on a 22 long rifle uh, uh, round of ammunition is not flush. It, it creates almost like a cylinder at the bottom, if you could picture it, uh, and it wouldn't be flush with the, with the, um, 
with the round. So instead of it just being a circle like this, where you have a circle like that, it would be that there are parts of edge sticking out around it, so to speak. There would be an edge drawn further around the bottom of that round of ammunition, and it's much thinner. Okay, and I'm going to approach and show you the previously admitted picture of the other uh, firearm um, that the Crumbleys owned um, that's most similar to... Is, what's, the, what's not here um, that's, that's on the SIG that makes you think that the drawing was of the SIG? How are these two different? So additionally, on the SIG... And tell me how I should hold this so it doesn't look like I'm pointing at you. take that from you. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So when you look at this, at this SIG here, there's an ejection port on this side, on the right side of the firearm, similar to the one drawn in the picture. The only other uh, uh, magazine-fed pistol in their residence at the time did not have an ejection port on either side of the firearm because it's concealed by the slide. Shannon, I represent Ms. Crumbly. If I ask you any questions confusing, please let me know, please. Understood. Thank you. Um, Special Agent Brandon, would that be the correct way? Yes. Okay, to address you. Thank you. Um, you were testifying that you are familiar with the state and federal laws regarding guns, correct? No, that's not correct. I had stated that I was familiar with the federal laws to purchase a firearm. And in some of those investigations and purchasing firearms, some of the state laws come into play. Okay. In terms of, and if you don't know the answer, please let me know. If you do know the answer, let us know. Um, and please answer the question. Um, back on November 30th of 2021, it, is not, it was not illegal, and it, it still is not illegal, for a minor to touch a gun, correct? It is not against federal law for a minor to touch a firearm in certain instances, uh, no. Okay. It is not against the law for a minor to shoot a gun at a gun range. It wasn't then, and it's not illegal now, correct? It is not against federal law for a minor to go to a gun range uh, to shoot a firearm, no. Okay. And as far as you know, it's not against state law either, correct? Uh, yeah, as far as I know, especially from this investigation, I know that it's not against state law, yes. Okay. On November 30th of 2021, there also is no law, federal law, that requires certain storage requirements for guns, correct? Inside, inside of your residence? Uh, yes. There is not a federal law that, that forces anyone to store their firearms in a certain way, no. And as far as you know, on November 30th of 2021, there also is not a state law that states how a, how a firearm must be stored, correct? It's my understanding based on this investigation that at the time there was not a law governing how to store a firearm uh, in a home, no. Okay. Now, you testified and talked to this jury about how there are various ways guns can be stored safely, correct? Yes. And one of the possible ways is in a gun safe, correct? Yes. And the Caltech and Derringer gun they were in a gun safe in the Crumbly home. That's correct. Another way that a gun can, is another way of making a gun safe is with a cable lock, correct? Yes. And a cable lock is a physical, it almost looks like a bike lock that loops through the gun to make it impossible to shoot when it's locked, correct? Yes. And in order to disable or take the cable lock off, you have to have a key, correct? 
I would say that's one of the ways to take it off, yes. Okay, so one of, that would be the way that most people would take it off is by using a key that works with that lock, correct? Yes. Okay. And I want to go to exhibit... Um, Thirty-eight, which I'm going to put up on my screen, but I need to switch it over. And I apologize. Mr. Gablin, can you help me, please? Oh, yes. I just am not sure I've shifted over. Okay, so I'm going to exhibit 38. It's, it's this thing. Okay, I've got it plugged in. Ooh, it did better than I thought it would. Okay, so this is Exhibit 38. This has been admitted. This was admitted through the people when you testified before. This is the trigger lock statement. You recall testifying about this, correct? Yes. And when a sale of a gun is made, this form is filled out and given to the person who, er, filled out by the person buying the gun, correct? Correct. And it's, it's signed, in this form specifically, it's signed by James Crumbly and Cammie Back, Cammie Back being the person who sold the gun, correct? Yes. And this form is to help ensure that there is safety, safety in this process of guns being sold, correct? I'm not sure what the congressional intent is on this, and that, that's not something I can testify about. Okay, thank you. You would agree with me that the sale must include a trigger lock or a gun case or a storage container that can be secure, correct? No, it says a trigger lock or other device design, which in this instance would be the cable lock or a gun case or storage container. Okay, so I'm sorry. So it could be a trigger lock, it could be a cable lock, it could be a gun case, it could be a storage container. There's options. Yes. And when you testified about the three guns that we've seen in this courtroom, you testified about the Derringer, the Caltech, and the Sig Sauer, correct? Yes. And we were you were testifying that the caliber on those guns that the Sig Sauer has the biggest caliber, correct? Yes, it's a larger caliber. Out of the three of those? Yes. Okay. And by nature, with those three guns in mind, that means the Sig Sauer can do more damage than the other two guns, the kel or the Derringer, correct? I believe what I said is that it just makes a bigger hole, but yes, what you're saying is, yeah, that it would cause more damage, yes. Okay. And a 9 millimeter is not the... This is going to sound like a terrible question, but it's not the largest millimeter you could You There are guns that are bigger and stronger, correct? Yes. What other guns could create even more damage or even more, even larger holes? I mean, there's a lot of calibers that are larger than a 9. I don't know that I, you want me to list them all right now, but there are more calibers that do cause more damage that do fire a bigger round than a 9 millimeter. A three fifty seven? Yes. A forty five? Yes. A a fifty? Fifty caliber? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Approximately how many other kinds of would you guess? How many other I'm not I'm not gonna guess. I mean there's there's a lot of calibers uh, of firearm. Um, there are several that are larger caliber than a nine millimeter. Uh, when you there's say not many that are larger than a nine than a nine as a as a as a semi automatic handgun. There's a few. I would say not a ton. Okay, so a nine millimeter is not the most destructive gun you can buy, but it's it's a gun that a person can buy. A nine millimeter is a gun a person can buy. Yes. Okay. You testified about I'm going to go to Exhibit 37. You testified about...
about this ATF pamphlet, Youth Handgun Safety Act notice, correct? Yes. You would agree with me that everyone knows guns are dangerous, correct? I would hope so, yes. It does not take getting a pamphlet to know that a gun is a weapon. That's common knowledge, correct? Yes. Whether that pamphlet is in the box, on the counter, on the floor, in the car, it's common knowledge that a gun is a serious, dangerous weapon, correct? Yes, but that's not the purpose of this pamphlet. Well, the purpose of this pamphlet is to make sure youth handguns, youths with handguns, is especially dangerous, correct? Yes. And that also is fairly common sense, correct? I don't know how to answer that question, uh, being that it's like the number one cause of death for children, that firearms are the number one cause of death for kids. So I don't know how to answer that question. Well, my point is, we know guns are dangerous. We know they're dangerous when youths handle guns. It doesn't change whether it's a youth or an adult, correct? I don't, I think if they, if they wanted to have a pamphlet that said the Person Safety Act notice, they would have. It says youth for a reason. I think that there's a special category for that. But any person would know that a youth handling a gun, it would be dangerous. I would hope so. Okay. We saw a lot of exhibits showing that there were trips to the gun range, and we can agree that there is no doubt James Crumbly and Ethan Crumbly like guns or are interested in guns, correct? It appears so from the evidence, yes. There, you showed this jury evidence of them purchasing, of James Crumbly purchasing the three weapons, correct? Yes. You showed this, we've shown this jury um, text messages between Mr. Crumbly and Mrs. Crumbly showing that they're going to, I'm sorry, excuse me, that Mr. Crumbly and Ethan Crumbly, <coughs> the shooter, are going to gun ranges, correct? I'm sorry, could you repeat the, I got a little distracted. I am so sorry. That's okay. God, I think I'm like in a choke. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm so sorry. That's fine. Um, you want a cop drop? I, <clears throat> I need like just something. I feel like I just had a bug fly in my throat. <laughs> I haven't seen any bugs in here. You want a cop drop? Yeah, can I have one? <clears throat> Thanks. <coughs> sorry, excuse me. I'm so sorry. Okay, we can agree. James Crumbly and his and his son are interested in guns. Yes. We can agree they would go to the gun range. They would go shooting together. Yes. Okay. You have some evidence of some various trips they took to the gun range, um, but it's possible there's many, many more trips that Mr. Crumbly and his son took to the gun range, correct? That's possible, yes. What you're testifying to this jury is not limited to the only experiences we can say the shooter has ever had at a gun range. That's fair, yes. Okay. And there is one occasion back in the summer of 2021 when Jennifer Crumbly is with her husband and son at the gun range, and we see her shooting in the video, correct? Yes. And aside from that, the only other time we see Jennifer Crumbly at the gun range is on the day after the Sig Sauer was purchased when she's with this half an hour long video we watched with the shooter, correct? Yes. And as we watched that video, on that occasion, we can agree James Crumbly is not there with them, correct? Yes. And when Jennifer Crumbly walks in, she's carrying the case that has the gun in it, Correct? Yes. She goes up to the counter, purchases ammunition, and she carries it over to the area where they shoot. Is that fair to say? Yes, she purchased the ammunition. I'm not clear on who picked out how much ammunition. There was a time that Ethan or that the shooter um, made a two with his finger, and I can't be certain if he was talking about the ammunition boxes or the targets. 
Okay. So they um, so they they end up in the area where they're where you shoot, and it appears to me, although I've never been to a range, you put the gun in the spot where the person stands to actually shoot it, correct? Yes. And then it appears to me, but please tell me if I'm wrong, that you load the magazines with the ammunition on the counter behind um, where when the gun is sitting away from you, correct? Yes, that's generally been my experience at private ranges, yes. And in these videos that we saw, it's apparent that the shooter has knowledge of how to load those magazines with the ammunition, correct? Uh, yes. He, he is the one loading those magazines with the ammunition, not Mrs. Crumbly. No, there was a point at one time when, when uh, Mrs. Crumbly was putting rounds and her arm was moving. Obviously, the angle's sideways, so you can't see, but there was a time when she was loading. I don't think she loaded all the magazines, but I think she did load a few rounds. Okay. And when we see the video of um, the shooter shooting the weapon, he obviously knows how to shoot the weapon and is shooting the weapon at the target, correct? Yes. And when Mrs. Crumbly comes up and takes her turn, mom's having her turn with the weapon, there's some very obvious conversation going on between herself and the shooter back and forth between the two of them, correct? Yes. And it appears from the video, I believe that you said the shooter is explaining something to her. Yes, I think he was explaining how to send the slide forward to chamber around. She was having trouble. Uh, she got the magazine in, but then couldn't get the slide to go forward. Okay, and that was in the first... She took two turns, essentially, at the range, correct? Uh, yes. And in the first turn she took, that's when she's having trouble with the slide? Yes. That, okay. And when we see Mrs. Crumbly take her second turn... Um, we see her turn back and have to call the shooter over to explain something else to her in trying to figure out how to hold the gun, correct? Yeah, it seemed like he was trying to explain how to properly grip the firearm, yes. Okay. And we can agree that in the videos from this shooting range um, with, at Accurate with Mrs. Crumbly, and other ranges, it's clear the shooter has been given experience shooting at ranges and knows how to operate these weapons, correct? Yes. You also showed this jury evidence that on one other occasion, Mr. Crumbly and the shooter rented a 9mm gun. Yes. And on that day, obviously, the shooter shot the 9mm gun, correct? I don't recall from the video that we have of that, that if, if he shot it or not. Uh, I believe, I, I would assume he did, but I'm not, I can't say for certain. It would be weird if you rented a gun and didn't shoot it. I agree. Okay. And you don't know if there's other trips that Mr. Crumbly took with the shooter where they may have rented 9mm guns on other occasions, correct? Uh, if it was to this specific range, I would know about it based on the receipts, but if not, then no. If it was a different range, then, then it's possible, yes. The range that you checked with was the one in Clarkston, correct? Yes. There, there are a number of gun ranges, though, in the area, and it's fair to say you did not check with all of those ranges. Uh, not, not all of them. The ones in close proximity uh, to the house, yes. But at the time, it was winter, so a lot of the outdoor ranges, it had snowed the weekend before. A lot of the outdoor ranges either were snowed, there was too much snow, but yes, for the, as far as the indoor ranges in the area, that's, that's the closest. Okay. In addition to these guns and going to this indoor range, you were at the Crumbly home during the time the search warrant was executed, correct? Yes. Yeah. And during, and if you do not know the answer to this, you can let us know. Um, during the search warrant that was executed, um, you observed that the shooter had a number of BB guns, correct? Yes. Yeah. And BB guns are not on the same level of danger as these three weapons, these three guns you've testified about, correct? I mean, they, they can be dangerous, but are they a firearm? No. Okay. So, and you also, I'm sure, observed that in the backyard at the Crumbly's home, they had targets set up where BB guns could be shot in the backyard, correct? Yes. So, it's a very fair assumption to say that the shooter 
was interested in BB guns, target practice, these guns going to the shooting range. Yes. The, when you testified, you testified that the Celtic, Celtic was in a gun safe at the time law enforcement um, did the search warrant, correct? Yes. And the Derringer. Yes. And there was a cable lock that was not on the Caltech gun, correct? There was a cable lock in a uh, in the Caltech gun box in the kitchen that was not, yes, not on the Caltech gun. There were no gun uh, cable locks on either the Derringer or the uh, Caltech inside the safe. And we talked about the different options of ways to keep a gun safe. And while the, the cable lock was not on the Caltech or, or the Derringer, there wasn't a cable lock on that one, those two were secured in a gun safe. Yes, with the combination of zero, 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 but yes. Okay, and when you testified about the combination being zero, 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 that was the combination that that you you said the manufacturer that would be the default. Yes. And that combination can be changed by people when they get the gun, correct? When they get the safe, yes, they can change the combination. And you have no knowledge of what the combination was at the time that James and Jennifer Crumbly had that safe in the home. All you know is the time you saw the safe, the combination was zero, 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 correct? I know that the safe was unlocked at the house by law enforcement using the code 000. Did you unlock the safe at the house, or is that... You were not the person that unlocked that safe, though, correct? No. You asked me the question. I, I said I, I know it was unlocked with that, but I, I don't. I was not present when it was unlocked, but I know that that's the combination to the safe, and it has not been changed since. Okay. You did not watch law enforcement open the safe. No. You did not watch law enforcement um, turn the numbers on the safe? No. You believe that the numbers law enforcement used were 000, but you do not have personal knowledge that 000 opened that safe, correct? I did not physically observe it, no. And it's fair to say that those guns, that Caltech and that Derringer, were purchased in June of 2021, correct? Yes. And there is no claim in this case that the shooter ever took those two guns or took them out of the house or took those to school, anything along those lines, correct? Not out of the house, no. In terms of, Your Honor, are we going to go till five or what are, what's the well, um, I I'm, I have special permission. Okay. But so I, I would like to can I, can we finish this witness? I'm, can we finish this witness today? No, no, there were so many exhibits. I I don't think we can. And okay, we can go for five, right? You guys are okay. going for five. Okay. Yeah. Um. The. You testified. Okay, so. Let's go to some of the some of the exhibits if we can. Okay. I'm going to go to exhibit 52. Fifty two was this. It appears to be um, conversation by messages back and forth, um, and it. It shows the shooter holding the Caltech, correct? Uh, this one shows him loading the, the Caltech, that video that you have it on now, yes. I'm sorry, it shows him loading the Caltech. And this video was from back in um, August of 2021, correct? Yes. And you testified that 
Obviously, this video shows the shooter holding the Caltech, and we, let's see here, the video was admitted also. Let me just get to the video. So this is the video. I'm just going to play it. It's 12 seconds. This is exhibit. This is exhibit 51. Okay. So this video shows the shooter loading the Caltech. This one was an empty, empty slide. You sent the slide forward on this video, yes. Okay, I am so bad with yeah. these guns. Yeah, please correct me. So this one is him doing what? Sending the slide forward? Yes. There were no, no, there was no ammunition in the firearm. No, mag I don't believe there was even a magazine inserted. He just sent the slide forward in this video. Uh, it was like a black leather, looks like a couch or something like that below it. Okay. And in this video, you have no idea if there are other people around him. No. The video is focused on the gun in the shooter's hand, correct? Yes. And this video was sent by text message over to a friend of the shooter's. Is that correct? Yes. And we don't see, while we don't see any people in this video, we don't know if Mr. or Mrs. Crumbly were present at the time the shooter is taking this video. We know that they were in the home at the time, but we don't know exactly where they were in the home, no. Okay, so we know they're at home at the time the shooter's in the home making this video and sending it to a friend, correct? Yes. And as much as, um, well, this video, him doing this, the shooter doing this, is not illegal, correct? No. It's not... It's not illegal. I mean, I don't. I can't say. I'm not going to say know, it's a good idea. I'm, right. I don't. I don't mean under federal law, it's not. It wouldn't be illegal. You're in your own home, and you know, I, I don't know where his parents are at the time either, though. So I can't really comment whether it was legal or not on what he's doing with the firearm. Okay. Right. We don't know. We all we have is this little 12 second video with no context. Correct. I, the, but I, I think the context was the text message that says. My dad left his gun out, so it seems odd to send the text message if your your dad was around while you filmed it. Okay. We or know, your parents, I should say. We know dad is in the home at the time this video is made, correct? Yes, uh, both Jennifer and James, yes. We know mom is in the home at the time this video is made, correct? Yes. This home we're talking about, there will be other... Sure. Sorry, so we're at the time where we're talking about this video that was sent. 
um, your testimony was that the shooter sent a text that said, my dad left this out. Or, I'm sorry. Yeah, my dad left it out, correct? Yes. It does not say my mom left it out. It does not. It specifically says my dad. Yes. And at the end of the day, you don't know the shooter. I don't, I don't know the shooter personally. Right. No. You don't know the shooter's friend. No. You don't know other things the shooter and his friend had been talking about that day, correct? I've reviewed messages between the shooter and his friend for, for several days, but I don't understand what, what you're asking there. I, I'm asking, you don't know whether when that statement was sent to his friend, you don't know that that's true, that his dad left the gun out, correct? All you can do is read the text. I know he sent the text, yes. He sent the text, but you don't know that that's true, correct? I, I can say I, I know he sent the text. I don't know. You know I don't know exactly where. Yeah, I don't. I don't know how to answer that question. I, I don't know if it's true or not. I don't know if anyone knows it's true or not. But it, he sent the text. You are aware that teenagers can embellish things. I don't have any teenagers. You were a teenager at some point. Sure. I, I don't. I don't know that I'm specialized in, you know, teenager behavior. Okay. I testify to that. You, you would agree with me it's possible for teenagers to embellish, to impress their friends? I would agree, yeah, that it's possible for teenagers to embellish, I think is a fair statement. It's possible for them to send messages to friends to try to look cool? It's possible, yes. It's possible to try to look, to try to fit in with other people and capture people, get people's attention, correct? I think we're getting into an area that I'm not authorized to test about, testify about as a, as a federal agent right now, uh, honestly. And I. Yeah, Your Honor, um, Special Agent Brandon has very um, defined parameters about what he can testify to. He has um, an assistant U United States attorney in the courtroom um, because he can only testify to certain things. So um, I would just ask that. I guess I'm not sure what that means. Um, it means he, I, he can't testify um, about teenage behavior. He can't testify about... Well, some, uh, some of that is also part, uh, argumentative, right? I guess I take judicial notice that teenagers embellish things just for my own, right? You know, you know so they, they talked about that during the jury selection. So he doesn't know. I don't think he was, he was a teenager not long ago. Police so. officers are looking younger and younger kids. Okay, so the bottom line is, um, in terms of what's going on in this shooter's mind, and at, at this time, the crumbly son's mind, we, we just don't know. We're not mind readers, correct? Yes. We, all, we do know, though, it's not just based on text messages that James and Jennifer Crumbly were in the home at the time this video was made, correct? Yes, that's correct. That is something that you established through actual evidence and we know they were present in the home. Yes. And when we're talking about the Crumbly's home, it's a 900 square foot home, correct? Yes. It's a small ranch with three bedrooms. Yes. We're not talking a 4,000 square foot, three story house. Correct? That's correct. So we, we know that all three people at the time this video was made were in this 900 square foot home. Yes. Same thing with the video that was by you testified about a video where you can see the dining room table and you recognize the wood grain as being from their dining room, correct? Yes. Can you remind me what was happening in that video? I don't want to waste the jury's sure. time, yeah. but I think you... Yeah. The, so in the video, Ethan lo or the shooter loads a uh, loaded pistol magazine into the uh, Keltec and then sends the slide forward, chambering around, which means the firearm is be re ready to be discharged at that time. 
And when that video was taken, that's also a short little video clip, correct? Yes. And that video clip also, we do not know who else is present when that video clip was taken. Not in the immediate vicinity around him, no. We know that both uh, Jennifer and James were in the residence there. Yes. Okay, so James and Jennifer are in the residence when Ethan Crumbly is making this video. Yes. Okay, and we know he made that video um, and, and obviously had it on his phone. Correct. And we know he sent that video to a friend. Yes. And again, we don't really have much more context beyond that, correct? Other than the text message, no. Well, the, t the text message was from the other... I think the text message, the videos were sent, and then the text message followed the videos. There was, I'm sorry, were both of those videos sent at the time when it said my dad left it out? I think the first video was, was sent at 9.30, and the second video was sent at like 12.30 a.m., so four hours later. But in that, that chain of text, it's video 9.30, video 12.30, and then the text that said my dad left his, uh, left, left his gun out, uh, LOL. Okay. Something to that effect. And you checked to make sure that at 9.30 and at 12.30, both parents were at home, correct? Yes. And, at the, and so he sends these two videos, um, and there's no response from his friend, correct? Uh, I don't recall if there was a response or not. I know that they were, they were sent. There may have been an exchange, but I just know that they were sent to his friend. Okay. And then he sends another text saying, my dad left this out, correct? Yes. Now, we can agree in the text message, or I'm sorry, in the Instagram post, there's reference that this gun was a gift to the shooter, correct? Yes. You are not a member of this, of the Crumbly family, correct? No. You don't know what the terms of that gift are in terms of whether the shooter was allowed to just possess it and have it at all times, or if there were conditions around and rules around that gift, correct? No, I just know that it was a gift. Okay. And you don't know if the... You do not know where that gun was kept, the Sig Sauer was kept, prior to the day you're in the house with law enforcement and the gun, the um, open gun case was on the bed, correct? I'm sorry, it's late in the day, so sure. my questions are getting terrible. Let me back up. The, when you saw the weapon, the actual weapon, the Sig Sauer, you saw it at the school, correct? Yes. And when you went to the parents' home, the gun case was out on the bed, correct? I believe when I got there, it had been moved to the, to the kitchen at that point. I'm sorry, it yes. was in the kitchen sure, at that yeah. point? Yes. Okay. And prior to you getting there, you don't know where the gun case had been, where it was moved to, who, who had moved it, and things like that, correct? Uh, I know based on reviewing the, the search warrant photographs from the scene that, uh, that are done prior to searching a residence, that it was on the bed and with the <clears throat> empty pistol, empty box of pistol ammunition next to it um, when those photographs were taken. That's what I know. You don't know prior to that day or the night before where that gun was stored in the Crumbly's home, correct? I don't, I don't know myself. I don't, I don't, like, I don't have knowledge of that. Uh, I know that there's been... I don't know how to answer that question, honestly. Okay, well, you, you, don't, know, you don't know the answer. As someone that's been involved in this investigation, as one of the officers in charge, I, I have reviewed multiple uh, different statements and texts about where it was stored. So I don't, I don't know how to quite answer that question because there were various texts and statements about where it was stored from uh, the defendant's messages and statements and things like that. So I don't know how to answer that question. Um, but do I know where for certain where it was stored? The answer to that is no. Okay. You also don't know whether when the gun, the Sig Sauer, was in the Crumbly home, if they had the, tri the cable lock on the Sig Sauer gun. I'm sorry, can you repeat, that? repeat the question? 
when the gun was in the Crumbly's home, in the days following James buying the gun, you don't know if the cable lock was on that gun. Uh, I don't know. I'm, other than the 26th, the date that they purchased the firearm, I believe they took photos of it around 1 o'clock p.m. I know that uh, the shooter took a video around shortly after 6 o'clock p.m. with the firearm, uh, with the cable lock still in the bag, not inserted in the gun. So I know that at least when they got home from the, the, gun, the uh, firearm store after the purchase, there were photographs taken. There was no cable lock inserted. I know later that night at 6 p.m., so we're shortly thereafter between 6 and 6.40, both the shooter and Mrs. Crumley took photographs on their phone and or photos and videos, and the cable lock wasn't inserted. It was still in the bag. Um, that's, that's all I know. I know that, that and at those specific times when that, those pictures are taken, uh, that the cable lock was not used at those times. Okay, we can agree on that. Beyond that photograph, the day the gun was purchased, past 6 o'clock that night, you don't know if the cable lock was put on that gun, correct? I have no evidence uh, whether it was or was not, no. You also don't know, after 6 o'clock that night, where the gun was was placed, correct? For that, for that specific day, I, I don't personally know where that gun was that night, no. You also don't know who was responsible for putting that gun away that night, correct? I, I, don't, I don't know how to answer that question. I, I guess it's if Mrs. Crumbly is taking a picture of the firearm and she's the only one home, it would be her responsibility to put the firearm away. And if it's Mr. Crumbly, so I don't, I don't know how to answer your question. If, your answer, if you want me to answer that, I don't know their conversations about who's responsible for locking it up at night. Then, right, so your answer yes. is I don't know. You don't know. Right. Okay. And so the, on the 26th, that night, after 6 p.m., after the photo's taken, we can agree, you don't know if the cable lock got put on, you don't know where the gun was stored, and you don't know who was responsible for storing it, correct? I don't know how to answer your question because I feel like that if... if I, because you if, don't know. You know I, don't, I, I think, think it's, it's asked and answered. I, yeah, I, I don't know if whose responsibility. It could be a parent, both parents' responsibility. I, I don't know how to answer that question. You weren't there. Correct, I wasn't there. I don't know who's... Okay, but, but Your Honor, I just want to make record. He, he does have knowledge of all the other evidence, so I think sure. the struggle here is she's, I mean... He, he, knows, he knows what was happening at 6 p.m., but... He's, no, he, he, he's reviewed different statements about... about so that's, that's where the struggle is here. He doesn't personally know if those statements are true, but I think that's why, I don't want to put words in his mouth, but... He has, a, he has other information. He'd, I'm asking him about his personal knowledge, though. I'm not asking him about things okay. other people said, okay. things... Okay. Mm -hmm. All right, so then we go to the 27th. This is the day after the gun was purchased by Mr. Crumbly, correct? Yes. Okay. We've obviously talked about um, Mrs. Crumbly being at the range with, with the shooter that day, correct? Yes. Okay. That night, when after Mrs. Crumbly was home, you do know that Ms. Mrs. Crumbly and her son went back home, correct? Yes. Okay. You don't have personal knowledge of who took the gun from the, via the car they drove into the home, correct? That's correct. You don't know if the gun was even brought into the home when... Mrs. Crumbly and the shooter arrived back home after the gun range. That's correct. You don't know if after coming home from the gun range, the cable lock was put on the gun. By, by who? You don't... You I, I don't know that the cable lock was, was uh, placed on the, on the firearm, uh, but if you're saying... It, it appeared the way that Miss Crumley or Mrs. Crumley operated the firearm. It would be very difficult for her to lock the slide to the rear to put the cable lock on. She she appears like she doesn't know what she's doing with the gun, right? Yes. Okay. She there's no doubt the shooter has a lot more knowledge about this gun than Mrs. Crumley does. Yes, that's fair. Okay. And when Mrs. Crumley is posting, she's posting that it's her first time shooting a nine millimeter, correct? Yes, that's what she wrote. And she's calling it a Mother Sunday, correct? Yes. And you don't know much about this family, but Mother Sunday implies 
This is a mother and son spending time together, correct? That's what the text said, yes. It's obvious Mrs. Crumley's doing something with her son he enjoys, correct? Yes, he was definitely smiling when he was shooting the firearm, yes. Okay. And then both Mrs. Crumbly and her son um, are, you know, comparing targets and talking and interacting with one another, correct? That's what occurred on the surveillance video, yes. And once they got home that night, you have no idea if the cable lock was put on the gun. I do not know. No. You don't even know if the gun was brought in the house. No. You don't know where the gun was kept that night. No. And you don't know where the gun was kept in the following day or day after. You don't have personal knowledge of that, correct? Yes. And at the end of the day, I'm sorry, scratch that. In terms of the shooter, you have no awareness of whether the shooter has ever had any kind of safety course. I found no evidence that he had a safety course, no. You, you don't, so there is no evidence that you can say, there's no evidence, but that doesn't mean that didn't happen, correct? Correct. And you have no evidence about James, whether or not he's ever had a safety course, correct? Uh, I found no evidence of that, no. But okay. I don't, yeah, correct. So you, would, you wouldn't know either way? It's possible he had a safety course. I personally found no evidence of that. And when you're talking about this drawing, and I'd like to just put the math paper back up, And I apologize. I, I believe it was exhibit seventy five. No, it's seventy four. Thank you. Okay, so your testimony was by looking at this math paper, you believe the gun in exhibit seventy five looks like the Sig Sauer weapon, correct? Yes. And this math paper was drawn after the shooter had already picked out and had his dad purchase the Sig Sauer and the family already owned that gun, correct? Yes. And that bullet, you believe, looks like a bullet that would be unique to the Sig Sauer gun? No, that's not, that's not what I said. I just said out of the, the firearms they own in their home, out of the two calibers, it, it resembles more of a 9mm than a twenty two. Okay, but it, it, it's just a bullet. Right. We can well, agree. You, you drive... listed, off, listed off a lot of calibers earlier. If you if you ever look at all those rounds, they look vastly different. All right. So that's a nine millimeter caliber. I'm saying it resembles or could resemble a nine millimeter caliber. It is definitely a round of pistol ammunition that does not look like a 22. Okay. These are just drawings that that the sh we know the shooter drew at school, correct? They are drawings that the shooter drew at school. Yes. I don't know if I would say just. Their, their drawings, we know he drew at the school. Yes. And you have never discussed these drawings with the shooter, correct? No. You were not present when the shooter met with the school counselor about this drawing, correct? No, I was not. You were not present when the school shooter met with the principal from the school and talked about this drawing, correct? I was not present. You were not present when Mrs. Crumbly and her husband met with the shooter at the school about this drawing. Correct, I did not get to the school that day until after the shooting occurred. You did not hear the shooter explain 
why he put these things on this drawing, correct? Yes, I did not respond until after the shooting occurred. Okay. So you've never had a conversation with him where he explained or talked about what he was doing in this drawing, and you don't, you've never seen a video of those conversations, correct? Yes, I believe I said before, I haven't met the shooter before. Special Agent Brandon, you um, were asked some questions about um, the um, nine millimeter and it, and that it, it isn't the most powerful gun. That there are other guns that could do more damage. Do you remember that? Yes. Okay. Um, would you acknowledge, though, that it's much more difficult to control and fire it quickly and, and accurately than a twenty-two? Yes, if we're going by the calibers, yeah, 50 caliber would be a lot more difficult to carry around than a 9 millimeter. Yes. And then, and then, okay. And um, you were asked a lot about um, whether or not um, James or Jennifer, how many times they went to the shooting range, or if Jennifer ever went um, to took them at a different time. You don't really know, though, correct? No, all I know is the evidence that I that I found and we, that was presented today, and that I testified to. Okay, well, let's talk about that for a minute. Um, what have you reviewed? Just summarize what you've reviewed. Uh, so I've reviewed uh, surveillance camera video from both the school, uh, the firearms range, uh, Facebook returns for uh, James and Jennifer Crumbly, Instagram returns, uh, the forensic download of seven cell phones, I believe, belonging to James, Jennifer, and the shooter. Um, the entire case file, other interviews, and, and, and things like that, um, basically everything related to this case. Okay, when you say you viewed, reviewed the phones, that means all the content that was on the phone, correct? Yes. Going back to quite a long time. Yes. Um, in fact, some of the, the cell phone data went back several years. Yes. Okay, and on those phones you also reviewed every video taken by Jennifer Crumley. Yes. Correct? Um, at every picture, correct? Yes. All of the Facebook messages from the return that she hadn't deleted, you, you reviewed those, correct? Yes. All of the uh, communications between the two, um, Jennifer and James, correct? Yes. Um, videos that were recorded by her of herself, correct? Yes. Videos um, of the two of them fighting, correct? Your Honor? No, I would Your Honor, let me finish. This they, is all whoa, 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 whoa. leading whoa. questions. Okay. The question was, sustained. Sustained. the question was, sustained. you don't know too much about this family, do you? Is, is that true? In the context of this investigation, I've learned a lot about the Crumley family. Uh, based on the way the question was asked, I thought it was more in the lines of, in the same way of asking if I knew the shooter, do I know the Crumleys? I don't personally know them, but in this investigation, yes, I've had a uh, very detailed look at their life over the last several years, especially this, the, the year leading up to the shooting, yes. Okay. And um, you were asked about the second video the shooter took of the Caltech. Yes. Okay. Um, and you, you were asked if you knew whether or not someone was a parent, Jennifer Crumbly or James Crumbly, were, was next to him, correct? Yes. Okay. For, let's just say for a moment, they were. Do you still have any problem with that video? 
Objection. His his opinion about having a problem with it is irrelevant. Yeah, yeah. Do you have concerns about safety when you look at that video, regardless of who was next to him? Yes. Uh, based on the height of the table, the direction the firearm was pointed would either have been at the based on the way the wood grain goes, it would have either been at the neighbor's house or out the front window um, of the house. And because of the height of the table, it potentially, and, and with the porch, I'm not quite sure if it would be head height or, or you know stomach or above, but it would definitely be pointed in a direction where if the firearm was, was shot, it could travel outside the home. Okay. Um, you were asked about whose responsibility, responsibility it was, or did you know, to lock up the weapon, correct? Yes. Okay. Whose responsibility is it when a, when a firearm, a nine millimeter, is in your home, whose responsibility is when you know there's a minor there? Based on my understanding of the pamphlet that was handed out, it would I can say that it would not be on the juvenile. Um, you were asked about that meeting in the counselor's office, correct? Yes. Okay. And that, the worksheet that you viewed, yes. correct? Okay. Um, and you were asked uh, if um, you don't know what the, the, the counselor said about it, correct? And your answer was no, you don't. Correct. I, wasn't, I said I wasn't personally there for what he said about okay. it. Okay. But, but you know that the, the worksheet was shown to Jennifer Crumbly, correct? Yes. And you, knew, you know that the, the worksheet had the words, help me, correct? Yes. Okay. And, and the worksheet had the words, blood everywhere, correct? Yes, it did. Okay. And you know that those that worksheet Your was Honor, both texted... objection to leading. This is all leading. Do you know whether or not Jennifer Crumbly saw that worksheet? Yes. All right. And how do you know that? It was on her cell phone, and she sent it to several people after she received it. Okay. And what, do you know that if she... if the worksheet that she was shown had the words, help me... Blood everywhere. It did. Okay. Thank you. about the schedule. Um, I'm supposed to tell you so, during the trial, do not read, listen to, or watch any news reports about the case. Under the law, the evidence we consider to decide the case must meet certain standards. For example, witnesses must swear to tell the truth, and lawyers must be able to cross-examine them. News reports do not have to meet these standards. They could give you incorrect or misleading information. So to be fair to both sides, you must follow this instruction. Do not go on social media. Don't post. Don't do research. Don't watch the news, and please do not discuss the case with anyone. If anyone attempts to discuss the case uh, with you, please let me know. All right? All right, we appreciate you. Any questions about the schedule? I think we're moving along, okay? All right for the jury. I think we were asked to do that. We were, we're not going to text message with counsel, but we were asked to, we, yeah. we emailed her as far as I know. I can't insist, but I can ask politely if I did. Yeah. So I'd like you to know that if possible. So. Thank you. All right. Um, I'll see you in the morning. Thank you, Judge.
Thanks, George.